In the shadows of the flame, a world in disarray, lead us blind. The vision lost, no peace to guide the way. A fire burning deep within. Destruction drawing near, the drums of war are beating loud, but no one seems to hear. Divisions deep in walls grow tall, the cracks become so wide. A battle fueled by ignorance, a truth they cannot hide. The cries of children echo on, their innocence betrayed. But still the leaders turn their heads, oblivious and unswayed. Open your eyes. In the shadows of the flame, a world in disarray, leaders blind. The vision lost, no peace to guide the way. A fire burning deep within. Destruction drawing near, the drums of war are beating loud, but no one seems to hear. Divisions deep in walls grow tall, the cracks become so wide. A battle fueled by ignorance, a truth they cannot hide. The cries of children echo on, their innocence betrayed. But still the leaders turn their heads, oblivious and unswayed. Open your eyes, it's time to see. In the shadows of the flame, a world in disarray, leaders blind. The vision lost, no peace to guide the way. A fire burning deep within. Destruction drawing near, the drums of war are beating loud, but no one seems to hear. Divisions deep in walls grow tall, the cracks become so wide. A battle fueled by ignorance, a truth they cannot hide. The cries of children echo on, their innocence betrayed. But still the leaders turn their heads, oblivious and unswayed. Open your eyes, it's time to see.
shadows of the flame, a world in disarray, leaders blind. The vision lost, no peace to guide the way, a fire burning deep within. Destruction drawing near, the drums of war are beating loud, but no one seems to hear. Divisions deep in walls grow tall, the cracks become so wide. A battle fueled by ignorance, a truth they cannot hide. The cries of children echo on, their innocence betrayed. But still the leaders turn their heads, oblivious and unsway.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to DPA Open Mic, episode uh, 73. I forgot to change my background. Oh, my freaking God. Wait, 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 wait. Where's my background? Um, Here. Okay. And then the banner. Oh, I, I, put, I pressed the wrong button. Okay. Hi. So, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to DPA Open Mic, 73. Yeah, so the... Everybody still prefers Draco's music. So, yeah. So, Draco's music will stay. By the default, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm testing out some, you know, uh, new music thingy. So the yeah, I'll, I'll show you guys later at the end of the stream, and yeah, we go to start the open mic. I go to f drop the link, and uh, okay, so for uh, the this DP open mic is uh multicast as usual on multiple platforms on DPAs uh. Uh, YouTube channel on DP Open Mic channel, uh, the Rumble Open Mic channel, uh, Twitter, Telegram, and Twitch. Okay, so, yeah, so, although most people don't really watch on Twitch, it's a waste of time there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the crowd, the, the, the DPA's crowd is usually older, so, you no, know, they, they are not a Twitch kind of people. Uh, they don't Twitch. <laughs> they, they stay very still. So, okay. Uh, let me drop the link to join. I think in the stream. Open, oh, okay. I pressed, I actually paste the wrong link last week. That's funny. Okay. So I've pinned the link to join the DP Open Mic. Uh, the headlines uh, this week, I think the, the most significant thing, I think, is actually uh, the flirting of World War III. You know, the NATO has been. Uh, doubling down and uh, they are getting very more and more excited. Uh, the Secretary of State of the United States says that you no, know, Ukraine's future is in NATO. And uh, it's like very sure, he's very hundred percent sure it will be in NATO. Uh, Ukraine will join NATO. And uh, that, that also comes at the same time where Russia's uh, spokesman Peskov uh, says that uh, NATO is essentially now in direct confrontation with Russia. And uh, all this basically raised the stake of the, uh, of the global geopolitics into a height where it's a bit scary we are reaching world war three uh soon if people still stay so hi brother. hi we should always watch actually what the music was no the, the one before the draco's music it was talking about people need to wake up you no know, if not we are reaching world war three but you know people didn't like it people prefer the you no know, uh draco's music about you no know, uh we need to stand up for our brothers sisters which is also fine which is also the same same uh, vibe and you no know, same vibe but more emo me on next day i make more emo music i i just discovered a new ai tool someone introduced it to me i can create crazy a lot of music so you know the music are super high quality i will show i will put the a music a video i'm um, not video uh, uh, the one song that i made at the end of the open mic as the closing you, you just choose the style and the text and yeah you can you can do anything it's like it's like the ai tool for the graphics is it's nuts, I tell you. Oh. Uh, now I don't feel like being a musician at all because it's like, oh yeah. fuck. <laughs> so no, no more boy bands. We have AI bands. Yeah, yeah. That one sounds like a boy band song, right? Though the previous. <laughs> one. I, I was blown away when I first typed the first prompt and then the music came out. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like, why this unimaginable? So AI is gonna change the world for those that are still not into AI. I, I strongly encourage you to research more. Oh, by the way, this is very interesting because there have been a, there have been some uh, things um, saying that actually the Israelis are using AI in order to excuse themselves from war crimes because the AI is actually the one guilty for killing so many people. The way they choose how to target people hmm. and where to find them. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm hundred percent sure, sure they did use AI to try to make up some evidence, uh, some photos uh, on Hamas atrocity, which is very poorly done. Like, mm -hmm. it's like they don't have the budget to find the right AI guys to do it, or you know, to get actually graphic hey. designers to photo manipulate it further to look real. They have so, to deliver. They, you all, they can you all hear me all right? Can yeah. you guys hear me all right? Okay, yes. I just want to make sure. They made all those accusations, so they had to present pictures very fast and that's the problem like those baby killed women violated and even today it's uh, the rapes are still very questionable because how could they have had time to rape women it's, it's the same story about ukraine anyways we know that 
Yeah, at, at least AI, at least Ukraine don't use uh, AI to create you no know, evidence. No, at least they they at least they use computer game graphics. No, at least we know you know <laughs> like, they, they purposely just want to believe the people who are stupid. But some people really believe those shit because I had like a person saying to me that everybody or that. Uh, in Russia, they had people going inside of uh, of the cubits to to see what people were voting. We know that those videos were were made by yeah. Ukrainian actors, but many people really believed that it was true. This that was which which you which country's election is done in that way? You know, with so few safeguards and like there's a, a, a soldier with rifle. It's like, man, where got such thing? Well, I mean, and, and like all the flags hanging everywhere, it's like, look, there's 20 Russian flags here, so you know it's Russian. Like, look at, you know, I mean, does every polling station have 20 flags hanging off every polling booth and, you know, these armed guards and all these, like, fancy silk banners hanging everywhere? It's like, I mean, I mean polling stations here, they, it's a couple cardboard signs out front to tell you to, you can vote here and where to park. You know, maybe a cardboard sign in the window, it's nothing fancy, like, you know, flags and draperies oh, and all this. I mean, it just it looked fake. You know, it was like way overdone. Like, we get it, it's Russian, okay? I mean, it, it might as well had Putin standing there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those videos were very bad. <laughs> you could immediately I'm, I'm so tell that about something was wrong. Hmm? I'm so tempted to re compare this with the U.S. elections, but no, I I don't want to. You know, because later the, the video you know, got demonetized. <laughs> But yeah, but but it's, it's basically just like the, the U.S. election is even worse. Like they can actually evacuate everyone out of the polling station, and then after yeah, you didn't know. Mm. In the last presidential election, that's what happened. They claimed that there was some problem with the buildings. I think it's not just one place. A few places, everyone evacuated out for a few hours, and then oh, after when they came back, the vote count just you know this the famous Big. graph where they, the pop up. <laughs> Yeah, because it so, was like one of them was like some like like an Atlanta place or something, like a convention center, and they said they had a water main or sewer line burst. It was flooding out some, so they kicked everybody out. And then a couple hours later, it was like there was no water leak or it was a toilet that overflowed or something. But then you know all, everything was fixed, boat wise. So, but there was a couple things like that where you know oh there's this building maintenance problem and everybody left and then you know things happened. Yeah, so there's no um, chain of custody. Uh, you should there. There should be in no universe where elections where have the voting box and the votes are un unsupervised. You know, someone must be there. Even it's going to be a big fire. Someone must be there. Carry the whole shit. Just carry out and run away or mm -hmm. what? You cannot leave it there. You no. Know? Well, I mean, so, I mean, remember too. You remember there was videos of them putting tape over the windows and stuff, so people who, that were supposed yeah. to be there to observe. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah. we didn't cheat, we but they did everything to make you think they were. Right? You can imagine it's, it's if Russia, when people, you know, act like, well, there wasn't anything going on that was funny. It's like, really, you don't even think that's weird, you know? Like <laughs> that lady's just supposed to stand there through the glass and watch them count, and now they're putting paper up so she can't even do that. It's like it's not like she could go in there and talk to them or bother them. It's like. You know, they did all kinds of crazy stuff. Some countries really have strange uh, process to vote. It's really unusual. Like in most, in many African countries, you they paint your finger because they believe that you won't go to the next polling station and vote again. <laughs> uh, in Senegal, yeah, like the purple finger. What was it? Iraq? Yeah. They did the purple. Thumb, where, whatever. In, where they don't really. Malaysia have do it as well. Malaysia do this as well. So the, it is washable. It's easy to wash off. But you see, it just create another difficulty for people to just uh, fraud, you know, do fraud, election fraud. So which is why, you know, when we look from when we look from afar, you know, <laughs> whatever happens from in the United States, people like me who actually scrutinized or is like, what the hell is happening? Imagine Russia did it, did what America do. And then there was this like a few hours disappearance I mean of people. Exactly. I mean, think about it. If someone, if you know, if some news channel was showing you like some Russian polling station where they're counting the votes and you see these Russian guys slapping paper up on the glass and taping it in place, you'd be like, oh my God, you know, that's horrible. How dare they? But, you know, then they do the same thing here and the Russians aren't even doing anything half as bad. I mean, what do they do? Make sure everyone votes, you know, tell everyone to go vote. I mean, 
It, it's just funny. It's like the projection that they do. Imagine what I do. Imagine I take the 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 Fulton County footage, the one in America, the all this crazy shit, and then I just put the you no know, like the news headline, but you know with a ticker and everything. But I say it's Russia in twenty twenty four. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it will go viral or not. Yeah, people you know, you like, can, you can like <laughs> Putin loyalists tape up windows to block UN observe election observers, and people will be like, "Oh yeah, sure, that looks like them." I mean, seriously. I, I mean, you wouldn't know. Unless there was a black person or something in there. Well, no, because then you can say, oh, those were the UN observers, you know, because there's different races of people. Yep, yep, yep. Well, yeah, yeah people wouldn't Ukraine, check it. They, they would believe it. At least in Ukraine, Sorry. they don't have elections. We can't say bad about them. Oh, yeah, exactly. No. So, no, Zelensky is smarter. No. Honestly, no the, news, the, the, no, po no political parties either, right? Like I think no they have some political party. parties. True opposition, I don't no think like they'll have it. Like, yeah, yeah, the pro Russian ones are all gone. I think, if I'm not wrong, there's no more pro Russian, uh, mm. like, or you know, the true opposition that want to fight for peace. There's no such no. party anymore. You you can't you can't argue for peace. You can't argue for uh surrender. You can't argue for uh you no know, giving up for Donbass. So basically, they outlaw all this. Then there is no political discussion. You can't discuss because. The, because there's only one option, so was that no no one want to risk their life if you say something on the contrary to what the the current uh, ruling party is doing, then you are basically you know a Russian spy, you know or Russian agent. So that is actually everything goes out the windows. I think I think this is also something that even peaceful countries like us, you no, know, we need to think about it because in war time, we might actually do the exact same thing, and then where where is the point that it ends? You see. Uh, to to really argue for peace or argue for surrender, yes, it's humiliating for the country. But the alternative is endless war to to until you know like war, like Nazi Germany, you fight all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. That is the other alternative, which is like horrendous, right? You no, know, in at least in World War One, uh, yeah, there's crippling debt. You no, know, they surrendered, but they have crippling debt. That at least people stay alive. But of course, then that spawns Hitler, you no, know, to World War Two, Vito. Is this how is that how you pronounce it? Fitu. Yeah. Fitu. Yeah. It's, a yeah, it's a wine area. Type of wine. It's fitu. Yeah, no bad. A bad my, my friend, you have uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux, Côte du Rhône, and you have fitu. Ah, I, I don't. I, did, I never see that in, in got, Singapore. I've yet. got. RL it's a very just, small. It's a very small wine area in the south of France. Waterloo. Out of Kinship RL, I've got Waterloo sparkling water. <laughs> I have energy drink. <laughs> okay, so you are a uh, I, I, But it's true that in Ukraine, they are missing some alternative voices, especially to question a lot of what Zelensky is doing. And, and it's incredible how actually they managed to control the whole information coming into the country. They still, they still, uh, they still have problems in controlling all the Russian propaganda, which actually it's also tar targeting Ukraine a lot. But most people really are just have one line of thought, just one line of reporting, and and that's why the war keeps going. You still, yeah, even even if it is interesting how, especially in village, they are they have been trying to target village to take the man to uh, force recruiting man, and village are actually organizing themselves now against those recruiters. So it's not like things are not are all uh, honey moon for Zelensky. Yeah. Von, Von, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say like a lot of those a lot of those units I'm following. Can you hear me all right? Can y'all hear me? Okay, yeah. yeah. A lot of those units that, that I've been kind of following on their social media, I mean, you see, you know, it's not all the comments and stuff, but there are still, like I say, comments about missing people. Why aren't they getting any answers about missing people? Why are bodies being recovered? You know, I haven't heard from so-and-so in a while. You know, what, you know, like one that I remember, I don't remember what unit, but, you know, like, you know, someone was like excusatory, like, you know, how dare you? you know, what what about all the boys in those trenches that were left in the trenches? So, I mean, I think a lot of people know what's going on, but it's probably hard to really organize anything other than like it's good that they're kind of organizing their neighborhoods to maybe protect the few men they have left. But 
I mean, I think a lot of people know it's bad because think about it. At this point, there realistically can't be anyone left in Ukraine that doesn't know somebody that's been killed or wounded or is missing. And there's no. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite, it's really bad in a sense also because no way to hide that, people have been waiting months for about. people have been waiting hmm. months to receive I'll the bodies, to families don't get the bodies for a long yeah. time <laughs> and i think b- the, the problem is that Zelensky made that huge mistake about saying that just 20 so- 27000 people died and for instance now a few a uh, few days ago there were like thousands and thousands of barriers because it, it, they had to give the bodies to the families but there are still families waiting months and months for to receive their their beloved ones to uh, yeah to make closure and this is important for anybody so yeah, and people cl- also like Vaughn was saying, uh, people not listening for from their uh, dear ones for for months. They probably are disappeared or dead, and and they don't have any 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 news because for Zelensky, it's more important to keep that lie. Twenty twenty seven thousand people, just twenty thousand. So it is impressive. I mean, the so, other thing uh, is, well, real quick, uh, and the other thing is too. I mean. These Ukrainian people, I mean, they have to go about their daily lives and try to work or get groceries. There's no way in hell they're not seeing all these cemeteries. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's there's no way they can hide all that stuff. I mean, people have got to see the cemeteries getting filled up, the new ones getting made, the expansion. I mean, that's one thing. I mean, if, if the casualties are as bad as they say for Russia, show us the satellite photos of the cemeteries. I mean, that's not hard to do. I mean, I can see satellite photos of expansions of Ukrainian graveyards that, you know, lead you to think that the casualties are as high as they say or pretty damn high. But, you know, these wild things about Russian casualties, they never back them up. You know, where's the picture of the four acre expansion at some Moscow cemetery or something like that? You know, there's none of that. And they'd have it. I mean, just like when they say, oh, we destroyed 100 tanks in this battle. Where's the satellite photo? It's not like we got to see a super detailed, best technology photo. But you've all seen the drone photos and the satellite photos of bomb damage assessment. If, if there's a big battle happened that they claim went the way they said they did, show us the proof. But they never do. They, they allegedly destroyed like six, uh, six fighter jets in some Russian air base. Which oh, the ones like, painted on the floor? You mean the ones painted I on the floor? I have no idea. So no, no, the pro Ukrainian I mean, side is like celebrating. They, didn't get, they couldn't have got one, but I would almost think. I mean, I don't know because I'm not a Russian Air Force guy, but I would assume if you've got aircraft operating in the front that are within range of assorted drone attacks or what, or even like missile attacks, that once an alert goes up and you have the night, because I'm sure they ID these targets and they can at least track them coming in, even if they can't engage them or shoot them all down. It would seem to me like once you got an alert, you'd put all your airfields on alert and then once you figured out where the drones were headed in what direction then you'd scramble those aircraft and have them ferry to another base or orbit over the base until it settles down and if you can land you get land if not you fly somewhere else it's a helicopter you can pretty much fly somewhere else and land in the field and, and wait to see what happens i don't know that's why i wonder if they really even hit the aircraft they say they hit because it seems to me like those guys would get the hell out of there pretty quick i mean no one's if you you know, I mean, it's just like if there was an attack on a bomber base and they know the planes are coming, they scrambled the bombers to get them off the ground because they're no good in, on the ground. So I would assume if they knew a drone attack was coming, whatever air bases were in the area would, you know, the aircraft would leave and go somewhere else until they figured out what was going on. But I don't know, maybe not. And I don't mm-hmm. think that uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine while living in the part controlled by by the Kiev government are totally living in a in a, in a hermetic bubble remember the uh, interview made by Tucker Carlson with Vladimir Putin it seems that a lot of Ukrainians watch it uh, w- w- watch it we're looking after it many Ukrainians are uh, using telegram they go into telegram channel pro ukrainians pro russians more let's say uh, 
in between channels more balanced so channels, they, they can have take, so, some of them can have uh, let's say contradictory information contradictory to what their government is stating every day so you you, you see the difference and now i hear more and more reports of uh, partisan actions in ukraine held territories not in russian held territories in odessa especially odessa would and also, yeah and and also not just there but on, on, on other part where you see sabotage actions so actually it's very good that you mention it rl sorry Vaughn. Um, there is some German politician that accused Russia, and the, 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 the Czechs also made that also mentioned to it this week, that Russia has been, well, they are complaining that Russia has um, uh, sabotaged thousands of um, uh, times the, the railways in Europe. Um, but they are, uh, and then they were like, okay, is it Russia? Is it like Russia sympathizes? So it's quite interesting. So we also have been seeing these in Europe, but we don't talk about. Sorry, Vaughn, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to keep going with what you all were saying. I mean, I, I I would be surprised at this point if the Russians haven't been infiltrating people. in. Because like I said before, I mean, you know, if you have Russian human intelligence on the ground, I mean, how does a Russian spy fight the Ukrainian spy or vice versa? Especially if these people have lived together their whole lives, they speak either language with, you know, whatever local dialect they got to speak it or accent, and it's just, there's just really no way to get away from it and hide anymore. I mean, I think with the uh, the Russians, though, I'm kind of surprised. I don't know, maybe there is something going on with this partisan action. I mean, especially with, like, the Hungarian population, how hard would it be for them to arm those people and tell them, you know, when these recruiters show up, kill them? Because then, I mean, yeah, it may be bad for the local population in a way because they could get hurt, you know, hurt through retaliation. But at the same time, it just creates another problem for Ukraine inside of its borders. You know, they got to worry about sabotage and keeping the transportation and logistics running. Now they've got these people shooting recruiters in the mountains randomly or whatever. I mean, it's just another death by a thousand cuts. It's part, it could be another. Yeah, your mic is terrible. Something is wrong. Let me let me see. I can if I can adjust from my side. Yeah. Oh, he he dropped out again. Vaughn, what is that gay headset you have? <laughs> he he dropped off. I'm not sure if he will hear that. Hear that. Don't be. So I, I will repeat it. Don't worry. Hmm. Yeah. So just on this super chat, I just have I have a quick read. I asked ChatGPT to. No, make it in point form and then I was like, what? Then I reread the certain parts. So the, the argument by this guy called Edward and Lut what? Uh basically he's he's he cited a lot of history about nuclear weapons. And uh, he's the so I I summarize is that nuclear weapons is like useless because nobody would dare to use it. Like that's his point. And that and that even put Russia will not dare to use it. So he says that NATO troops deployed into Ukraine will not trigger a basically the the idea is that the deployment of nato troops will not trigger a nuclear war that's something that he's trying to say he said that you no know, right uh, india and pakistan you no know, still go to war and they still fought despite the nuclear deterrence so they say that the nuclear deterrence doesn't work uh europe would soon need to militarize again like they used to always and then uh you no know, sending it's time to send troops into ukraine because if not then they will either accept that uh, Ukraine will lose catastrophically. So that's the but, argument. Why and I find it, that this is very interesting. This argument that losing that Ukraine losing will be catastrophic, and I I still would like to know what will that be. What's the catastrophic about it? Ukraine losing, because I I don't understand what does Ukraine means. Because before this war, Ukraine was a country that nobody talked about. It was one of the it was the poorest country in Europe. Uh, together with Moldova, it was a country that had a really bad economy. They mostly just rural. Well, okay, they have wheat and uh, sunflower oil, but that was it. Nobody was really talking about Ukraine, and Ukraine didn't count for anything. Okay, they have lots of... Even though you about Donbass. 
even the Donbas Silver War, the Donbas situation, no coverage. No one wants to talk about it. The yeah. only way I even know anything is because Russia Today was reporting about it. No, RT was reporting about it. I was like, what? Then, then they saw, you no, know, they show the front lines and you no know, people for, are living in horrible conditions. For Europe, Ukraine, the Ukraine border was like a wall. It needed to be secured because from Ukraine, you had a lot of, of criminality coming, weapons, prostitutions, all types of violent gangs. This was what Ukraine was for Europe, a big wall, a, a, a big problematic uh, frontier that they needed to control. So I, I, and still now that they opened the border more or less to Ukraine, they have lots of problems with contrabando and whatever. So it's quite interesting to what is this catastrophic event about Ukraine losing? RL. So uh, I have uh, I'm totally uh, 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 just uh, answering. I'm totally agree agreeing with uh, what those crazy guys are are thinking. I don't share the the, anal the, the analysis, but I share the the result of that thinking. Ukraine will be a big loss for the West. It's like when you play poker and you decide to bet everything you have and then you lose. But That's Arrow, you, what the Arrow, West is you, doing in Ukraine. They have yeah, betting but, a lot. Yeah, on, anyway, I, I, yeah, I, go think, on, I think I think the big thing is people aren't looking at it is it's, it's a money pit. It's a place to send money, to launder it, to get it back to different political people and different corporations and stuff like that. And that they don't want to lose that because Ukraine is like the gray area. Anything goes because it's a war and nobody can really tell what's going on. You know, money goes in, weapons go in. Maybe they go to the front. Maybe they get sold somewhere else, redirected over here. You know, I mean, Ukraine, I, I mean, Lindsey Graham, a lot of other people like but Nancy Pelosi, Mitt Romney, they all had connections before the war with NGOs and stuff. So, you know, the Democratic Party, Joe Biden and his son, I mean, it's probably, you know, and, and if those people are involved in the states, I would imagine the same type of people at those levels are involved in the EU and assorted European countries. And there's a lot of money on the table. Like RL said, you know, that that's a big pot of chips to lose. I mean, they probably sunk a lot into that because they thought Russia was going to fold and they could at least knock Russia back. Maybe it wouldn't break up right away, but they thought probably thought they could keep Ukraine. I mean, look at Black Rocks bought all that land, supposedly. I mean, they, they did. They took their chips and they pushed them on the table like they're all in. And I don't think they were prepared to be all in. And Russia is all in and they're prepared. Like they're prepared the, the, to the like well. the, 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 They're never like going to the fold. Flame. That's the thing. Russia's never going to fold. They're going to die on that. The, the master, the, the, the master plan has, has has failed, which was crumbling the Russian economy, isolating that country, and by losing right. in yeah. Ukraine, they, wait, and by losing in Ukraine, they will lose face internationally, their influence. Yeah. Their coercive did. influence in all continents. But now yeah. you see I mean, an emerging. I agree. I, I agree with, now you I see emerging institutions challenging. Yeah, challenging the institutions the which are controlled by by uh, uh, especially the Anglo-Saxon sphere, the IMF and the World Bank. But not only that, so, Greeks are doing I, their own stuff. And if Russia emerge victorious of that confrontation, the BRICS thing will be even, even, even stronger, bigger. You see how many countries want to join BRICS. But wait, Errol, kind of so anti antidote to to the to the Western hegemony. The problem kind of. is the problem is what does it mean for the West to win? Because like Vaughn was just describing very well. A Ponzi scheme will always be discovered. There is a problem. So the, the game can't go for much longer. One day or another, this will come out and it will be a big scandal. So the Ponzi let's, schemes always let's... end. Wait, wait. The Ponzi schemes always end. So the question is about winning. I, I also don't understand what would meaning winning win because with then, these then wars, let's, let's make supposition. 
Then let's yeah, make supposition so so you will understand. Okay. Imagine yeah. imagine okay. Ukraine winning yeah. thanks to, to the West. And sorry. imagine imagine Russia losing in okay, Ukraine. So the, the, the Russia, what what, the, the what will happen? No, what will happen no. in the rest okay. of the world? The idea, the idea. Everybody that will no, shit in their pants seeing okay. United States and European countries coming to them. Okay. Can I now? Yeah. So, when the the idea that the 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 the, 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 the idea that Russia, Russia could lose was it's in the past. That is gone. We know that is not going to happen. So we are talking about now. What is what does it mean for the West to lose the war? Which we already understood they did by the moment that they couldn't ban Russia. So it is obvious they are not going to do it. They have still the opportunity, but it's getting more and more difficult to stop the war before uh, before it's too late, before the Ponzi scheme is exposed, before all those situations. Before Al cut me all the time, <laughs> I was trying to say something. The West already lost the moment that it tried without without having enough strength to impose sanctions, that it tried to bring other countries to their side. That moment they gave political meaning and political strength to countries that otherwise were before considered on the fringe of the of the archi world's architecture governance. And I'm talking like the way they go to India and courted India. India is an important country, but it's not such an important country for all European country, uh, politicians to go there kissing their feet. The same now in Brazil. <laughs> okay, Brazil is a great country, very big, but <laughs> what are they doing there? They are, this is crazy. Even now, they are giving an importance to Armenia, one of the poorest countries in, the, in Central Asia. And... Uh, Peshanyan went to the European Union talking with Blinken like he was a great big importance. Armenia is a geopolitically completely nullified country. So, Vaughn, sorry. Vaughn. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, I think, I think the, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can. Oh, we, we chewed gay you headset. Now? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'll, I'll switch it up in a little while. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I think their biggest fear is it's, it's, it's all the money and the power. I mean, think about it. In Ukraine, you have like unrestricted power, unrestricted money. You can do whatever you want, probably, if the price is right. And then you have all these promises and future promises made and all this future income that was promised and people are counting on. I mean, you got to figure a lot of these people were planning on probably sending, you know, making sure they're great great grandkids never had to work because they you know they're going to make all this money off of ukraine and the war and the, the assets and the land and then that was going to slowly you know work its way into russia and they'd get pieces of that and pieces of this and that you know over time i mean the, like you said the whole plan fell apart but i mean i think that's that's the big fear they have is like i mean there, there's probably in their minds literally they're losing trillions of dollars in revenue that they were counting on or, or greedily waiting to get. And I mean, I don't know how you would measure it, but you know, untold amounts of power over the world and influence. Because like you said, what happens if Russia loses? Well, then everybody bails on Russia and bricks and everything else. But if America wins, then all of a sudden America, everyone's got to kiss our ass again. And you know, the status quo is the same. So everybody's going to have to play ball our way or you're going to be fucked like Russia is, you know, because Russia lost. But since that's not going to happen, it don't matter. But I mean, I think the Western thing is just all the power and money that's on the table that they're going to lose. I mean, they really are obsessed with that shit. I mean, think about it. how many people in the West in the United States. Is it 100 world leaders in their families and friends, a thousand to divide up trillions of dollars and rule the world? through a homogeny or hegemony, you know? I mean, it's a pretty sweet deal if you can get a piece of that action and they're losing it. And I think that's why they're freaking out. They, Maybe they that's why Macron wants panic. to send French troops. Yeah. He's got to save his piece. They are in panic because they don't know how to get out of this problem. That's, they, they, they don't know how to get out. So, Ariel. Well, they're going to take, I mean, think about it. They're going to, 
they can't figure out a, a way to end it successfully. Sorry, Wyatt. And they can't figure out how not to lose the money. You know, it's like no win for them. They, they, they decided to act the West, United States, uh, that bitch. Uh, uh, what's the name of that bitch who just left? Newland. Victoria. Newland. Newland. They, they, they decided to apply a plan by pure ideology because those people who are in charge are not competent. And it's a symptom you see more and more in the West where people are uh, put on a position because they share an ideology, not because they are competent. That's what you see in the West, mainly. In United States, certainly. In Europe, in certainly France. also. Especially France. Germany too, I think. It's because they are part of a lobby. It's because they are part of a group with a certain specific ideology they are picked. Not because they are competent. No, but they are also being paid. Not because, not because they are per people of value. No, they are being paid. They're just part. They're just part of specific interest, private interest of big money, yeah. and they are, they are the being... agents of those of those big money guys. That's what you see. That's why well, I mean, they, they, they applied that plan against Russia without understanding what Russia is, especially a Russia with Vladimir Putin in, in power. You know, and the thing is that they've had 30 years to figure that guy out. He's been a consistent oh, person there since before Yeltsin left. I mean, oh, he hasn't gosh. been a big wig guy, but he's been there. Oh, they've had time to develop a dossier, dossier on him and figure him out. And as far as Newland goes, I mean, look at, look at the world's on the brink of nuclear war because the, you know, the Western foreign policy apparatus is listening to a a mentally unhinged, emotional woman who's upset that in the history of the world, the Soviets did something to her family like she's special. I mean, there's literally millions of other families that suffered under the Soviets. They don't get to drag the world towards nuclear war to get revenge because great-great-grandpa got killed in a program. It's like lady, get in line. There's been programs all over the world. Millions, if not billions, of people have suffered under. It's like you ain't special. You don't, you know, just because your family got killed by some other government doesn't give you the right to destroy the whole planet. I mean, I, I don't really know what her angle is. I mean, I know she's getting money off of it, but she's a freaking psycho. I mean, she's, you know, to act like your personal family tragedy is justification to go to war against probably the largest nuclear power on the planet because you're butt hurt. You know, wow. I mean, incompetent. Doesn't even do it justice. So I want to I want to bring back the the Lute Watts uh, article on unheard. Uh, I just want to read the the conclusion part, which is a bit weird. Like the justification for why they you need to send uh, you guys uh, in Europe need to send NATO troops, you know, to to Ukraine. So basically, I read. Um, if Europe cannot provide enough troops uh, to, to send into Ukraine, then you, Russia will prevail on the battlefield. And if uh, diplomacy successfully intervenes to complete uh, to avoid a complete debacle, uh, Russian military power will victoriously return to Central Europe. And, and at that point, Western Europe will have to rebuild their armed forces, whether they like it or not, starting with the return of compulsory military service. So yeah, that's the reason why you need to send your troops. Because uh, if you don't die this. now you will have to mobilize to be a soldier later. Like, which is like... What? It doesn't make no sense. It's the same thing. It's like, uh, what was that? <laughs> catastrophic. If Russia wins, it will be catastrophic. It's so sick. And it is amazing exactly what Putin is trying to make his NATO to understand they need a border. What kind of a border will they have? And they don't want to negotiate. So whatever they are having in their heads, it will always be what, what you just described. All Eastern Europe, which already are doing, will have to go back to uh, to to uh, uh, create big armies and militarize them. But they're already doing it. The problem is that they destroyed all the treaties they had before. 
uh, in order not to go to that because they don't want to accept the real border between both of them. And what but kind the thing of is, hmm? they need to mobilize now in order to eventually fill enough troops to fight with Russia because Russia will be continuously uh, immobilizing more and more troops. If NATO want to win in Ukraine, they will have to militarize now, which it will be the same as you militarize later. <laughs> then, but then now you could guarantee the fight. You there's no guaranteed fight in the future. You know, they, not necessarily there'll be a war in the future. But, but, but now, but, if you send the troops now, you confirm you have a war. The question is though very interesting. What will Russia do if they see those troops there? Because you see, there will be the, the Russian. There, the problem with these countries, which I always been saying. And I wrote in that article, I wrote something down there. Um, I commented and I said, well, the problem is that these countries are afraid of a payback. Of course, there will be payback. Whatever they do, do did during all this war, there will be a payback. Nobody conspires against the US and doesn't expect to have a payback. Of course, they will have a payback. It is great power politics. They always revenge themselves, the Baltics, Poland. The, even even in Romania and Germany, they will have to pay for what they did, and this is where they are afraid. But if 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 they send if they send troops to Ukraine, that will be like the Russians, yeah, payback. <laughs> they will yeah, pay no, with no, lives no, no, no. instead of. They give them. They give Russia the excuse to hit them, right? It's like you know, we always yeah. cannot hit them. Now they can hit them. You know. Uh, 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 I mean, I, uh, I mean, if if. If Russia wins, uh, it will be catastrophic for the West. No, Russia already won, and it's already catastrophic for the West. It's already catastrophic for the West. And I share what that guy said about the fact that sending NATO troops, not NATO troops, that's false, European troops, because as long as the United States don't send a man there officially with a US flag and all that, it won't be NATO. And, many countries and if, Europe? Europeans, if Europeans send troops there, Russian can uh, manage it just by conventional weapons. They have long range, as long as European countries without United States don't send their air force and all their ships to the Black Sea and all that. That means Turkey will be also involved against Russia directly. It's something that uh, Russia can manage conventionally. So yes, it won't be nuclear. I share that point of view also. Mm. And you I have to understand why all those agreements, those bilateral agreements between European countries and Kiev. The first who went there was Rishi Sunak to sign, to sign a, a, a mutual defense deal. Then it was the Netherlands, then it was Germany, then it was France. And there were a debate in a non-mainstream non media in France where they invited one member of the parliament, Dupont-Aignan, and one uh, senator, French senator, de Broglio. And they were talking about that agreement that the French parliament just ratified. And they say that those documents were in English only. And those documents were made in Washington. And it's the exact same document for all European countries, with just the, 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 the European country's name changed. Because in, in Washington, they are thinking to not be involved by Article 5 of NATO. And the solution they came up with is a contract. Because this is a contract. A contract between two countries, Ukraine and another European countries, which is the way Washington has, has, uh, has found to not be involved by Article 5. But because they don't think that Russia will directly attack a European country, a, a, a member of NATO, or try to invade it. They came finally up to that conclusion. So it, in fact, it's, it's absolutely catastrophic 
and it will be even more catastrophic, especially for the Europeans, but also for United States. But United States in Washington, they think they can manage it by sucking all the industrial uh, entities of especially Germany to uh, back to U United States. But at the end, they are losing their shiny image of that hegemonic power who rules based on his famous rules based order shitty thingy. So and you see, you know, they, 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 they want to mess with China, and you see Israel uh, doing his stuff against the Iranians. They are still not uh, uh, able to, to 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 come up with uh, any any uh, good solution uh, in, in Ukraine. They are totally delusional, yeah. crazy. So let's let's hear Shadovi now. Uh, the shadow I, see, is uh, done, I yeah. have another idea about uh, all of this. I think uh, what would be the worst for the European government and for NATO especially is that if after the defeat of Ukraine not uh, a lot of bad things happen to NATO or Europe, but exactly the opposite. If nothing happened, that would be the worst. Because at this point, it would mean that all the speech about we have to save Ukraine, to save democracy, to save our economy, to fight against uh, the Chiban in uh, Moscow, and every speech is going to fall down and to crash immediately. If nothing happened, if Russia win. That would be the worst uh, ending for uh, NATO. Basically, uh, peaceful peace would be horrible for NATO. So I think next one, Nunia? I think it was Nunia, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to follow up on what uh, RL was saying. I 100% I agree. I thought that when I read about all these bilateral uh, agreements being signed with the various Ukraine and France, Ukraine, and UK and things like that. I really didn't understand it, but how RL explained it in giving NATO article five deniability, I think that's dead on. Uh, but I also think that it could backfire on these nations in the sense that let's say, for example, France sends their few troops to go into Ukraine in a support position they all get leveled or they try to do something on French soil, like, you know, launch a, you know, some sort of aircraft or something. I, I think, I think they're s s severely underestimating uh, Russia's response. I think Russia will directly attack those countries if they are attacked by them. And if that happens, what I think this will do these bilateral deals in the same way that it gives NATO deniability on Article 5 of being attacked. It also gives them deniability to say, hey, this was a bilateral agreement that you guys set up France and Ukraine. This was this was your agreement, it had nothing to do with NATO. You don't think the Americans would do something like that? I absolutely see that happening. <laughs> and then what? So France will send in their you know few thousand troops. They'll all get slaughtered. And then they'll be left holding the bag and they'll be left looking like idiots. That's what I think this the, these bilateral agreements will also enable. Uh, Vaughn. Just real quick on the bilateral agreements. I mean, is that a done deal or is that just something they're discussing? Because honestly, oh, it's done. What, right, well, it doesn't matter then. I mean, the idea that you can make some kind of legal contract during a war to fight a war against somebody and not be fighting a war against them. It's all legal and going to hold up in any kind of court is ridiculous. I mean, Russia would ignore it and they would say they would explain it like I just did to the rest of the world. And 70 percent of the world would be like, that sounds like bullshit. So, I mean, I don't think I think that's a dead end right there for them trying it with Russia because they can just play it that way. Uh, Bradley. Oh, mm -hmm. no, it's Joey. Oh, OK. You guys decide. Um, well, I, I'll go, I guess. Uh, I was going to say that um, what's it called is uh, um, France, I think, is in a particular situation where they're extra fucked because um, with uh, France's like over 60% or something of France's uh, in energy grid being focused on um, 
well, being bit, built on nuclear energy and being unable to, um, you know, France doesn't mine any uranium and there's no uranium in France. They're uh, being severely restricted with what they can do about their neo colonies in Africa. I think that um, earlier Vaughn had a really interesting point about that, where this was part of their plan is that, I mean, there, you can get uranium in Ukraine, you know, you can get, um, there's a lot riding on Ukraine in particular. And so for France and it, just those other European countries in general, it's just almost like an existential nightmare in slow motion happening. And they're trying, they want to, I think more than anything else, what they want to do is they want to bluff Russia into, um, into peace negotiations. Um, they want to bluff Russia into basically freezing the conflict, not taking any more of Ukraine, not going for Odessa. And I think that's why the conversation around French troops going in revolved around Odessa. I think that there was probably some background discussions going on between Russia and France because we'd seen some things in the news about that um, with Putin saying, like mentioning things during his speeches about um, uh Russia not having needing to be careful to not uh, sign a premature peace that on on um, terms that are that don't take significant uh, the reality on the ground into account. So I think that's kind of what he was talking about uh, when the, he mentioned that. And I think what's happening is they're desperately are trying to uh, they're doing a desperate gambit to negotiate a way to freeze things where they are at right now. And I don't think, I don't know how much of, how how much they really are intending to quote unquote go in. Um, Cause I have, what, what else can they do? Go in with what tanks, you know? Um, I, I don't know who goes next. I think Joey. Daniel, yeah, yeah, Joey. Did, I, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, when Blinken went, went to France, was he trying to like to talk down the French on this issue of going to Ukraine? Cause that's what I've been hearing. That's what's, I mean, people are saying behind the scenes that the Americans are not so keen on this issue of France sending troops, even on a supporting role to to Ukraine. Is that what Blinken had really gone to do in France? Because this French thing is just no. I, I think I think if you go along like with what I was saying, what Bradley said, and a lot of everybody else kind of said. The reason maybe they're so hot to get some troops in there, especially in the Odessa, is, you know, Odessa is the last place they can still make a shit ton of money off this thing. So if they can get some kind of peace deal with Russia and keep Odessa, you know, yeah, the pot's a lot smaller, but they still get some influence in the region and they still have their foot in the door and they still get to make all the money that goes, you know, think about all the garbage that the West could be involved in in Odessa. I mean, it would be like some kind of frontier city, free for all, between Russia and the West. So, I mean, that might be a reason why they're so hot to get troops in there, or somebody in there, or some kind of force in there to secure it or provide humanitarian aid, because the port of Odessa is probably their last chance to really make a lot of money off this deal and keep their foot in the door. Uh, if I if I understood correctly, because I I did read the the treaty that Germany uh, signed with um, with Ukraine, so it's a bit strange because the treaty uh, uh, concedes that if one of the countries is attacked, the other one needs to support that country with weapons and even soldiers as, as much as they can. Well, it's pretty much the same as a NATO small treaty, but the thing is that it's it presuppose. Pre pre that this will be in the future when Ukraine, if Ukraine or Germany are attacked, so not now, and so that's the treaty is a bit strange in the way that that um, that uh, convention they did with themselves. So the interesting thing about what all you guys said is that uh, we have this feeling that the West is trying to convince Russia, because of course Russia is not going to sign that stupidity of the ten points of Zelensky. They are trying to bring. Um, the conflict to be frozen. And in doing the conflict being frozen, all these uh, treaties would come to light if, if something happened. But we, without being a real, a real definition of, uh, of peace, it means, it, because it is frozen, it means somewhere in time is going to explode again. So we can see 
actually Ukraine restoring their forces and trying to regain those territories again because it doesn't want to accept the fact that it needs to make territorial concessions. And the West is also not able to do to force it in a way. So this is the bigger problem about these little little treaties that the security uh, uh, um, assurance that some Western countries gave to Ukraine. On the other side, you guys have been talking about NATO. No, it, and I think Ariel also made it more or less clear. It's not NATO. It's some countries because NATO with itself wouldn't allow many, it would need for all countries to uh, to say yes, to uh, agree, and that's very difficult, we know. We saw also in this NATO um, uh, um, uh, summit of foreign ministers that most of what uh, Stoltenberg wanted to impose didn't come out, because NATO is actually not, not very, not very un unified, like they like to portray. The, the Americans are protecting themselves, that's obviously, but they're also creating a kind of uh, ambiguous situation where they, when, where they actually could decide later what to do, but still continuing the conflict because the conflict is not over. If Ukraine conflict is frozen, it will jump somewhere else. This is obvious. This is the geopolitical conflict which involves China most and foremost, and Russia was... It's just on the on the game. It's one of the players. It's, there are many other players. Uh, many of you guys said BRICS are appearing. So there are a lot of players coming. About the nuclear bombs, I would say we have actually the probability of uh, uh, Israel using a nuclear bomb. And this is very probable. And this is where we all should be afraid. Wait, sorry. So uh, just now you were talking about nuclear mines. You know, like the Fr France need to secure the nuclear production in Ukraine. So then I realized I've never knew where the mines are. So I went to search for where the nuclear mines are. So it's actually right in the middle of Ukraine, in uh, this in the oblast of Kropinipsky, which is the next to Dnipro, north of Kyivire and uh, Mykolaiv. So that location is exactly where I say that the Russian lines will end. You no, know, if Russia were to conquer whatever they want to conquer in the rest of Ukraine, this line will be just will, will just nice capture the entire nuclear production because uh because it's along the Dnipro river uh, i don't know which way i should so and then it will and then the the closest point is towards the Transnistria will be just nice capture the entire of the nuclear production and if russia really wins 100% have a total victory like how i imagine it to be but they wouldn't conquer the of all of ukraine like most of Ukraine, uh, to the point where this closest point from Dnipro River to Transnistria, you will include the central part of Ukraine where they produce nuclear weapon, uh, nuclear uh, the uranium, which means that whatever plan that uh, France think that they have, if that is true, will be out of the window, and probably Russia would probably know because you know now uranium becomes a very precious resource, which France is running out. Of options and the reality is germany needed gas france needed uranium everything can be bought from russia but they choose to fight with russia which is like the mind-blowing thing about about it about it in my opinion there's no reasons to you need to fight for it you can buy it for cheap russia is willing to sell you cheap but no paul i wanted to say that uh, in uh, second world war uh, the one who liberated uh, Europe was Russia. The one who occupied Europe was, was the United States. So we, you, you, uh, we, we Europeans were occupied, but United States were like colonies. In Romania, now they changed the law. They put a law because uh, they wanted to go to Ukraine. That law uh, stipulated that uh, the army and uh, other police uh, uh, other forces like police uh, can go there. Sorry, you I me? was adjusting. They can go with the other country to protect the the citizen, the Romanian citizen. And uh, in in uh, Republic of Moldova, there are millions of uh, Romanian citizens. They also are hundreds of thousands of uh, Ukrainian who are uh, ethnic and Romanian. So. I think the NATO country, they are not NATO, let's say Romania, Polish, uh, 
France, they will go to to Ukrainian. It's a matter of time. I don't know how. Maybe this year, maybe next year, but I think they will go to Romain, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, IRL, go. Uh, about the natural resources of Ukraine. The, the, the Iranian mine of Ukraine are not as interesting yeah. and important as what you find in Kazakhstan or Niger or elsewhere. Yeah, it's uranium mine, but the concentration of uranium is not as important as in uh, other places in the world. But the main resources the West in general wanted in Ukraine was mainly uh, rare earth minerals and lithium with the biggest lithium consent deposit of uh, Europe being in Luhansk. And iron. They have extreme lithium or of, your, of iron. Yeah, they, they, they have iron, they have coal, they have many things, but amongst other things, the biggest deposit of lithium which is very important for the famous EV electric vehicles shift that the European Union decided for 2035, maybe. But I don't see that plan going very well for them because without that lithium, they will have to buy their uh, batteries from China. And because they also have a plan to, to decouple from China, but without Chinese batteries. That master plan will, will also fail. And now I give uh, the speech to whoever want to talk. Well, I, I wanted to say about uranium. The problem about uranium is that it needs an industry with itself. So Ukrainians have something, but it has been abandoned. They don't have that bad concentration is 0.1%, uh, which is pretty much like normal, let's say it. Well, in, in Niger, the concentration is bigger, uh, but in, uh, in Kazakhstan is less. But the problem is that Kazakhstan has a whole industry from the beginning until the end, to get, uh, organized together with the Russians. So, uh, yeah, so the, the French... The French are a bit paranoid about uh, uranium. There is enough uranium around the world and the Russians will sell it because they also need to make money. Uh, and so the, 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 the thing is here, it's, I think we, we talked about it last, uh, the last um, uh, open mic. The French have some paranoia about uh, having kind of a monopole of some, of some uh, supply lines. It doesn't really make much of a sense. They still, like like we know, this paranoia about Niger when they actually buy most of their uranium coming from, from Kazakhstan, but they needed to be in Niger. They needed, it was like paranoia. Some people say it's much more from Niger than they actually is, is officially painted. I think you said it. I think Chadovi also said it. Yeah, so wait. So the uh, talking about uranium production again, uh, Ukraine's largest uranium producer has gone bankrupt, according to a Ukrainian uh, website's article just eight days ago. Eight days ago, so uh, and the energy ministry seems to ignore the problem. So according to the article, this 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 uh, company called Vistoshny All Mining and Processing Plant, Eastern or basically Eastern. Uh, so they are one of the 28 mining centers in the world. It's in the top 10, controls 2% of global production. It's the largest in Europe and the only enterprise in Ukraine that extracts natural uranium ore and produce uranium oxide concentrate uh, and produces uh, up to 40% of uranium needs, uh, uranium needs in Ukrainian uh, nuclear power plants and uh, is going bankrupt. So it is uh, setting up nicely the pathway to be bought out by uh, overseas it's a state-owned company by the way it's not private so you know uh I probably we can start to see, see you know maybe some french you know state-owned company or something you know to buy up the shares and say oh we are here to save you you know you don't need to go bankrupt the uh, americans will do it first <laughs> i don't know who who came up the first but shadow v, uh, shadow, v, 
Shadow I Beast. wanted to add something about the French uranium uh, in Niger. You have to understand one thing about the, the French mine, what uh, everybody calls like, them like that. They are just not French. Uh, actually, 61% of the Arlit mine, with the main uh, uranium mine in Niger, belong to uh, Areva or Orano, the same society, and they're just 61%. 20% belong to the Niger, Niger government. And you know what? For the rest of the shares, it belongs to a Chinese company, a Canadian company, a US company, a Dutch German company, and I think there is an Australian one. So basically, if Niger want to uh, nationalize uh, the Arlit mine, they need to uh, take uh, uh, shares of China, Canada, Australia, Dutch. Oh, so it's never going to happen. So French is going to continue to receive their uranium from Niger. Hey guys, I, I, I want to throw out a question no. to you guys. No. Because the okay, Niger government decided to put uh, an embargo on the exporta on the exportation of uranium. Yes. And, and that mine is, that? is just and that they mine is, is just uh, one mine. And there are many other mines in Niger. Many, Look many the, others, the, the in which, in which Orano is, is also in involved. It's a, there are not see, just uh, one uranium Look mine in Internet. Niger, Shadowy. Yes, there are not just all one of them uranium are mine in the system of shareholders. Yes, and thanks to Bazoum. Never owned but Bazoum now is no alone. more. And Orano now extract zero uranium from Niger because they got kicked out. Mm, I didn't know and I Niger know. itself doesn't know exactly the quantity of uranium that is shipped outside its country. They never know it. There is no official data about the uh, amount of uranium extracted in their country. Even Niger's official government don't know it. Incredible. Go on, Nunia. Uh, are we done with Niger? Or, no, I, 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 continue, well, continue. I'm going to check the numbers. I, I want to throw this out to the group because like, I understand how Ukraine was an existential threat for Russia. I understand how it was existential for Ukraine. Now, within the past two years, we've somehow made it existential to everybody in the West, right? Because we hear now that it's an existential crush. You, you hear Macron and people, you know, like that speaking that. But they never explained to me why. Why is Ukraine an existential threat to Europe, for example? Like, as, as Prada just said, there's no shortage of uranium. There's no shortage of, like, there's nothing in Ukraine worth dying over. So why is this now all of a sudden existential? Like, I realize that we've spent tons of money on it, and America spent even more money on it, but it's still not existential to any of us, and they've never explained to us why it is. So I just want to throw it out to the group to help me understand it. Uh, Paul. No one understands. Uh, no, but, the, yes. the Ukrainian conflict is not about Ukraine. It's about Russia and Europe. This is uh, the, the, the problem. That, that's why uh, the, the country of Europe go to sign the deal with the Ukraine. Because uh, uh, U.S. don't want to be involved. U.S. want to drag Europe in the war against Russia. Want to bankrupt uh, Europe and then buy... Uh, in the that's review of Europe very cheaply. Yeah, I and, and I, I get all that, Paul, but I guess I go back to my original question. Like, yeah. ha had we not started this conflict in the first place, Europe would still be getting all those cheap resources from Russia. Like, we changed the exactly. equation, not them. So I don't yeah. understand how this is existential. Yeah, this exactly is the that. US game. This is the U.S. game. Oh, U.S. Oh. game. No, okay. it, it was. Well, the thing is that let's go back to the beginning of this conversation with what is catastrophic about 
the Ukrainian losing the conflict, which they actually already did more or less consensually. So the thing, there is nothing catastrophic about it. Like I said before, before the conflict, Ukraine was something nobody really wanted to work with. It was a place where its borders were very, the borders between Europe and Ukraine were very problematic. It was, it, it was a, a difficult place to deal with, with a lot of criminality, and that won't change, nevertheless. So the thing is about what Nunez said, is about resources. Yes, they, we could have had resources from Russia very easily, but they decided to make a cut because they have the feeling that China is going to manipulate all the supply lines of some important resources, and that will block the development of the Western countries. It's, it's fully, it's lunatic. Uh, Europe, the Western countries are not prepared to make some, to, to hold some industries. They are not prepared to bring them back to their country. They are just not prepared. So this is complete stupidity. The world is uh, is globalizing more and more, even with this bullshit about splitting the world. It's globalizing more. And about, um, you see, I, I understand that, Paul, you're from Romania. And you, you live this conflict very near to you. And also, Ukraine is not something that is unknown to you. Uh, it's not Romania was not part of the Soviet uh, Soviet uh, uh, Union, but was part of the uh, Warsaw uh, Warsaw Pact. It was one of the poorest countries uh, in the so in the in the Warsaw Pact. But already before it was a, unfortunate, it was always a very poor country. Nevertheless, uh, the thing is, and it's still unfortunately still has their difficulties inside of the European Union. Like I, my congratulations, I think Romania just enter finally the Schengen area, <laughs> finally, more or less. But the thing is that, of course, for Romania or for Portugal or for France, we have different perspectives of what is that Ukraine. And uh, like I said, Paul lives nearby, uh, near in the frontier with it, and he has a different perspective, but I'm sure he remembers how Ukraine was for a long time a really problematic place. And, and even Moldavia. Moldavia is still one of the poorest countries in Europe, and it's, it's the source of a lot of criminality to Europe, even today. So the thing is... Um, there is no, the, the problem is that we this, uh, now, after the, we started the war, we are having another problem besides the spending of money with all these elites and all these lobbies and so on, is the fact that we need, the, uh, NATO is not, has not yet agreed what kind of a border they are going to have with Russia. They even don't have and even thought what kind of economic relations they are going to have with Russia after this war, which is the biggest problem they have, because they will need Russian support. They will need Russian resources. And sometimes the resources don't even are Russian, but the Russians refine them, like the uranium from Kazakhstan. It's got true Russia. The whole industry of refining and, and centrifugating and so on is actually in Russia. So I think Drew was first. Drew? Drew? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, sorry, uh, uh, I, I, I came on to answer Nunia's question of why this is uh, existent, why this conflict is existential for well, both the US and the EU. Uh, first, for the US, you just have to look at their trade balance. Uh, I think in 2022, it was like negative one trillion a year. So basically, they take from the world about three trillion worth of goods and they sell to the world about two trillion worth of goods. So where does where do they get the one trillion from? They basically borrow money, uh, and then the people who make the one trillion from the trade will basically buy the, the 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 bonds that the U.S. government sells. So they lend the money back to the U.S. government, which it then uses to uh, give to its people to then buy more goods from those other countries, right? So this is an unsustainable uh, 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 arrangement because. Eventually, the U.S. will go bankrupt because people will realize that it can't keep paying the uh, the debt. So it will go. Uh, it, so what the U.S. can do in the meantime is to basically invade more and more countries to then take the resources for free. Uh, so invade Iraq, take the oil, invade you know create problems in Libya, take whatever it's there, and, and so on and so forth. 
So they kind of run out of places to invade and take stuff for free. So um, Russia was their next place to go. And their plan was to go invade Russia, break it up, and then they can start taking the stuff for free. That's what the US has always been doing to, to maintain the, the standard of living in the US. They need to kind of do that because the US itself doesn't produce enough stuff that other people want. So it's essential for the US because if they can't, if they if they can't break up Russia and take its resources, they're gonna go bankrupt. There's, there's no other way unless their people stop buying random crap from other places and start making stuff that the world wants, right? It's essential for the uh, 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 European Union because it's not really. If you look at European Union's uh, balance of trade uh, before all of this kicked off, you was actually doing a trade surplus, you know. Yeah. So they were quite okay, uh, but after. Uh, the U.S. convinced uh, blew up Nord Stream and basically destroyed their free uh, cheap fuel. Then it became existential because now they've lost their source of cheap fuel. They are they are de industrializing, so they are in the same spot as the U.S. now. If they are unable to conquer and break up Russia, they will go bankrupt eventually because they have lost their fuel. They have lost the ability to continue producing competitive goods to sell to maintain their trade uh, surplus with the rest of the world. So th that's why right now it's essential. Before that, before the US blew up Nord Stream, it wasn't. You know, so they were quite happily uh, uh, okay before. Uh, now it's essential. Uh, I'll give it to RL, who has been... Oh, Prata, when you say that before the war, Ukraine for the Europeans was a, a problem country. Yes, you are right. Of course, yeah. and it still is. But you are making your assumption uh, on, on, on the basis that European countries <laughs> are sovereign, which are not. They are not sovereign. That's why they went in in that war. They are just puppets of the United States. And Germany is the perfect example of that submission and vassalization. Nobody understands in Europe, even in United States, how the German elites are just laying down with their ass up, their asshole wide open, ready to get fucked. Nobody understand that. And the first who don't to don't get it are the Germans themselves. So it's the you and I share the 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 point of Paul. It's the United States who have decided. It's the United States who have imposed it. They have imposed that current situation in Ukraine. And the Europeans had, have, and will have no say. What will be the border with Russia? It's not to the European to decide. It will be the Americans who will maybe decide it. If not the Russians, who will impose it. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, 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 that's the true thing. And whatever happens, Europeans will just be No, the glory hall. And now I give the, 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 the speech to Joy. Yeah, for me, I think it's uh, the West sees it as existential because there's, we're not just looking at Ukraine, we're looking at the larger geopolitical struggle that is there uh, for a multipolar world. The West sees that they're declining, especially the United States. They are seeing the shifting sands that we're moving from a unipolar world where the United States was dominant with its rules-based order. And now you're shifting to a multipolar world where there are new players are emerging Russia and uh, rising China. So they felt by fomenting this Ukraine war, they can knock out Russia out of the ranks of the great powers and they can maybe prolong their unipolarity. So a defeat for the West in Ukraine would be a serious dent 
for the West and especially the United States in trying to maintain its unipolarity. And also there's this prestige aspect in that the West has always claimed, especially the United States have always, have always touted to the world that they have invincible, invincible weapons that anytime they support a, a country in a war situation because of the United States power and strength, they will always prevail. And if Russia wins, that would be a huge prestige blow to the United States. And now other countries in the world will be asking, if, United, if the United States backed Ukraine to this extent and they still lost, how, how much can we be guaranteed with the U US security? So for me, that's where now the existential threat comes in. And even the survivability of NATO as it's currently configured. Yeah. Jean, what is their prestige? Yeah. Jean, what yeah. is their prestige? Is prestige power? You say yeah, prestige. prestige well, power. is prestige is power? What is yeah. prestige for you? Because the Americans already lost prestige. But they don't think they have lost it. We know they have lost it, but they don't think they have lost it. And most of the world doesn't think for now Thank that you. they have lost it. Because everybody was. You've seen the way they were talking about, oh, we bring Abrams tanks, they'll just knock off the Russian tanks because Russian tanks are inferior. There's all that. So this now this is the prestige that is now on the line, that this United States omnipotence and invincibility is on the line now. Yeah, because more, okay, As we know, the United States has lost its prestige, but most of the mainstream world doesn't think so. And that's now what is in the balance at the moment. Yeah. So if they lose, then... People are like, okay, if the United States can pump all these billions in weapons, in funds, in military support to Ukraine, and they still lose, is the United States still the global power that we used to know? So that's also on the line. Okay, at least according to me. Well, I guess that's why I've never gotten a good explanation for it, because there isn't a good explanation for it. Like, you can't tell your populations that we're a bunch of ghouls who are just resource hungry and want to, you know, knock off other nations, right? So, yeah, it's pretty depressing when you think about it that way. Yeah, I kind of want to add on. Uh, can you guys hear me, by the way? I'm not sure if my mic is working. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to answer Nanya's questions why I joined. Um, so the first thing to say is that I don't think it's actually objectively an existential threat for the for the West. If you look at the, you know, you guys have talked about various considerations about the, the currency, about the resources and so on. Uh, but those are not going to make or break you know, the quality of life in the West, or certainly not the existential integrity of the West. I mean, those are considerations, but they're not really the primary story. I think the primary story, first of all, the reason why the war is being waged with such uh, such energy by the West is because the leaders of the West, it's a very personal story uh, for the specific leaders of the West, right? There's a very, very specific personal hatred that many of the people who are in charge of the West right now have for Russia. They want to see Russia destroyed, it's not a rational thing. They just simply want to see it destroyed. Uh, I'm thinking of Victoria Newland here. If you look up her her heritage, uh, if you look at Joe Biden and look at the uh, the uh, the corruption that he's involved with in Ukraine, um, that's one of the main reasons that we're, that we're in Ukraine. Ultimately, I don't think it comes down to any strat strategic calculus as much as uh, it comes down to these personal considerations. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, why are they presenting this as a existential threat? Right. Why? And not only that, but why are so many people getting worked up into such a frenzy about this being an existential threat or acting like it is? Right. Well, I think that it comes down to, uh, you know, a basic tenet of the ideology of the West today and the ideology of the West today. It kind of requires um, a, a strive towards one world government uh, because uh it's not an ideology that can accept somebody else disagreeing with it. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it, it requires that all people follow the same set of values, right? Um, it's basically, it's almost Islamic in a sense, right? It's extremely universalizing, right? Um, 
it needs everybody to follow the same set of values. And that's why you see so much friction with Hungary and Poland, for example, with uh, with 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 enforcing uh, gay marriage in in Hungary and Poland, with enforcing gay marriage in Taiwan and Japan, right? The West's ideology today, and I basically follow Garland Nixon on this, uh, and I'll pass it to Drew in a moment. I basically follow Garland Nixon on this, and I would recommend people to watch his his uh, his content. You know, he talks about how neoconservatism as a foreign policy, neoliberal economics, and progressive social policy are basically three heads of the same beast, right? It's about unifying the world into one system, uh, destroying families, destroying nations, right? And um, that's what they're try trying to stand up against. Uh, that's what Russia is trying to stand up against, right? Russia presents, is, is trying to say, hey, I just want to go ahead and be an equal partner to the West. I don't want to be subservient to the West. But the West, the people of the West can't accept that. They have to be the only game in town. They have to be the kings of the United Nations. They have to be the only source of legitimacy in the world, right? Democracy must be the only source of legitimacy, right? Western values, human rights as we call them, must be human rights, not Western rights. You see what I mean? So the same energy that got people fired up about how badly they're treating women in Afghanistan and how much of an evil dictator Saddam was, it's the same energy that's making people uh, upset about how Russia is full of a bunch of uh, fascists or uh, how Russia doesn't, doesn't have Pride Month. You know, it's the same energy. It's this universalizing thing that our values must be the world's values, you know, and it's uh, it's it's kind of driving people into hysteria, you know, and I think that's the root cause of the problem. And the upshot is that of that is that once the West is, does suffer a setback in Ukraine, I think that that ideology will also start to crumble. Um, so that's why I think that the West acts like it's a existential threat because of their massive hysteria that's going on. So I'm going to pass it to Drew and then RL because I think they both wanted to speak. Uh, I, I disagree with what you said about Islam. Islam is not an intolerant religion. Uh, I live with many Islamic people. My neighbors are Islamic. They yeah, and you live in Singapore, religion. man. Not Malaysia. Yeah. Cross the border over to Malaysia, see how you feel. Talk to average dude. Next I, I, I go to Malaysia all the time. They, they, are, they, are, they are intolerant uh, uh, people and they are tolerant people and they are both Islamic. Uh, so don't, don't, don't say that they are intolerant. Just say that the West is intolerant, you know? And Islam is, you know, yeah, the West yeah. is. Like, I know, I, I know, I think think about Islam too, Drew. But okay, fine, we can agree to disagree on that. And the U.S. propaganda. No, no, no. Now I'm an Islam bot. <laughs> I'm speaking up for Islam because I know a lot of Islamic guys. Yeah, they're, they're just regular guys. You know, they they say you want to believe in your God, go ahead. I I believe in my God. Call, then, call them Muslim, please. Uh, Islam is a religion. Muslim is is the people that yeah, fine. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank the, you. Uh, uh, there was one one thing I, I, I actually wanted to uh, put out there uh, uh, and I might disrupt the whole thing, but hey, whatever. Uh, I was thinking of why, uh, why, uh, why Russia is just uh, 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 basically bombing uh, Kharkiv uh, recently and, and not really much where else. Why are they taking out the power specifically in Kharkiv? And then we saw the reason why. Uh, after they started uh, bombing Kharkiv, you saw these huge uh, caravans of people leaving Kharkiv. <laughs> so basically, they are bombing Kharkiv specifically and taking out the power. And they're not just bombing the transfer stations anymore. They're taking out the, the power stations. So they can't be repaired. So Kharkiv is going to be permanently in blackout situation. So now they are trying to redivert power from the West. you know, And, and then they are bombing those transfer stations now. So they are, they are making sure Kharkiv stays black. And when... when, when what happens when you permanently make a, a, a city, the entire city blackout? All the people will leave. So that's so. What's going to happen next is after a few months or weeks of this, and most of the stubborn people have left, then they will invade because their objective is never to kill the civilians, but to to basically, you know, that's their way of preventing uh, civilian losses. I think so. Um, so that is a sure sign that the next big thing after Chasifia and all the little villages to the west of Adivka, the next big place they're going to go for isn't Zaporozhia, isn't uh, Sumi or any of the other big cities. It's Kharkiv because they are, they are, they are directly attacking that, the power structure of that place now. That, that. Uh, Drew, just very yeah. short before I give you to Ariel. It's, they are provoking an exodus. They are provoking more migrants to Europe 
that's the weapon that the Europeans really are afraid of. They are really scared about five to seven bil million Ukrainians that suddenly would go. So they are just saying, the Europeans, be careful. We can do this. And they just did it in Kharkov. But, of course, your lecture is also... Uh, no, if, if, if they Kharkov. really wanted to do that, they will, they, will, they will bomb the power stations on the west of Ukraine. And all those guys will run west. They're not. They started. They're bombing Kharkiv. They, 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 started in, they started also on the west. RL, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Archimedes, when you say that in the West it was mainly a personal grief of the leaders against Russia, it might be if the individuals you're talking about are the American ones, mm. but not the Europeans. Got all, yes. Because in that club, Imagine you create a club and all the members of that club are appointed by yourself. This is the West. Most of European leaders, most of them, not all, but most of them, are handpicked by Atlantic interest. The famous young leaders all the people who are uh, 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 revolving around Atlantic interest, especially linked to the Democratic Party. But if, if you analyze what happened to Europe, it was very well thought. Destruction of Europe and all the industry going, back, going to the United States. I mean, it's just more than simply a, a personal grief against Russia, way more. It was fault. They think about it, but it didn't go as well because they didn't think about the, 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 the response of their opponent, the response of China, the response of Russia, even the response of Iran making their own deals, making their own institutions, making their own defenses against aggressions from the West, whether in financial point of view, in economic point of view, in a, a trade thingy, a, a, in economic point of view. No, the, the, the Europeans have no say. The Intermediate Range uh, Ballistic Missile Treaty, which was especially made for the Europeans that Donald Trump scrapped, the Europeans had no say on it. The Europeans, who, which, which was the, 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 the first to, uh, to be involved in it, they had no say. Donald Trump just scrapped it and voila. It was a dumb deal. A, a, a treaty that was specifically made for the European continent. That's, that's how you see how in that Western club, you, you, the Europeans are just puppet, puppets. That's all they are. And they will bear the consequences of all the decisions made by the master, Uncle Sam. If, if I may... Go on, Prata. Think, if I may, I think it's, it's not correct to see uh, the other without agency. Everybody has a political uh, role. Everybody plays a role in this all. It's not the Europeans have nothing to say. Of course they have. And I, I, and I agree with much of what Archimedes said. I was going to give a, a, an example not far, not, not many weeks ago in, in India where the um, uh, Dutch foreign minister said something that let the whole auditorium uh, shocked. She said that European values are universal values. And it took a while 
because most of people were actually diplomats in the room. It took them a while, but they actually gave her an answer and said, no, that's not true. Of course, that's not true. And there are many people really believe in that. And uh, when Joe said the prestige of the United States, I, 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 I never leave the United States so alone because Europeans are part of that club as well. They, they, they really notice that their prestige is gone. Their ability to persuade the others is gone. They're, and they notice it every day. They notice how more difficult it is to persuade them with those arguments that where democracy is the only way of legitimizing whatever they think it's democracy. Uh, when actually, like we all more or less agree, there is a problem of uh, there is a crisis of democracy in European countries because of all this hierarchy structure that the European Union is creating. But we have agency, and our politicians also have agency. When we see this last uh, summit of NATO, we notice that not everybody is on the same line. There are many countries and many uh, um, elites uh, of different parts of country. We are not agreeing with what is happening. They are just not talking. Perhaps they are not strong enough or they don't want to, they don't want to spoil the, the circus. But uh, going back to Archimedes, the idea there is some elites that really are nurturing a hate, a very deep inside hate. Yes, it is true. It's, it, it is intensified and it is augmented with those Atlantises. But in many countries, in the Baltic countries, in Poland, there is a deep inside, very old actually, deep inside hate against the Russians. And they have this feeling they have to pay. Vaughn was talking about Callas. That woman is completely crazy. And he was saying, oh, she's always saying that my grandfather was killed by the Russians. And my grandmother with my mother in her arms was sent to was sent to Siberia. But she's not special. So many people died in war. But it doesn't matter. And I and, and you have probably seen as well, there is a lot of critics inside of the European Union that this Eastern European uh, uh, discourse, narrative is taking over Europe like if it was an experience that all Europe had experienced, which is all completely not true. And and they are and, and I have said that in the past that the I, I I foresee that in the future the Western European countries which have a more humanistic, which have a, a less conflictless side with Eastern Europe, will actually break from Europe. If this continues, because this type of, of hate discourse of narrative is not compatible with the history of the most Western countries of Europe. Yes, we made colonialism, we made all that, but we recognize we more or less, excluding a bit France, we kind of uh, are uh, penitencing it somehow. Uh, but this new mentality, this new discourse that is breeding in, in Eastern Europe, it's making Europeans really bad in, in, in the world. This prestige is not there as well because the, the, the rest of the world listen to these Europeans and they are shocked. They are, they are worse than the old colonialists. They are ready to do really bad things to us, to explore us. They are ready to tell us that their values need to be my values too, like Archimedes was saying. So Archimedes, I give you the voice, sorry. Yeah, thanks. I'll pass it to Joey in just a second. I just have a brief comment. Um, you know, the, the Western Europeans, you're right, are, are, are enacting this gigantic, you know, multi-generational penitence for, uh, for the crimes that they committed. And, uh, you know, I think that's the biggest thing that's keeping Western Europe from having any political agency in this conversation. NATO consists of Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and North America. The North Americans don't feel that same level of penitence. They do to some degree, but it's mostly relating to the treatment of the blacks and the natives here on the continent rather than global imperialism. The Western Europe, uh, the Western Europeans are completely paralyzed by feeling really, really sorry for how mean they were at bringing the world into the modern era. Oh, what a crime. How terrible. Uh, the Eastern Europeans, meanwhile, are rightly feeling like victims. I mean, if you look at their history in the 1800s and 1900s, they didn't conquer anybody. They were the ones getting conquered from either side, from the West and from the East. And so the Eastern Europeans today are the ones that have the political will 
to go and say, you know what, let's go ahead and be a little bit crazy. Let's start a war. Let's let's take let's go and impose our values on someone else uh, now that they can. And the Western Europeans are being taken along for the ride by the Eastern Europeans and the Americans. And, you know, I don't think anything's going to change that, unfortunately. But go ahead, Joey. Sorry. Ah, yeah, in fact, further on what uh, Prada and Arithmides have, have stated, Paul is under, and maybe Paul can answer this because he's from Eastern Europe. What is this? Why is this so much hatred for Russia, at least within Eastern Europe? The Baltic states, Poland, are fanatically against Russia. Okay, Poland, maybe they will argue that, you know, during World War II, their officers were killed during the Katyn massacre and all that. And then there's this argument that the Soviet Union was overbearing on the Eastern European settlers during the Cold War. Was it that so bad that when the Soviet Union started weakening in, in the late 80s, the, the Eastern European countries were like just rushing out of the communist bloc? Why is this? Is it a hated from only by the elites or is it also by the general population? If you go, let's say, Paul, if you go around there, like you, I definitely I know you don't hate Russia, but if you go around the Romanian streets in, is it Budapest? What is the capital of Romania? Yeah. If you ask around, who, I'm guessing, how do the commoners feel about Russia? Why is there this fanatical hatred? Maybe Paul could, because he's a Eastern European, maybe he could answer that for me. Paul. Go on, speak. Uh, uh, but don't forget, Paul, 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 is Paul, 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 Paul. Uh, what I wanted <laughs> to say. Uh, yeah. Russia bring uh, bring down all the empire. Sweden, who, who was the mm -hmm. most uh, powerful country in Europe, didn't, didn't uh, make an empire because b b Russia bring down Sweden. Russia bring down the, the Tatars, the Mongols. Russia bring the, down the Turks, Russia bring down Napoleon, Russia bring down the Nazis. Nazis. So Russia, I think uh, you are afraid and you criticize someone who's better than you or was powerful than you. Maybe that's why. I don't know who wants to go next. I would actually say that in terms of all of Eastern Europe and uh, all this hateness between the Russians and the Eastern Europeans. It's actually mostly between Polish and uh, the Russians because it is something on historical uh, because the Polish was actually the only country, the only of two countries who entered the Moscow. And you know, in Russia, if you actually ask anyone if they like Poland, there's no no such people. And in Poland, I, I guess that it is pretty much the same. But in Poland, nobody ri likes Russia. But could this go to such hateness as it, as it is in Ukraine right now? Probably it can. You know, the governments can do anything, so. but it's pretty much just historical beef like since first they burned down the Moscow, then we conquered them, then we burned down two times, we burned down the Warsaw, two rebels, and then after the, how we count the Soviet occupation, that we didn't bring in the life, but eventually, like, if there wasn't Soviet Union, then what? You will be under a Nazi occupation? I guess they kind of, some of them count us, the Soviets, way worse than the Nazis, but it's their decision. I, I find it interesting. So, so, sorry, Nuni, you had your finger, but I will be, try to be short. Actually, it's very interesting when you see about the Baltic countries and even Poland, mm -hmm. the amount of money they were doing in Russia. This the 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 economic economical success, even of Poland, which was for a long time the only country growing over three percent for many years, it was 
because Poland was able to export to Russia many things that the Russians could do, but they were too lazy to do. They even were selling milk to Russians to Russia. So uh, it's it's quite interesting. The Baltic countries as well. These are countries that are on the end of the world almost, but they could survive and they had a good a good uh, a good um, strategy into, commercially by selling uh, exporting things from European Union. To Russia, they all went through uh, uh, Baltic, um, Estonian, Latvians, and, and uh, as intermediaries. Even uh, Lithuania was extremely dependent on on Belarus. And when they become these like defenders of the Belarusian uh, opposition, they 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 went really badly in t- in con- economically. So it's like they are shooting the themselves in the feet and when they notice they shoot themselves in the feet they even get more angry about it which is strange so it's in a way it's like um these countries uh, are having a, a very difficult time to find a new narrative for themselves so hate compensates so that was my point uh Nunia. Well, I just wanted to follow up on Leo's points, uh, which I thought were good ones about number one. Yes, the historical beefs within Europe is insane. Like I always make the joke that the only thing the thing that Europeans hate the most is is other Europeans. And it's true. So you've got a breeding ground for a lot of anger and just noise and friction between countries. Right. And that, and that's been going on for centuries if not forever, since since people started settling there. Uh, but then I also wanted to make the point, never underestimate the power of the Western media. Like when they set their sights on a country, you're finished. So, you know, um, whether it's Iraq or Syria, Afghanistan, Soviet Union, like once they say that you're the enemy, it's it's a full court press against you. So that doesn't help. So when you're in that environment where you're just fed constant anti-Russia news and you're living in an environment where, you know, historically you probably went to war with Russia at some point anywhere and there's a lot of, you know, baggage there, it, it's easy for people to get, you know, an anti-whatever uh, sentiment. Uh, so I just wanted to raise that point too. Go ahead, Ariel. Nice dog. Uh, to follow up to what you just said about when the mass media, the mainstream media, decide to point their finger on a country, you fucked up. This is not working anymore. Uh, because uh, more irrelevant European countries are becoming more irrelevant their public opinion are also becoming. It's definitely becoming harder for sure. Who cares about the opinion in France? Who cares about the opinion of the uh, so-called 50 plus years old housewife and the elders of 80 plus years old who have voted for Macron? Who cares about their opinion, especially outside of Europe? Nobody cares anymore about what the Europeans are thinking. Their mainstream media can say whatever they want. The rest of the world doesn't care because the European countries are less relevant. Mm, and you can I see think... it on, uh, on the international diplomatic front. Mm. Antidote. With Macron sending his LGBTQ uh, ambassador with uh, oh, nice. the Germans trying to influence some uh, uh, African countries, namely Na- Namibia. And you see the Namibian president uh, uh, not, not accepting what uh, the German diplomats is saying about China. They don't care anymore what the West is doing, what the Western European mainstream media are telling to their audience. Even the audience doesn't matter anymore for the rest of the world. And a good example of it is it's what happened in Gaza. And the Western mainstream media 
also have an issue with their own population, with their own audience, where you see many, uh, way more uh, alternative media because you see more and more people who refuse to continue eating that shit because it's pure shit. Go on, Nunya uh, pra uh, Prata. Um, I, I was going to uh, advance what you said because as, as the Europeans lost, lost the, um, the Europeans because of the Eastern Europeans uh, managed to control the narrative, they lost shame on their on those um, post-colonial um, um, ways of reacting to the others. Yes, the others are picking up because it it looks so colonial. They picked up all those anti-colonialism discourses and making an amazing. They they are they, they have the antidote. They have had the antidote for a long time, but they were not able to use it. And now it is perfect. It's all all that things that uh, Sangor, uh, Sankara, and so on, what they wrote, applies perfectly to our times again. And this is, is an anti-colonialist political new movement in Africa, especially in Africa. It's amazing. We we didn't saw the the African leaders before having that courage to confront Western politicians in such a, a shameful way. But the reason for that. That's also because there is agency and not everything is ideology. It's also because these countries now, they have an option. They didn't have an option for a long time, especially when the Soviet Union disappeared. There was a unipolar world and they had to be nice to these guys because it's the only way where they could make money. But now, if you are not that nice to me, I will do business with the, with the Chinese. Or I may go do, go do business like in Niger. Now I will go knock on, on on Moscow and ask them for better deals. And this is the this is also when I was saying the West has lost the prestige long ago. They are just being confronted with it. And the African ones, yes, they are using. They have this old antidote of anti-colonialists, but they are just doing it because they have their their they have their backs warmed they know if if you if you if you try to do me bad i have some i have some option on the other side and this is good this is the multipolar world we have been talking about many people have been talking about but nevertheless is a more dangerous world like Wade has been saying a lot of times so the 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 the, the balance needs to be found all the time but it's great to see africans having a bigger voice. And I would like to remember you guys, I don't know if you have been following the, the new president of Senegal. It's a real revolution, especially because the president is not really the president, but the prime minister. Well, very interesting things in Senegal right now. Joe. Yeah, because you brought up Africa. I, I, okay, remember a few discussions back, we were discussing about the Chinese role in Africa. And yes, to some extent, what you're saying it's mostly true and i agree but one one of the other reasons Afri africa moves towards china or, or russia is that as i said even in the last that discussion yes china is a better partner for africa than the west but there's a caveat to that one of the reasons why african leaders are rushing to china is that china does not ask questions china does not question the unscrupulous behaviors that African leaders have in terms of corruption, in terms of abuse in human rights, uh, expanding democracy, Ch China will not ask. The West, yes, whether they are sincere or not is debatable, but the West sometimes insists on some aspects that are, I would say, progressive to Africans. As I was saying in that prior discussion, Western aid was pegged on African leaders allowing multi-party democracies, allowing freedom of press, not having the opponents being tortured and disappear, never to be seen again. And that's something China will not ask. So the African leaders are like, ah, if I go to China, I can do these misdeeds of mine and nobody will ask. The West keeps, the West keeps nagging me on these issues and I don't want to discuss those issues. I want to 
carry my loot. China will give me my part of their cut in their development deal. So it's not so clear cut. It's not as easy as you're putting it. Like in my they're, country, they're starting to ask. Like this. Yeah, okay, anyway. There's nothing to ask. That's, because it's like, hey, yeah. they, the Chinese come here and say, hey, they're just like us. There's nothing to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get yeah, exactly like my opposition leader can make him vanish. The Chinese will not ask, the West will ask. So it's 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 not as easy as you're putting it. The West, yes, they are bad, but they do ask some critical questions and they do force us to make some progressive changes. Yeah. So I think that was my point. Can can I share a personal anecdote? You know, I I, 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 just briefly, I once knew somebody in college who was, uh, who did a summer trip. They were working in some kind of political science or humanities field. Uh, and they did some sort of, sort of summer trip, research trip to, I believe it was Kenya or Uganda, one of those East African countries. And they were communicating with some remote tribe and, and basically giving them a bunch of survey questions and finding out information about them. And one of the things that they asked them is their attitude about homosexuality, right? And LGBT marriage. And what these tribal people said is that we've never heard about homosexual oh, yeah. it's, not, it's not an issue for us it only started being an issue when the Europeans showed up and started talking all about it when you Americans and Europeans started bringing it up that's when it started to be an issue for us and so this lady that I knew when she came back to America right she wrote a paper about this okay and in her paper she argued that the only reason that the Africans were homophobic was because of the Europeans and before that they had perfectly harmonious relations with their homosexuals, and so it was actually their their ingrained whiteness uh, that was causing them their their white their ingrained white supremacy that was causing them to be anti-gay. So what they needed to do was go there and teach them more about homosexuality and how to accept homosexuals. Uh, that was the conclusion of her paper, and I think that's the mentality of a lot of Americans towards Africa. So you know, Joey, I see what you're saying when you say that it's uh, at least the Americans are trying to get some kind of morality, and the Chinese just let them do whatever they want. But the morality that we're selling them is no good. You know, it's rotten. Or, or maybe, maybe the Africans, you know, the African tribes was like, "What? You, you, you mean that every time, everything that we done is actually different from the what they are doing with women? <laughs> like, no, they take a home please. Or you like, huh? You mean, you mean we can actually poke the backside? <laughs> you know, like, no, but, oh, but, you give but, us but, the but, ideas, no? <laughs> No, what Eric Midi says, what Eric Midi said is true. In pre-colonial period, it homosexuality was not so. It was not such a taboo. Yeah. Okay, it was a taboo, but not so much. Some some cultures accepted it to some extent tacitly. Now, now that when Islam and then the later Europeans came in and became with their religion, the state homosexuality is taboo. And of course, now Africa, you know, is a very religious continent in terms of Islam and Christianity. So once we adopted this religion, now, now the, it became a major, major taboo. But in the pre-colonial area, it was not so much. So guys, as fascinating as the implementation of gay sex in Africa is, yeah, back yeah. to Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> that was when, we think, when, we, yeah. when we think about, uh, when I think about geopolitical mistakes, like big ones in human history. I'm not talking about military failures, but but really bad geopolitical decisions. I'll throw this out to the group. Is Project Ukraine the biggest geopolitical failure you can think of? And if not, what was bigger? Go ahead, Prada. Oh, Jesus Christ. I think Ukraine. I think Ukraine was um, a conflict of last resort. A conflict was going to arrive because the West did huge mistakes during the pandemic. It closed itself down. The Chinese kept working and in expanding their influence in Africa. And when when the West wake up, they had the feeling or the paranoia that they have been left behind when actually they were the ones that went okay. out, out of the international scene. And in doing that, desperated, they thought, okay, if we start a conflict now, we'll come back to the world That's scene. Really they did come back to the world scene, but in a very bad, in a very bad shape, not prepared for it. Uh, with too many uh, prejudices about the ability of the Russians to do anything because of a lot of that ideology that Archimedes uh, just talked about. 
a while ago. So uh, that's uh, how I see it. It's, um, it's a conflict of last resort that was not prepared enough and had very bad uh, re repercussions. There is a lot of amateur things in this conflict. It was, yeah. So who, uh, I, let's, let's go around, guys, or how do you want to do? So I, I think uh, I would pass to Joe and, and further. Yeah, yeah, let's follow. Joe, you have to unmute yourself. But are we finishing? I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Maybe you can pass it to somebody else. Arel? Oh. Yeah, uh, to answer the question of Nunya. Oh. Right now, okay. up to yes. now, yeah, Ukraine, Ukraine oh. is the biggest geopolitical mess from United States. Okay. Because Europeans are not players that are just following what the master is saying. For now, yeah. up to now. So, oh, but oh, maybe I if uh, what happened in the Middle East goes very wrong for Israel, then it might be that also, the creation of the State of Israel, which is a colonial project in my point of view after more than 70 years, 75 years, we will see the outcome of it. But right now, yeah, Ukraine is, is the biggest mess, biggest mistake, geopolitically speaking, because it makes the position of the United States as the sole hegemon uh, in thwart which is something that the US geopoliticians didn't uh, 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 presence, didn't predict it. And now we are seeing it. And they are also seeing it. Go on a great. When, the, when Napoleon attacked Russia in the winter, that was, a, that was also a geopolitical disaster. <laughs> or, or, or was that military? Yeah. Thank you, Aurel. I think for me, the, the biggest one is, uh, is definitely uh, China because you created a direct competitor uh, to the US uh, and you thought you're going to have just a cheap labor market uh, who's producing your goods and you can profit from it. But now you're in direct uh, competition with um, the Chinese for the first place. And the entire your entire hegemony is uh, the balance. So I think uh, China is the biggest mistake because they thought they're gonna open China to the Western democratic way of thinking, and uh, it didn't went exactly this way. And now um, they're scared about the Taiwan uh, situation. Um, much more i think than ukraine because ukraine is failing we all see it and i think it's just a matter of time everybody knows so the the thing is china i think is for me the biggest one um one yeah i think i think you skipped over paul oh so, sorry paul sorry paul sorry, okay. just a okay. I'll, go, I'll go after paul uh, okay uh, I agree with upgrade. The biggest uh, geopolitical was uh, China, and also the next biggest political. They try to destroy economic uh, Russia. They, uh, if they, uh, the U.S. have a different political uh, with Russia, maybe in, in Russia, Europe, and USA form a, a, um, a political and a economical block and. Uh, then the U.S. Uh, can have uh, um, much power in the world. Next is one. Yeah, I was going to say, I think overall it's Ukraine, number one, because the failure in Ukraine, Ukraine enabled the expansion of BRICS, it emboldened our, emboldened our economic rivals, our strategic rivals, our military rivals. I mean, basically anybody who had a beef or, you know, some kind of interest they hadn't been able to maybe realize because of the American influence. I mean, it's retarded. It'll retard American influence around the world. 
it's begun the process of de-dollarization in some ways, maybe not totally, but it's at least going to hurt that. It's also enabled the uh, beginning of the multipolar world. So I think it's overall the largest because it has the b biggest ripple effects. I mean, r while the West is entangled in Ukraine, the Russia's made deals around the world, expanded, you know, the Belt and Road is going farther. You know, Africa is being expanded and purged in some ways. So I think the effects of the failure of the United States in the West in Ukraine are being felt around the world in every theater because of just the idea of America being so weak, everybody is taking advantage of that situation in every aspect they can. My turn. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of a mixed bag uh, about Ukraine because in some ways it's allowed NATO to um, expand, right? You had, you know, Finland join, Sweden join. Um, also, they've brought, um, they've kind of pushed the government out, the conservative government out of Poland and they replaced it with like kind of a global homo thing going on there. Um, that's, you know, um, in line with the WEF's ideology. Um, also, I think the, the the real biggest losers, I think, are uh, Western Europe because they're more and more reliant on the United States. So when people are start talking about de-dollarization, I have I've kind of a different view on that. I think that the currencies that are going to collapse are all the Western European countries, uh, well, and probably Eastern European countries too, are going to collapse. And then just by default, the dollar will become stronger in the intermediate term. Now, in the long run, there are certain structural issues with the dollar that are unsustainable. But in the intermediate term, it will make the dollar much stronger because if you can't invest in the euro, because <laughs> who, what psychopath would, right? They're going to go to the dollar. At least some of them will. I mean, they're going to go to other assets too, like gold. We're seeing this huge surge in gold prices, which is kind of concerning. Um, but uh, that's kind of how I see it. So I think in, in a way this will help the U.S. in the intermediate term. And the United States doesn't seem to be interested in the long term anyway. So anyway, my two cents, I think, um, I think Leo is next. I mean, basically, I think the biggest geopolitical mistake of West wasn't even Ukraine, but not uh, letting Russia to be its ally, because it's actually what Russia was trying till the last uh, and actually still kind of tries to um, fight for but eventually all of this escalations uh, west has decided that it's gonna go against russia and try to kind of blow up uh, the stabilized situation around russia and they kind of have uh, succeeded in ukraine but they did not succeed in belarus in 2020 they did not succeed in kazakhstan and the thing is that actually if they instead of trying to fight russia what honestly just most stupid thing they could thought of uh, they actually could emulate it and i'm not talking about Russia joining NATO, like there was a clear statement by Boris Yeltsin just 10 years before, the, basically in 1997, that it's not yet time to talk uh, about that Russia going gonna join NATO. But, uh, you know, at least from economical perspective, don't sanction Russia, be the biggest partner of Russia, what could benefit it, the European economy said. We wouldn't have any of those crises here, at least with the prices. But, and from this perspective, they could even influence to Russia to be become uh, anti-China country. And this could actually be way, way better for West, but they pretty much woke in the bear now. And yeah, it's 
I, I don't know why, but they decided so. We have to take action, have to take gun in our hands now. So, okay. Anyway, whoever next, I think. I think okay. crypto. Yeah, I'm going to say that it's only the third worst geopolitical failure. Um, the worst geopolitical failure, by far catastrophic and irretrievable, in my opinion, is the CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act is the single most catastrophic piece of suicide I've ever seen of industrial policy. And it essentially forced Russia and China into a technology union. Um, we can get into that later. But ultimately, in my view, the reason I think that's more important is because seven-eighths of the world will end up buying its high-tech from China, and only one-eighth of the world will buy from a much more divided and capitalist competitive market in the West. And that's fatal. That's the end. You can't sustain an R&D complex on one-eighth of the world's markets. The reason I say that Ukraine is only third is because there's a second, even worse thing than Ukraine, and that's the way the United States has allowed itself to be tied down with the giant boat anchor of Israel. If you watch the analysis of John Mearsheimer, you'll see that it is not in America's strategic interest in any way to be trapped on the same side as, as Israel in the present situation or any situation, really. It's outlived its usefulness as a geopolitical anchor, and the United States needs the other countries in Arabia and the Suez Canal functioning and the Mideast peaceful and Iran isolated way more than it needs anything in or from Israel. So that's a disaster. Also, even collapsing and looting Israel for its high tech talent, and, which is fleeing the country, by the way, easily half a million people have already left, or maybe a million. It can take all of those people, but it already had access to everything they were doing. It didn't really gain anything by hiring away Israeli engineers the way it, it probably did gain out of Ukraine, where there was, you know, they were arguably in the Russian camp and or used to be in the Russian camp, and, and they had so many more. So that's a worse geopolitical mistake right now than Ukraine. There is a way in which Ukraine can become like the worst. And I think we're talking here from an American or NATO perspective, right? Um, from a world perspective, I think both of these things are good because it gets us out of the Thucydides trap. China rises faster by staying out of both of these conflicts. The United States falls faster by being in both of these conflicts. And China has a clear roadmap for taking over seven eighths of the world's economy. All of that is great. That makes the United States fall faster, China rise faster, and means there's much less of a chance of them sitting in an equal power scenario where each one thinks they can win. So from a world perspective, those geopolitical failures are not bad. They may even be necessary and inevitable. The way that the Ukraine situation becomes worse than the Israel situation, which is very bad, like when you're voting at the UN and you're only with Israel on every single vote, including whether food and water is a right, while you are currently starving a population that is one half children. I mean, it's the, the whole concept of a rules-based order ruled by any kind of justice is totally destroyed by what's going on now. Totally gone. And, and if you watch even five minutes of Jeffrey Sachs or John Mearsheimer or Scott Ritter or Douglas McGregor or Andrew Metropolitano or Glenn Greenwald or Chris Hedges or Abby Martin or Max Blumenthal or Matt Tabby or Katie Halper or Anna Kasparian or Xenk Uger or anybody with any credibility, Owen Jones, George Galloway, they will all tell you this. And if you get, watch the polls, you will see that an increasing number of Brits, Americans, and certainly of Canadians, Canada has already cut off arms to Israel and probably will start to consider kicking out the ambassador soon. It's catastrophic. The only way that the Ukraine situation can rise to that level of isolation and disaster and breach of allyship and of common values would be if France wakes up and realizes that it always did get along with Russia. And a France-Russia pact is the most stabilizing thing imaginable in Europe. That's what Napoleon knew and wanted way back. And it's what kept, what's what won World War I and World War II was the UK, France, and, and uh, Russia alliance. Now that Sweden and Finland are both in, in NATO, that looks like a win for NATO, but it isn't. It has cleared the last barrier 
to unifying a Europe-only defense that would only need to include Austria to really be complete. Austria will not break its treaty with Russia. It will not join NATO, but it would join an EU-only defense. And if they just kick out the United States and the UK and include Austria, they have everybody and Russia will set a stable border and not feel threatened. In fact, whatever's left of Ukraine could join that EU-only defense and no one would care because that European thing is not strong enough to go and attack Russia. It's not going to sit NATO bases full of Americans surrounded by Russian human shields on the Russian border, which was the crazy NATO plan. So if NATO just morphs into an EU-only defense, then that's a massive strategic final loss for the United States a huge gain for the world and a huge gain for Europe, which can restore the euro and maybe get itself into a, a position of brokerage. So that's my overly elaborate answer to it's only the third worst geopolitical era right now. But if the U.S. loses Europe over it, it'll become the second worst. And with later, we can return to the CHIPS Act and why I think that's more important disaster. Who's next, Crypto? Can, oh, I make a, 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 can I make can I make a reply to, to, to crypto's uh, point and then let someone else go? Um, I just wanted to say about one thing. Um, I think the only way that for for NATO to turn to, to transform into, you know, an EU, uh, EU, a Europe only defensive alliance um, that kicks out the Americans and the and the Brits would be through uh, like politically speaking, from my understanding of European politics, would be through an ascension of the far right in Europe. If there was a, the other parties in Europe and the, the the people that I that I speak to, and as far as my understanding is, the people who are on the left and on the center have no interest in kicking out the Americans. I think the only way it could happen is with the far right uh, victory. So that's the only point I wanted to make. Um, I, a very uh, brief counter back to that is I'm not disagreeing with you. But Trump has already kind of floated setting conditions that might make it possible for them to just say, OK, we're not doing that and just let NATO quietly dissolve. He's even said there are circumstances where he wouldn't come to other NATO countries. So it may be falling apart on its own. And I just wanted yeah. to make a note that Toby Stewart has consistently said that the real battle was between NATO and the EU and only one of them would survive at the end of this. And I think I'm agreeing with him. I think we're all agreeing this is a central and interesting possibility. Yeah, interesting to watch for sure. Who's mm -hmm. next? Um, if I, I don't know if it is Upgrade or me. I, I was going to answer Upgrade because he said something very interesting. And I have been listening to some of these people that believe in the catastrophic, uh, 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 catastrophic <laughs> event if Ukraine loses, although they already lost is that because they believe, they are afraid that the capitalist system that China has been in bringing up is so strong that the liberal democracies have no way, no potential to compete with it. And that's their problem. The Chinese outgame the West in their capital, capitalist game. So that, that's one of the critics. Now, I wanted to answer to Leo. Leo. A very typical sentence of Putin for a long time, from Lisbon to Vladivostok. You probably heard that many times. It was something he, he loved to say. And what he meant is that we could create an open market, all European, pan market, a pan European market, and that failed. But when did that dream really fail? I think it was in August 20, 2021. Because the Russians created a business, a business model based on the supply of energy and other commodities, but mostly gas, to Europe. And in, two, in August 2021, he realized that the Americans were really going to spoil the game. They were not interested in sharing the European market. They were there to expel the Russians from it. And it was clear in 2019, so some years before, even before the beginning of the pandemic, that the shift, the economical center of the world was shifting to Asia. And understanding that the Russians were going to be kicked out from that business model, business model 
of supplying energy to Europe and also understanding that something was going perhaps to happen in Ukraine, it was still not very clear. Their choice was easy. They are Asia. They choose Asia. So it, it's what's, it, it was not existential for them if they lose Europe. No, they are Asia. They choose Asia. And that is, that is pretty much it. So uh, I think it's a bit too late for that. I think, uh, going to Archimedes and crew, uh, I think it's a bit too late for that understanding in Europe. I think now we have to, we have to fell into the bottom to realize all those mistakes we made with this Ukrainian war. And in doing that, perhaps it's what they're saying, which is the fact that perhaps the euro needs to, 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 to fall because it's, it's probably going to fall on the end of this war. Uh, the amount of uh, debt that the Europeans and the fact that is uh, created and the fact that the Europeans are not being able to grow and they will not grow after the war, uh, that will create the problem or the, uh, the eventuality of the euro to, to fall down. So I think, and like you were saying, this battle between NATO and the European Union, you are very correct. And it is in the fall of perhaps of the euro that Europeans will realize how they were conned, how they were made fooled of. And perhaps then, after, after touching the bottom, they will realize that they need to reconstruct and do that, that you said. It makes sense. It makes completely sense. But as I said, we are very far away. It's too late. The hate is too much. We haven't agreed what kind of border we are going to have with the Russians. Yeah, and this is very important. And, and the Russians are already talking about the sanitary buffer zone. This is like terra nullis. Between Europe and there would between Europe and Russia, there would be like a terra null. This is crazy. And NATO doesn't realize that it needs something, a deal. That, but they won't. So that's I, I give you that. But I think the European Union might have to disappear, to grow, uh, to appear back. And and and, and Archimedes, it's not far right. This this fight is not really like the media plays it. It's not far right against the liberals. It's sovereignists, the sovereignists against the internationalists. This this this, this crazy European uh, aerocrats and. Yeah, and these people like uh, you, Archimedes, was saying before about this uh, ideology of internationalism, of we are the kings of the world, we are the aristocracy of the world, and yeah, all that shit. So uh, then, upgrade. Sorry if I took your place. It's fine, but I think Joey was first. So go, Joey, and then I go. Maybe I'll agree with Leo a bit in that uh, the West's biggest mistake or the United States' biggest mistake was not bringing in Russia to its fold against China. Okay, I'm not saying that China, uh, the West is justified in going after China. That one definitely is not valid. But in the West's eyes, the greatest challenge or the biggest threat is China because China is a peer power to the, to the United States. So what the United States would, would, should have done is to bring in the other power, the other major power, Russia, into its fold to now counter China. I definitely not have been successful. It's just that uh, Henry Kissinger game that he played in the 70s, in that he took advantage of the Sino-Soviet split to bring to bring China into to try to attempt to bring China into the Western fold with his ping pong with Nixon's ping pong diplomacy an eventual visit to China. So that's the, so that's what the United States should have done. And I think to some extent that, that is what Trump was trying to do. Of course, we know he wouldn't succeed because Russia and China are too close together. Nobody can bring, there's no way the United States can drive a wedge through those two countries. But in terms of the Western and I can say it's not justified for them to go after China or even Russia. But to me, yeah, that would be a big, that was, that was the biggest geopolitical mistake. In terms of Israel, yes. Israel is just dragging down the United States. I think the United States will just go down with Israel. The, the Israeli lobby is just too strong in the United States in a way that 
they're too strong to to create a wedge between the United States United States and Israel. Any, any politician who goes against Israel in the United States, you're not just you're not going to be voted in, and they know it. So I think they'll just go down with that ship. They'll they'll stick with Israel to the bitter end, which is a big big mistake. But I think they they just go down with that ship. Anyway, that's all. Maybe uh, Leo. Just I mean, I wanted to bring. Oh, sorry, some... upgrade, upgrade. Yeah, upgrade. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can go. Yeah. 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 So I think I have to uh, rephrase my uh, previous statements, um, especially about geopolitical mistakes. I think if we take the West as a whole, we shouldn't take the West as a whole. We should separate them. So I will separate Europe and the uh, United States. So I said already before about United States, the biggest mistake for me is to create your earth rival, right? To create the person who can actually defeat you militarily and pol uh, politically and economically. And the second part was the European part. So for me, uh, the biggest mistake was the same like um, the Americans with the Chinese was Europe and uh, Russia. The relationship is a perfect match. I already uh, said it many times. They have cheap energy. We have technology. If we actually would be together, we'll be a very big power um, in the world stage. And we could actually go against the Chinese uh, growing threat um, who is coming from Asia and is, starts to have tentacles everywhere in the world and uh, getting stronger and stronger by the day. And I think it's a big mistake to uh, push Russia uh, to China. It was a very big mistake. Uh, we shouldn't have done that. We should have thought about it before. And now we're in a big pickle because Europe, uh, like uh, Prada said, there's so much hate. Uh, there is no thinking anymore. There's just reactions to certain um, things. And there's no diplomacy anymore. There's no talking anymore. And that's, uh, I think, the biggest mistake um from our um leaderships in the past and uh, i think 20 30 years because without dialogue if you don't want to understand the other side or talk to the other side then it's always ended bad and um about the chips act i don't know if he's still here or he gone but uh, we cannot always criticize um western countries to outsource all the products and when they actually do something to build up their uh, industry to build up chips who are very important our days uh, especially when you see the taiwan china situation then you cannot say it's a, something bad if we actually try to produce our own stuff we had a big debate about in europe about the mask uh, and when, when the pandemic started and that all the masks came from china when they didn't have any mask anymore we didn't have any mask anymore why we cannot produce them here we could also produce them at a normal cost for people to buy and have actually some um, economy going on in our country. And I think we should come back to uh, producing more in Europe, because I'm Europe. And um, we should stop always hating about our things. OK, it's going to be more expensive, but you cannot always criticize our uh, Western countries if they try to produce by themselves something and then say, oh, it's too expensive. So either we we do a something and it gets a little bit more expensive and we live with it or we buy it from China, but then we have outsourced everything and we don't have to control over the market. So we need to think a little bit about what we want, actually, and not just always shout in the air for no reason. Um, maybe RL, yeah. Oh, sorry, Leo was first. Will... Sorry, sorry. No, no, oh. it's fine. It's just. Okay. Before so go. RL to goes, just uh, to just jump into what you just said, uh, upgrade. It will not just be a little bit more expensive. It will be hugely more expensive because it's not just the factory that we don't have anymore. It's also the raw materials needed to manufacture everything labor in the labor of course yeah yeah we don't have the factories we don't have the labor force especially the qualified labors and we don't have the raw materials needed for for production and uh, 
shell production, 155 millimeter shell production, is the perfect example of that mess. We don't have the factories, we don't have the qualified uh, workers, and we don't have the raw materials, whether for making shells or for making the, the gunpowder. We don't have. Go on, Leo, or upgrade, whatever. I mean, it's just like I, I wanted to bring another topic. So, RL, if you have something. No, I think I think I can read the laundry and quick to RL. So, yeah, and I, 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 just uh, real quick, just real quick. So, I, I understand what you mean. We don't have the resources, we don't have the labor force, and so on. But if we always bitch about that, we outsource everything. And then we actually try to produce something in our countries. Of course, there's going to be some sacrifice and there is going to be some problems to reignite all this thing. It's not takes one day and everything will be like in the 80s or in the 800 where we actually produce most of our stuff by ourselves. But at least have a, the, 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 the minimum which we should produce for our own consumption to produce it at least at home and then what is needed and what is the market going to play out uh, we can import it I, I mean after a while we cannot always shout that we don't have our own industry and when we actually want to build our own industry we say it's too expensive it's not worth it why we should do it then we already lost and we shouldn't do anything anymore just outsource everything and just I don't know. Then we are just slaves from the from from the other party because the other party can then say, "Okay, you don't have it. You need it desperately. We can just skyrocket the price, anyways." So, is it not smarter to actually build local, consume local, be a more a little bit uh, um, nationalistic, if you want to say so, about your products? Because Europe has, oh, of course, we don't have the resources for everything, but we can produce a couple of things here and there. And if we actually want it and we are European Union, we could help each other, right? And maybe sell it for a little bit less price so we can actually make our economy work. So I don't know what you think about this or maybe it's just boring talk what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I don't know, Prata, maybe, yeah. No, I think Archimedes wanted to talk uh, first and then I will Yeah, go. sure, but I uh, just briefly wanted to say a couple of points to build on that. I mean. Um, you know, the, the, of course, Europe, this idea of having Europe, independent Europe, that is not beholden to Russia, it's not beholden to the West, and it's also not colonial, you know, uh, it doesn't have access to the resources of Canada or Africa or Australia, uh, not directly anyway. That, that is a Europe that is, uh, doesn't seem to be able to be an actual superpower. It has a lot of population, certainly, but does it have a young population that can do the work that's required to be in uh to, to fight a, a giant war to to um uh to produce you know the next generation of uh of corporations and um and uh technologies right a young workforce that's able to uh, work in the factories and the farms and do what's required and build the things that are needed um in order to uh, achieve something quickly right i don't think europe has that um, Europe has to make a decision then because the colonial past is gone and th that's how things worked back then. All the resources of, uh, you know, Africa, South America, whatever went into Europe. Uh, Europe had a great deal of young people and, uh, very, very advanced people and who, who were, uh, the labor force for the factories. And then they sold everything to the rest of the world. Europe can't do that anymore. They don't have that advantage in population or labor force, um, or just education as they used to. Um, they're kind of trying in a hilariously uh, failed manner to um, to bring that labor force in, which is not going well. Um, they still haven't reached the numbers of non-whites in Europe that America's had for a very long time, and they're, they're leading to so many problems. So I don't think that's going to be a successful outcome for them. Um, it, so ultimately, Europe has to make a decision. Do they want to submit to the Russian Eurasian world system? Or do they want to submit to the Atlantic world system, right? That's the decision that has to make, be made. I think that there, there are some perks to the Atlantic world system, though. And one thing I'll, I'll say is uh, 
the concept of building a LNG facility in the far north of Canada uh, or the northeast of Canada is something that's been uh, spoken about a fair bit. I just want to mention that to people. Um, I think Polly Evera talked about it. The idea of building that LNG export facility there, building pipelines that go through the U.S. and Canada, connecting to there, it's going to make LNG export much cheaper. You know, that's the closest you can get to Europe. It's also the, uh, uh, it'll make the actual uh, condensing of the LNG much, uh, much faster uh, and much cheaper as well. So um, there are, I think, some things that the, the West could do as a combination of the U.S. and Europe to compete on this level. Um, but Europe certainly cannot do it by itself not a chance um yeah go ahead Prada. yeah or i think i think you see guys um the see we, the the human population has occupied the planet long ago but the first spots of civilization normally they pick up more or less isolated so there were places in the planet where they could produce and have everything they needed in that spot but as civilizations grew, they started realizing there were other spots of civilization started trading. And by trading, they grew even more. So trade is a very important element uh, on all societies, is a way that societies develop, sometimes do wars. It is true, but they developed a lot. And uh, we have many examples in history. Now, we have had something... Of, um, which is not new. International trade has existed for many, many uh, millennia almost, uh, more than sometimes people realize. But what we had since more or less the, the, the 80s is these explosions on contacts on the global scale that keeps evolving, it's not stopping, and it creates a lot of um, uh, unbalancings. It, perhaps because we are still trying to find the balance. And this conflict now is also about trying to find the balance. And if I agree with upgrade that we need to find the balance between our productive system, which means producing stuff, real wealth, materials, and agriculture, we also need to realize that other parts of the world will do it better than we do, or we'll be able to do them and we won't. And we are there to exchange, but for that it means I need. If I'm not going, to, if I'm going to be honest, I mean my community, I also have to produce something in order to trade for the other ones to want. And I think this should be very open. I think uh, it was Drew that came out and said, "Okay, the U.S. is making other, is buying stuff from other countries, is making other countries buying their bonds in order for them just to buy everything." And they don't produce anything. So he gave a kind of a very, very, uh, it's not so simple, but he gave this kind of example. I think what we need every, in every, it's not just the European Union. It's each country of the European Union, they need to realize they need to produce something. They need to offer something to the others that is exchangeable, that is tradable. And this will be an honest uh, trade around the world. The Africans also need to produce something. You see, if Europe industrialized, because we are very good we, we have this history and we have all this knowledge. If we industrialize again, we will take the possibility of Africans also to have their own industry. So we need to go a bit further. As I said, a balance between different types of production. One of them is producing goods, but also trade and, uh, and service. Uh, someone was writing tourism, and it is true. Europe has become more and more uh, dependent on tourism, I don't agree, but we have these beautiful cities. Everybody wants to come and watch. It is true. It's an exchangeable good that we have, and we shouldn't. It's not. It. it, it you see, I, I think it was you, or, or Archimedes, was saying. Well, actually, Europe is not so bad. We actually had a, a surplus, so we we shouldn't we shouldn't be so. Uh, uh, sorry, it was Drew. Uh, we shouldn't be so. Um, skeptical about us in Europe. What we are doing now, this is horrible. We are disindustrializing even more. But the imbalance inside of the European Union was there because the Germans in 2011 stole most of the industry inside of Europe. It picked up almost everything to them. So this also happened. So it's just, 
we talk about European Union, but there are also a lot of imbalances inside of uh, of. So I think each country, each community, needs to produce something, needs to realize it, needs to produce something to trade with someone else, and not using schemes to actually um, con the other ones. So this this is my point. Um, not to make traps to the other ones. <laughs> um, I don't know. Who do you guys want to talk? I didn't notice. Joe, Leo. Uh, okay. Go on, Joe. Vaughn also, I think, had yeah. something to say. Sorry. I just wanted to say, I feel like, Vaughn, you were, you were, I don't know if you were pointing at someone or you were flipping the bird, but you seem pretty uh, upset about up, something up here saying. <laughs> I just wanted to provoke you a little. Oh no! I was just saying. I was just saying hi to upgrade in our own special way. I mean, if I could, if I could lick his ear, I would lean over and lick his ear. I blame it all on that the earphone. The headphone really changed. For no one have changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. On this point of uh, increasing European productive capacity. This is something I've always wondered, and I raised it up in a previous discussion and also on one of our Telegram chats. Okay, for me, I see for for an economy, for you, for a country to become an economic powerhouse, a, a sustainable economic powerhouse, a, a major global power, you need to be able to mass produce consumer products and export them in mass all across the world. Yeah. How did the United States, let's even start, how did Britain become an industrial, how was Britain the leading economic power from the industrial revolution? It's because they produced mass consumable products. How did the United States become the global power, even though they had a lot of oil, natural resources, how did they become the global power? It's also mass production of, cons of consumables, especially electronics, in the first half of the 20th century. How is China, now leading part, the same story. Japan, same story. South Korea, same story. Now, Russia has been lacking in that, and that's something I brought up in a, in a prior discussion. Where are the Russian washing machines? Where are the Russian dishwashers? True, Russia is a big power, but the economy is not diversified. Exporting only oil and gas and heavy def defense industry can get you so far. Yeah, But to have a truly large, sustainable economy, you have to have you have to be able to mass produce and export high-end value-added products. And that's why I see normally uh, Russia is lacking. Maybe some comments on that. I mean, I would say, but in terms of not really, there, there is problem with production on such te techniques, but in terms of technological advancement i mean russia actually is kind of doing progress in that way and i'd say the main problem of russia is more of a that in terms of looking at china looking at india we don't have enough population and a lot of uh, working and we have uh, Maybe it will be hard to understand for some of you, but we have, uh, because of population problem, we have such problem as that each seventh man in Russia is uh, the driver, like as a work. And yeah, because of uh, such because russia is a pretty large country but there's a lot of other small issues upgrade one yeah just wanted to add something on what Brata said uh which i have to disagree germany didn't stole the production of any other countries they were just more competitive they had better products and that's why they also shipped more outside of the world. If you see all the cars, which everybody knows the brands of, I don't need to uh, name them. They're high value production and everybody wanted them in the entire world. And that's why they could export them. That's why they have also a big 
um, industry base. They're also strong in pharmaceutics and other um, factors or compartments of economy. And they, nobody stole anything uh, in the European Union. If you just, that's, how, that's the same saying that the United States is stealing uh, new technology who comes from the Silicon Valley. No, they just created there. And it's a good place to be created. And that's why it has also incentives. If your country is taxed like France, like hell, how do you support, how is it possible to create any competitive uh, company to compete in the world? No how. All the seats, they go away to other countries where it's cheaper for, uh, to pay less taxes, but they say they are French companies or they outsource uh, the factories, they close the factories in France and then they produce in Romania. I mean, we must be real here. There's no stealing in the in the in the economy. Maybe before, right? Before when there was colonial empire, I can agree. They stole the goods and then they shipped them into Europe and they produced goods. But our days, uh, I must disagree. This is just about competitiveness and how good your country manages to uh, to sell products and to um, to make believe that uh, they are good products. And uh, also had to agree with uh, Prada about the trade. Uh, trade is a big part, especially his country, Portugal. Uh, he should know about it. It's a, a very important uh, base from, from Europe, who started actually the colonial era a little bit. But production problem will always be a problem in each developed countries because people start to get more educated and Meanwhile, they don't want to do uh, labor jobs anymore because they paid less than actually other jobs, which are most likely with IT and more advanced technologies than, than to be in a factory to hammer steel or something like that. Um, who was first? Vaughn, I think, right? Go Vaughn. Uh, I'll let RL go because he probably wants to respond to what you're saying, and mine's not economic related. You know, Germany is perfectly the wrong example because Germany, instead of using its former colonies or colonizing Africa, decided to colonize Eastern Europe. Yes, most of the components of uh, German automakers were made in Eastern European countries. They vampirized Eastern European countries and their sheep labors. They used them at their advantage, which is a kind of colonialism. And they hugely used the advantage of the Euro, which for German economy is way undervalued while for the rest of the european countries especially the uh, uh, southern european countries the euro currency is way too much overvalued which has the which had the consequences of deindustrializing uh, uh, southern european countries like spain like italy and especially france because euro is way too expensive it has way too much value for those countries while for germany it's way undervalued for their high grade cars that's why germany was able to explain that's why germany was able to export its overpriced cars at not so overpriced value thanks to euro and what thanks to vampirizing of? Eastern European countries. And also, that was before, thanks to cheap energy coming from Russia. And all that is finito. And now you see the result. Go on, Bo. I, I was just going to say, uh, we haven't really talked about any of the battlefield stuff on Ukraine, so if everyone wants to finish up whatever they want to say about this, we could go on to that for a minute, or I can wait. It don't matter. I'm just... Yeah, just, just real quick to RL, I have to respond. 
I understand that, but that's that's logical. Everybody's doing that. That's not something who is special. Why why should Germany uh, be more less competitive because the uh, Italians or the Spanish cannot afford their cars? That's not their fault. That's the the government of Italy's fault. That's the government uh, government of Greeks' fault who didn't pay the year's taxes and we had to bail them out. That's the fault of the Spanish who relied on their gold and, and uh, after they took the gold everywhere away from all the, uh, the world and then they got fucked up. That's not the fault of Germany. Germany has the less debt than all of these countries. Look at the country's debt of all these countries you mentioned, the South countries. They live from the Northern countries. <laughs> Without European Union, these countries will be no, already no. fucked. It, 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 it was, it was, it it's was the consequences. Germans. Germans were the. It was the consequences of, hey, we have a, of Germany. We have an echo. Of Germany. Fucking mute yourself. Oh, oh. Okay, I don't know why nobody's reading the private chat, but get rid of the fucking echo, please. Thank you. Is is win is win. So I I I, I muted him. Yeah. I I have to disagree with you, uh, 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 you uh, I mean, it's off. it's thanks to Germany controlling the European Union. And they use but that tools to their Germany own was... advantage only, instead of, as Germany, you mentioned, European Germany countries should help World each War... other. That's bullshit. But RL, Germany after Second World War was kaput, destroyed, completely destroyed. How this country can control all the other countries, which are actually didn't have that much damage? Who had not been hated after the Second World War? Oh, who had not been very easy to wait, explain. Wait, 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 you need, very, you, you very need easy to explain. explain. You no, ask a you question. Mean, let me ask you. R RL, he was asking the question rhetorically. Could exactly. You just, like, could you just let exactly. him finish. You, you need to understand all the European part, the northern part. Most of the northern part pays for the southern part. That's not that's not deniable. If you see how much money we dump in the European Union for smaller countries, which should make their economy greater, is just reducing the biggest economies and destroying the biggest economies in Europe. Why? Because we need to share our tax money, the tax money of Germans, the tax money of French, the tax money of the UK before, to give to the smaller countries. And that's always been like this. That's why we're getting weaker. Because we start to share all the, the, the wealth around that, that is true that's the that's the economic you can check no you that's can not true you can anyway. check can, can uh, i give you can you check can you, i give you, you can check of that's not true that's not that's factually not true and you can check the numbers okay okay, okay. So okay. So look, look at what the southern countries have deindustrialized and look okay, at how RL, fast okay. Germany yeah, has we can grown. All together both, at the same time. I, I love both this. Guys, yeah. Both RL, guys are no, true. No, no, both guys come, are true. You'll but the out, so don't come, in. In. come on, we, we need to all talk at the same time. Come on, let's go. You need to listen to me. Let's, okay. say, let's say the example of the of Greece was in Europe. No, 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 no. no. Greece no, no, is not a good example. Stop talking, man. Stop talking. No, no, no. There's other people in front of me. Both guys are true. But the problem is what happened, and Portugal is a good example because Greece is not a good example at uh, what Greece is not a good example. No, uh, Greece is a unique example. Okay, Greece, okay. from what we were talking about, Greece is an exception. Oh, it's an so exception. We were, okay. talk, we were talking about something different, and you are mixing oh, up. You were talking about something different. You didn't listen what I was talking. You were outside, you come in, and then you I was listening all the time. I was the same. listening all the I time, and you started this conversation. Uh, and you started this conversation man. because you said, because of what I said, that Germany stole the industry of the other countries. And there is a process. So when P Portugal had a quite incipient industry, it started on the, on the end of the 60s. We produced very cheap products for the European Union, for EFTA and later for the European Union, textiles, all type of uh, utensils for home. We had, uh, we had assemblage uh, fabrics for uh, big uh, European enterprises. We had a lot of industries. The Portuguese were the most hardworking in Europe by working hours, okay? What happened in 2005? 2005, the Eastern Europeans came inside of Europe. 
with much, much cheaper labor. They paid even Portuguese enterprises to close their shoe, shoe uh, fabrics to go to uh, Romania, to go to Poland, you see? And they convinced the Portuguese that it was better for us to develop uh, industry in the, tr um, sorry, not industry, to develop uh, um, service, that we should develop service. Completely stupidity. Then we had 2008. In 2008, all European countries decided that the best way to supplant the crisis was to uh, go to the markets, pick up money, and inject in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the market. The German, industry, the German economy was horrible by this time. It was Schroeder with the Agenda 2000 that started the process of uh, um, restructurating the German economy. And era, what RL said is all true. The German products with the euro become cheaper. 2000 is also the, the year that the euro started. The mark was extremely overvaluated. The Germans had always problems with it. Yes, they were very industrialized, but they have a very, very expensive uh, loans. And their industry, their products were very expensive. They were not cute. The Germans had no sense of of of, of beauty. Those pro the problems, the, whatever the Germans did was very uh, uh, worked for long. Was uh, was very um, reliable. But it, it, for instance, it was not attractive at all. German cars were not attractive. But by two thousand seven, yes, sorry. Go to Italy, go to the north of Italy, whatever these, these factories were producing. It might not be the best technologically, but they were beautiful. The, the Italians had the most beautiful things. The French were incredibly practical. They Each of these countries had industries <coughs> that had, had potential to compete, com, co, continue to existing. But by, 2000, by 2011... Oh, upgrade. Uh, you are confusing uh, everything. By 2011, uh, and this uh, is when uh, the Germans uh, got, uh, uh, by 2011, the, the, Germans, the Germans managed with the economical crisis, yes, to pick up all the money they were investing <laughs> because they had too much surplus. And because they had too much surplus, they were investing in other countries. What they did in 2011 is that they pick up the money they had in other countries so this, no, 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 uh, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, the Italian, they were not living at the cost of the Europe, Northern Europeans. This was the solution to go, to go through the 2008 uh, crisis, that they went to the markets and pick up money. That was the decision by all Europeans and even the United States did this. By 2011, what the Amer uh, Germans did, they pick up all the money they invested in these countries, they took it out, most of these countries went bankrupt directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly, and the Germans invested in their own uh, in their own country again, because of the euro was making their uh, their uh, their products much cheaper, and they were able to concentrate most of the European industry in Germany, France, Italy, North Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Portugal already before they got completely disindustrialized. The cars in France were as good as in Germany. They were more practical. They were for everyday life. The Germans were for a whole life. They were much more expensive. They become cheaper than producing a Renault in, 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 uh, in, in France. They were horrible compared with the beauty that Italians were able to produce. The, the Italian cars were beautiful. They bought everything in Italy. They bought everything in, Italy, in, 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 in Germany. And the Germans concentrated. They bought fabrics in Portugal. They closed the fabrics and moved them to Eastern Europe, where they could produce the German products much cheaper or assembled them. So it's not such an easy thing to uh, upgrade. I know that you are in, in, in Switzerland, and it all looks beautiful. But the, 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 the Europe didn't start. The European Union didn't start in 2011. It started much long before, OK? So, and I think now it's time to go. Where is Vaughn? Vaughn, let's go to Ukraine. And I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to know. jump in here. Yeah. Guys, no, hold on. Doesn't melt, doesn't melt I just want to jump in here on the chat I was talking about. Like, just real quick. On for like five minutes, you, ten minutes on. Sorry, I have a dog who wants out again. But okay. what else is new? He's a dog. Um, 
two things. One, Northern Italy isn't Italian. My family, my dad was born in a town called Pordenone. You can look it up. It's Northern Italy, and I have zero Italian blood. Family lived in the area for thousands of years. We're more closely related genetically to the Welsh. Fun fact. Very good. Anyway, um, what I wanted to talk about, and the reason I dropped in, I spotted something really odd, and I thought I should bring it up. Did you guys notice the uh, targeting of the communications hub in Sevastopol? Where they uh, dropped a couple of cruise missiles through the roof of the building and uh, took out the uh, control yeah, systems? Yeah, do we want to just, just keep bouncing around between different topics? I mean, you want okay, to talk about the weather next? Maybe we can go to... I just want to jump okay, in here real that. quick. I mean, let's finish okay. the topic, shall we? And then move on. They, they hit this yeah. place. I, I just want to jump and in and the car thing that Prado was talking about before he left. Yeah, the reason it's unusual I just, I just is jump in here. Just, that the same building has been just, in the same, in that place for over 70 years. Why didn't Ukraine hit it before? They've been dropping cruise missiles into the uh, area. And taking out communications hub is generally one of the most important things you do. And the simple reason why they didn't take out the place earlier was it didn't matter. And when I say it didn't matter... The Russians weren't actually using it for a major communication sub. What they were using was the uh, A-50s for the communications. And it wasn't until the A-50s were taken out of the equation, at least for being able to cover as much of Ukraine as they could, that they had to re um, start using the uh, major communications uh, node, at which point it became a uh, proper target for an expensive cruise missile. That's my guess. I just wanted to bring that up. Anyway, I said I've got to walk the uh, guy. So um, have a good evening, folks. I was just I was just going to jump in here in this whole Europe thing that that um, the Prada was bringing up, and I hope you guys can hear me okay. I'm on my cell phone in the garage, so um, just working on cars over the last thirty plus years. German cars are quality cars. Spanish cars are shit. French cars are shit. They're garbage. They're thrown together as cheap as they can and shipped out. They're junk. German cars are quality cars. Japanese are quality cars. My 1991 Mitsubishi Pajero was a quality car. My 1999 Subaru WRX is a quality car. German cars are quality cars. French cars are crap. Spanish cars, Seat, had to be bailed out by Volkswagen Group. They had to buy it because it went bankrupt. And like, how much how much money did Europe throw throw into uh, like Citroen and Peugeot? Like they 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 sunk like tens of billions of euros into those companies to keep them afloat. So like this whole thing about how Germany stole the industry of like Southern Europe. Southern Europe never had any industry. They had exactly. like vines, and they had, they only wanted to work like you know like twenty five hours a week. So now they're paying the price for the fact that they're a bunch of lazy shits. So I so that's that's my that's my rant on that because I'm so sick of hearing people here coming on here and saying, oh, Germany this and Germany that. Germany the, the reason why Europe isn't completely collapsed is because there is a Germany. And the, the worst thing the European Union ever did was take in all these Eastern European countries. Like it was a bad move. Very bad move. But what it did was destroy the labor markets through all of Europe. What it did was it my my or my my brother-in-law worked as a boner. I don't know if you guys know what a boner is, but it, you work in an abattoir, and it's a skilled job where you basically disassemble an animal. And he got paid really good money for it. And then the Schengen Schengen zone opened up, so we had all these people flooding flooding our economy, coming from Poland or wherever, and they would be willing to work for nothing. And he lost his job. The company closed down. And you know where he had to go to find a job that paid half well? Germany. And he was in Germany for four years. So, like, I'm so sick of, of Spanish, Portuguese, Greeks, all these people that are sponges. And, and, and like, he's, oh, it's not beautiful. It's not beautiful. What, what say it car was beautiful? Italian cars are beautiful, but we all know Italian cars are terrible. Like, it's, you know, it's, they're, they're beautiful, but terrible. Like, so, 
That's yeah, why. That's, that's why it's all expensive. There's, there's my, there's my answer, there's my I mean, rant I mean, also. I mean, you, you you have a market for everybody. Of course, yeah. French cars are are crap, but that's why it are less expensive. And you have people who are ready to but buy it just expensive. because of the price. Not really less it expensive. has nothing to they're do not with really reliability or quality. And don't of say that fuck Spanish and Italians are just lazy people. That's are we all fucking that is false. Less good than French That's and fucking are false. Really that and when I and, and, really and, and, and when I crap on Germans, I'm not crapping on the German people. I'm crapping on their elite. No, that's the fact. It's of course, fact. Germans are making. Yeah. That's brand. true. That Germans are making best product, but you can't get that product. That's my point. You don't get. You can't get you that can product get at the price you are getting it. It's not you like can't that get that product, that high grade, high quality well, product at the price you are paying it. And if you well, can afford yeah. it, it's Mimi, because Germany, Germany had the control on Europe, on its <laughs> currency. And on its Germany politics for Europe. inside Europe. Germany paid for Europe. Germany paid this, for this Europe. is how you know. No, no, no. Germany, Germany didn't Europe pay anymore. for Europe. They already this didn't isn't pay for Europe. It's all, it's all, it's all, all the Europeans yeah. who paid for Germany. That's why you see uh, no, the decline didn't. of all it European up, countries, Russia, especially in the South, except for Germany. Okay, they are Germany vampirizing paid. European countries. That's the real fact. What you just not see writing. is the money. Oh, Germans are lending money to European countries. It's just fucking papers. The real, well, the real consequences is people in the in in many European countries are losing their industries, losing their jobs, and had to shift yeah. to service economy with the complicity of compete. all their politicians. Because they couldn't compete. Exactly. Yes, they can compete in cost. Exactly. You remove euro currency, they can compete by send, selling crap shit at very low cost. And having their own cost. market for it. Why for it's, German it's, cars, it's, it's only the high quality it's, stuff with people with a higher wage. And the fact that Germany can produce a, a Volkswagen Golf the same price as a Renault or a Peugeot 205 or 206 just tells you that Germany is cheating and have managed to destroy <laughs> all their, com their competitors. You have to understand that Europe oh European God. Union oh. is not a, a, a group of countries who decide to come together in friendship. That's bullshit. Melkor, isn't it true that's that bullshit. friendship is How can you explain to me that Germany, with the wage they have, which is higher than the rest of Europe, with the product they are building, which is of better quality? Productivity. No, they don't have they're, better they're, productivity they're, they're than others. Yeah. That's people that bullshit. The factory no, were that's more true. productive no. than the people in Spain who wanted yeah, to go even, and on. And all the plants no, 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 that's true. People would go out that's and that's stereotype. That's stereotype. Yeah, trust me, true. trust me. The, 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 the no, Spanish me, people me. are hard working people. Not I've never Germans been in Spain. I've worked with Spanish people. They're hard working guys. Yeah. I've worked I've with those hard working guys. They're good welders. They're hard working guys. And they have lower wage. They are not lazy people. That's bullshit. They know how to work and how to work hard. I'm not as good as Germans. An individual person, yeah, an individual person may not be lazy, lazy we, but as a culture, they are lazy. But the common they currency the doesn't help, right? Course. Even if there is a difference in productivity, which I think there certainly is, the fact that they aren't on their own currencies means that the currencies can't change in value relative to one another. So yeah, say it might be a shit car. But if Spain and Germany had different uh, had different uh, exchange rates, then a Seat would be worth a lot less to buy in Germany, and so it would become a budget car automatically. And it, it would be, you see what I'm saying? It would be, it would, it would, it would. Oh, the no, currency would adjust to the level of the productivity of the country. But the fact that there was the euro made that meant that the Seat has had to be sold in euros, just the same as a Volkswagen. You know that makes. Well, that's uh, why Britain never. Country. That's why we never went on the euro. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why Britain One of the never best things that never did. Never did. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's what happened. Said. Yeah, nobody. Anyway, Na it. Naomi's here. Yeah. I don't think she wants to talk about cars. I mean, we can talk about what we no. want to talk about. You know, 
but actually, Melkor, I did want to ask you about cars. If, if we're done with talking about Europe, I just have a quick question to build on. You said that, Fire let away. me see if I got this straight. German cars are good. Japanese cars are good. Italian, French, Spanish cars are bad. What's your take on American, Korean, and Chinese cars? Just to round out the set. Korean cars are Korean cars have got a lot better, You're but they right. still have some problems, like engine problems, lots of engine problems. Um, but quality for like interior and general drivetrain stuff is pretty good. Um, American cars, um, I I would never buy one myself, but that's just me. I just bought a Maserati, so you know, like that's I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> good shit, man. Have that's fun. Funny. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. so like I'm a glutton for punishment, but I'm not buying an American car. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what about Chinese? I gotta pull a transmission and, oh, and British this cars. Thing. I'm sure you think British cars are the best in the world. Oh, British cars are terrible. Oh. <laughs> they were really good after the Second World War, whenever uh, all the airplane factories and stuff moved over, like Bristol's, and you know those cars are beautiful cars because they were built using a lot of aircraft technology. But then once like British Leyland, like the Malays era, and whenever like the strikes were going on and all that stuff in Britain, the the cars were terrible, terrible. Anyway, I gotta go get something to eat, so. It's nice seeing all you guys. Have a good Bye. rest of the, the chat. Bye. See you later, man. See you now, Carl. So, so who won? I, I went to the toilet. Who won the argument? Doesn't, nobody won yet because I didn't finish my point. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think we have to disagree. No, come on, man. Uh, I, have, uh, I want just to add something. No, I, I just had to disagree with uh, Prata and RL here. I don't think we should uh, debate which has the better car. Obviously, both of all of countries can do good cars. But if you look at the market, if you look at statistics, if you look at data, it's clear that German cars are better and performing better and selling better everywhere around the world. There's no debate to have about that. And to always say that, Oh, if you if you if you do better, you stole it or you you don't marry it or the Germans were destroyed completely after Second World War. They build up everything, and to come back to oh uh, Germany is not contributing or is uh, or the other uh, the southern countries they don't uh, take money from the um, uh, northern countries or from the western countries, especially from West Europe. If you see the contribution by state, look at Germany. Look at UK before when they still was in France and so on. They give the most to all the other countries, which is normal because if you have new member members, then obviously you need to give them some uh, uh, incentives and a little bit of heading. But um, I, I don't understand why you always like it's it's competitivity. It's nothing like bad or something. It doesn't mean they are bad or or, or bad people or not productive i don't uh, agree with that they can be productive uh, of course but they're different they're different and the germans are good they're productive i work with them they're hardcore workers they yes, work they more. are but the problem was in 2011 until uh, 2011 the german economy was not doing very well and it is because of the euro crisis that actually they managed to uh develop a lot and in these last 10 years, they controlled a lot of the market. Um, yes, it is true that the French cars are not so good or the Spanish, but they are produced to be cheap and they have their own market and they still sell. But at that moment, the, the Germans were able to concentrate most of the cluster of machine. But you went to cars. I, I could go to so many other things because it's not, you see, the Germans are the Germans. They are very good. I work with Germans all, every day. They are extremely, uh, one of the best things about Germans, they are very disciplined. Um, discipline for them is very good, and which is very, it's great to work with people that have discipline that you can count on. So this is very important. But uh, other people have different qualities, which are also very, very, and so the, 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 that strange Brit that was saying that we were lazy, I don't know why he means lazy, because the Portuguese were actually, for a long time, the ones that were working more hours in all Europe for extremely long time. So, yeah, technological development is a thing. And the Germans manage, after they, they manage to, it's, it's not the Germans, the population is the elites, 
uh, that managed to con also making use of their power inside of the European Union because they do are the ones that pay more, that's true. And they decided to use that paying more, but they pay more because they have a bigger economy to make use of um, instruments of the European Union to punish the other Europeans in that way to do what I was saying, stealing uh, the industry of the other countries. And Merkel talked about that. She talked about industrial transference. Nobody understood what she meant back then, but it was after a few years, it was clear what she meant. The fact is that after 2011, Germany became the biggest industrial center of Europe. It was not that before. It was not that before. Many, uh, uh, okay, many other countries uh, still are rich, like France is still the second richest country in Europe, but they were much more industrial until 2011. They lost it. Why they lost it? Because they were lazy. This is the most stupid argument you could ever use. It's not that. It happened because of uh, conjecture measures implemented by the European Union. Money was much more difficult to, to come by. Investments were not there anymore. The Germans pick up their investments from other countries and brought it to their own country. That was what happened. And in doing that, they, all, they created an centrifugation, an attraction, and also the fact that we had the euro becoming cheaper for the Germans and more and too strong for the other Europeans, produced the fact that uh, uh, Germans could sell their products cheaper than they should be. Because they're, they're, but nevertheless, let's be what upgrade is true, but they use something that is not free market to achieve that. They concentrated some of the best um, development centers in Europe, amazingly. They have, even today, they, they have some of the best um, uh, research centers in Europe. But this is after 2011. Before that, it was not like that. And I'm sorry, upgrade. There are many things in the open market. That's why we have all these rules in Europe that uh, enables you not to use tech certain instruments in order to, um, to vitiate the market, in order to have more advantage than the other one. The thing is that the Germans had, and the, not just the Germans, also the Nordic ones, exactly the same, the same arguments, the, the Scandinavians, exactly the same argument. W using the euro, although many of the Scandinavians have no euro, but they have almost the same, they have parity, so it's pretty much the same like having euro. The thing is that they use a much cheaper coin for them. It's a, for them, it's a very weak coin, which helps their economy. But for the other ones in the South, they have a too much strong coin, which works against them. So this is the strange thing about the European Union that shouldn't exist. The other, uh, the other last thing is about having open markets with no no protection what, whatsoever. That's what we have in European Union. And in having that, what happens is that everything goes to the center because the center is the nearest point to all parts. True or, or, or wrong? This is a well-known effect. Everything goes to the centers. We see in any country, even sometimes they have very strange capitals positioned in the, the worst place ever, but that's the center. And everything congregates to the center. It's this attraction for capital, for, for uh, uh, work, for everything. So, but uh, let's, I think we, um, I, as I said, upright, I said you both were right, RL and you. And I tried to intervene in saying, it's like this. There is a time and space when things happen, which we have to differentiate it. And the Germans, because they are extremely disciplined and they're very well trained, they manage to take advantage of that strong coin, weak coin for them and make the best of it. But this is not true competitiveness. This was about a smart woman called Merkel that made that possible. So, <laughs> very smart woman, <laughs> the best German ever had, but that's my opinion. <laughs> Upgrade? Yeah, um, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. There's not all, all the things are done um, correctly, especially with the loaning of money, I understand that. But we cannot deny that some countries are more productive than others. And you mentioned your country, you said they're working the most hours, but 
you need it doesn't matter how many hours you work if you work five hours and you have productivity of hundreds and another works 100 hours but have a productivity of five then you know what i mean right it doesn't mean that they are lazy or that they're uh, not productive at all it's just there is a difference between countries and that's that's how it is right it depends on each country they are different my country was the the eastern europeans when they came in with yeah, exactly the same. same technology and a much yeah, lower yeah. way. And, exactly. and, and European policies about transferring industry to those countries because they wanted them to improve or faster. And we actually suffered a lot. Also, we, because we had these stupid politicians which believe that service like tourism compensates producing goods. But there is nothing and there is nothing that can substitute the production of goods. Everybody needs to have something physical to trade. I understand, but I, I think we should be more open uh, about competitiveness because if you say Germany is uh, uh, the industry of other countries, a little bit that the other countries lost it due to not being competitive enough, due to also uh, maybe being smaller countries, we should also acknowledge that, right? Because Germany, if Germany comes to the table or Slovakia comes to the table, it's not the same weight. And so we can go on with, let's say China, they also block all the technology from uh, abroad to come in their country to actually like Amazon, Google, YouTube, they block that, but they can outsource their things. So, you know, we all be a little bit protective about our our things, our country. It doesn't mean that they cheated. That's what I mean, right? The word well, cheated I, I, is I, a little I, bit yeah. of, for me, a little bit like, mm, I don't think it's cheated. It's just, it's the open market. You have, you're productive and you compete. And if you don't can't compete, you go under. And that does, that's I not see. a shame. It's life. I, that's everywhere the same. When you feel like you just to finish there just to finish there we are not in an open market inside european union that's bullshit we have rules that some government decide to apply the best example is the price of energy France has the lowest electricity production cost. And that's a fucking fact. Because main, most, the most electricity produced in France is nuclear. While Germany, mainly before the, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline explosion, produced its electricity on gas, which is three to four times more expensive per kilowatt of production. And the European Union, controlled by Germany again, decided to put a rule to standardize the price of energy. So the highest production cost of energy, which is gas, should be the standard for everybody. And French government decided to accept it. Yeah. Another thing, another thing I Why? think is very because of about European the, Union, because of European Union, that fucking yeah. ID. Another, another, good that example, fucking ID. another good example, Errol, are the regulations. Oh my fucking God, well, the God, European already. Union keeps introducing new regulations, and in that process, the big corporations negotiate on the corridors in Brussels the new regulations. When the regulations are approved, the big corporations already know and have been doing the back work, uh, the backstage work, adapting to the new regulations. In that period, the small companies are normally of less well-positioned countries in the in this uh, network of power this, 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 uh, the, the, the industry of these countries have to stop in the meanwhile the big corporations take out a bit of their can you block him thank you uh, can, uh, it, the big I'm corporations I'm take I'm out I'm the market position of no, the I heard the up already and when the smaller companies ca can finally come back to the market, they have a much harder time to get back to their market position, which they lost. So it, 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 it's done. Oh, come on, wait. 
It's not nice. Let's not make fun of it. He unmuted himself. It's not me. I muted him. Then he unmuted. Yeah, okay, war in Ukraine now. Okay, JS, JS, uh, have have instituted a subject change. <laughs> he was making on purpose. That's not nice. That's really rude. Okay. That's the only way to change the topic, guys. I'm sorry, man, but you were just killing me, man. Um, I think Vaughn, you'd like to say something about anything but this fucking bullshit. So please, please go. I mean, all this last was a good topic and everything, but I think some of that stuff could have just been handled in the voice chat privately, especially like whose workers are more lazy and shit. I mean, I feel like y'all kind of wasted time on that and whose car is better than who. I mean, personally, I live in America. I'd probably, if I had the money, I'd buy a German car first. A Honda second or a Toyota, you know. So, for what that's worth. But anyway, you know, there's been a lot of action in Ukraine. It didn't have anything to do with making cars and lazy Spanish people, I guess. There's a lot of Spanish mercenaries floating around in Ukraine. A lot of Brazilians. Colombia, I see. You know, I mean, you got the breakthrough around Turney. You've got all these little breakthroughs going on, which is probably because the Russians are pressuring constantly and probing, and then they find weak spots, and then they can exploit them if it's worth exploiting. Or you got to figure with all the units being stripped out for reinforcements to go north and down to Zaporizhzhia or around Adivka and Berdichi, maybe they're starting to find, like last year, towns or positions that are abandoned, so they're able to move up and take these spots because last year they were talking about how the Russians were probing around and they just stumbled into some of these small settlements along the Zaporizhia line that were previously occupied and everybody was gone. So they just reoccupied the settlement temporarily. Because, and at that time, that was when Bakhmut was going heavy and they were stripping out reinforcements from all those units. So maybe it's the same thing again. You know, they've got to keep a big force up in Kharkov. They've got to keep a big force down around Zaporizhzhia. And then they're trying to hold the line in the middle around Kupiansk and, you know, Bakhmut and Divka, Berdichi. So maybe it's just these little areas where these breakthroughs are going on or just areas where they've reduced the number of forces or pulled units out to put them somewhere else. And then you've got Bila Harifka being encircled. Turney's looks like it could have been captured, which... If that's the case, that cuts off a lot of guys in the Crimea forest. And they're also pushing southeast of Seversk. And if they can hit those little reservoirs down there, which they're on the high ground and their reservoirs are down there, they basically have a water barrier on the north and the south end of the Crimea. And there's a whole bunch of units caught in there behind the all those little tributaries of the Oscar River, which means they can't. You know, they can't get out by a road. There's no roads left. There's no bridges left. So you could basically be seeing the beginning of another area where there's going to be a lot of guys trapped and maybe another stupid fight to the death because it's going to be hard for them to get out of there. I do, you know, they wanna, I do think they will try to fall back, though, because the Ukrainians have been building uh, new defense well, positions. Like, we've seen that, right? You've seen the new. Yeah. And another thing, too, I don't know if these guys would stand and fight because you've got uh, a Chechen unit there, the Davidov. There's also, I think, an Azov battalion there, an International Legion there. And I can imagine those guys ain't going to stick around to get trapped. Whereas they'll leave the territorials and the other guys behind because there's like some security units, which are probably just police units that have been grabbed up. And then there's territorials, which, they'll, you know, they'll just leave them behind to die anyway. But I would imagine those elite units will bug out if they haven't already. I mean, I see them on the map, but who knows where they're really at. So uh, on the Telegram, uh, oh, sorry, on Twitter, I saw this headline. I think I'm not sure. I haven't verified it. Zelensky say he needed 25 patriots. Uh, I was thinking, have I got enough? 25, 25 patriot patriots systems or yeah, 20? I don't think it's not enough. Like see, I think I saw the word is systems, but I think it's not enough. I think yeah, you need 100. No, so, two, so you to really the other ones got destroyed, 
the Patriots. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, I, no, I, you I, cannot say that, you know. That means I, you're very pro-Russia. Yeah. I, I, there is a very interesting article on Politico about it. And the, um, the Ukrainians themselves are selling the idea that the Russians are breaking the lines. And they may really break the lines. And that after that, it will be like unstoppable. So Vaughn was telling about those areas where the Russians are being more active now. And the thing is that the Russians are even commenting that everything is too easy. They are not even, they don't even react anymore. Like they put their tanks through the, the, the woods, open, open fields, and the, the Ukrainians don't even have uh, drones to attack them sometimes a bit they are a bit surprised about this lack i think of no i mean i think another thing too one reason why you haven't seen the russians break out in some of these other areas i mean granted they're they're not big breakouts and they're not really about taking territory it's more about securing the position and killing off the unit or driving them away but i mean you got to figure there's tons of minefields everywhere or they suspect they're everywhere because you remember there's always been stories about how they just kind of indiscriminately fire the rocket deployed mines and the artillery deployed mines and stuff like that. Plus you have cluster sub munitions laying all over the place. So, you know, they might not be able to just drive fast because I mean, that's really all the Russian or the Ukrainians have right now to slow them down. If they're being chased or pushed out of an area, they just got to drop mines in, slow the Russians down so they can get away, you know, to another position or, you know, try to set up somewhere else. Well, it could, it could be that maybe the Ukrainians got a little bit of brains and finally decided they're not going to try to defend the indefensible positions. And they have been building more fortifications further west. So that's just my guess. I mean, I don't know. Right? But I mean, and I think a lot of the, the quote unquote advances by Russians is just occupying territories that have just kind of been, for the most part, abandoned by the Ukrainians. Yeah. What what the article and political gives the sense of is that the Ukrainians are tired and they lost the sense of what for they are doing it. It's like they have the feeling whatever they do it won't change the um, the course of what is like a, a fatality that the lines are going to be broken and that's it's just a question of time, which is interesting, this type of uh, attitude. No, That's why I'm saying that they lost a bit the sense of what is this war for for them, of course, uh, fighting for the democracy of the Westerners. Huh? Um, so the, the, the article goes on this fatality feeling that once the lines are broken, they can't stop them anymore. So this means also there is a kind of a very delu delusional, no, sorry, that the, 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 their moral is really low wow. and they don't trust, they don't trust on their generals and in their commanders to really be able to hold uh, these other lines that one was saying they might be, or it, GS was saying that they are building points behind more further did this, away. Did this article mention uh, any part of this article mention anything about how do they feel abandoned by the United States or Western countries for not? Uh, yeah, are they, are they blaming their, their 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 new sense of fatalism on lack of support from other countries, or is it? Yeah, yeah it's pretty much that. Yeah, pretty much that. And also, it's a kind of also goes with the the other um, statements of uh, of um, Zelensky saying that. If they don't get support immediately, they will have to um, to just cede territories to the Russians. But this was a kind of a blackmail that Zelensky did. So this article goes much further away because they go to the lines, they speak with the commanders and so on. Yeah, but it's that sense of uh, abandoning abandoned by the West, yes. Vaughn, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think like, I mean, we're already into April. I don't know what the weather's like over there, but, you know, if it's like here, I'm in a fairly humid, wet climate, so it's probably not like that. But, you know, they're in their end of winter, you know, rainy season. So you figure the rest of this month is, is drying out. Then you've got the end of Zelensky's term coming, I think, what, the following month. And, you know, you've got all these pushes, the pressure campaign, you know, the massive attack on all the reinforcements and everything like that. I mean, 
the summertime, I think, is really going to be where you're going to see the action. Because Putin's already in the clear. He's got his mandate for re-election. He's got more support garnered because of the terrorist attack. If it turns out Ukraine is involved in any way, shape, or form, that just puts another feather in his hat to fight how he wants. And as long as nothing goes bad and there's you know a bad day where you know a thousand Russians die, nobody's probably going to care. I mean, as long as the end goal is met at some point, you know, obviously within reason. You know, they're not going to wait ten years, but you know, I think by the end of the summer, you're going to see a lot of. Ukrainian territory as part of Russia in the same, as far as the central Donbass goes. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I still think Odessa and places like that, that's that's at the end when there's no one left to stop them and they can just cross a bridge and drive there. And, you know, maybe there's a random Nazi that shoots at them or something, but, <laughs> but you know, that's what I, I, I just figure, you know, they'll wait until it's that easy. I mean, why, why blow up the city and storm the beaches when you can wait six more months and probably just drive in when there's no resistance left and, and whoever's left is going to realize you know plus i mean it's a russian city i mean the population will turn against whoever's there anyway so i mean i just think this summer is going to be pretty interesting on the ground the thing is that the ukrainians created all these narrative on the counteroffensive. Any counter, the, the summer counteroffensive, the, the spring counteroffensive, always with the idea of going forward and getting everything back. Even in the illusion that they could get everything back, but always the idea they are going further. And now they finally are confronted with the situation where there is no preparation for a counteroffensive. There is no attack. They have to regroup and create defenses, and somehow this is um, its something they are not coping with it, and uh, probably is not going to help them also in creating good defenses. But it, but it might be all they can do, right? Like what, like you said, they, they, they can't go on the offensive, they don't have the ability. So well, I got a question for Wyatt, though, about um, do you think that the, the, the slowdown of munitions to Ukraine is a result of October 7th, or do you just think it's because they just don't have any more to give. I think they don't want to give. <laughs> it's it's more like you no, know, they they never meant to go to war with Russia. So you know, they 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 probably has even before the war they have really know how much they want to give. So now that the war did went really badly, like totally not how they expect how a war would happen. So. They are getting pressured, and the their narrative, you know, the rhetoric they give to the public has been overkill. They overdone it to the point where now they can't even pull it back. They can't even like say, "Oh, let's let's give up, let's stop the war." They can't because they already said Russia is the evil country that will con will start to invade into Europe. So now they are stuck in, in the no man's land. You know? left is wrong, right is wrong. That is the situation right now, and. And they don't have the production numbers to actually give more. If they give more, then what will happen is that it's not like they don't have. They have, like, you know, in the United States, there's still thousands of Abrams tanks sitting in the desert doing nothing. The problem is, as I explained on Twitter, those tanks is not useless. Those are strategic depth. You have those tanks, that's why nobody dares to invade the United States. Because they know that in, you know, within a year, within a year, United States can know grow this military by a hundred times bigger because you have those tanks sitting in the desert same thing for all the fighter jets that are sitting in the desert but if you give them all away then united states will be an empty shell then anyone can invade united states and united states can't do anything because they wouldn't have enough yeah, so europe is the same thing you know you I, i'm sure there's still a lot of cold war tanks and everything armored vehicles sitting in storage somewhere just like ukraine have you know ukraine basically regenerated a lot of its military uh beyond their wiki number uh, wikipedia numbers because they have all this uh reserve all these mothball armored vehicles from the cold war era um but you know if you spend them all now then you you'll be at the mercy of any invasion that's what i think so yeah i think europe is looking at 
a bit of the future. What if they, what, whatever they are bullshitting is true, that Russia was in, will invade into Western Europe and then they have nothing left to defend themselves. I mean, France, France, France announced that they can produce now up to 12 artillery system a month. Jesus. What is 12 artillery system a month? Russia produce more Lancet in a month than that, you know. <laughs> they can they have Lancet hunting for your artillery system all day around, you know. Then what is your 12? So yeah, it is I think Europe is come now, you know, trapped themselves with their own rhetoric. That's what I think. Brata, you want to say something? Oh no, oh, I, I said uh, oh okay, oh, Joey. Joey. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed with Russia because I had always assumed that attacking all of, throughout the whole front was a bit ambitious. I assumed it was just some shaping operation, but uh, I'm quite impressed. Seems the Ukrainians are really on the ropes. Though a few things, I don't know why still Krinky is there. Uh, they should have conquered it a long time ago. Uh, for me, the real test is Vule. As I've said before, uh, the Ukrainians humiliated Russia in Kuleta. They, they need to take it finally somewhere. But I've seen they're going up. It's called Novo Mikhailivka. So I'm guessing they'll... Because it's on top of Vuleda. So once they clear that, they might go down to to to, to Vuleda. Uh, I still thought that uh, going to start in Kharkov was a bit premature. My my assumption was that maybe they finish the entirety of the four blasts that they are next before now they start going into new oblasts. But uh, this this strategy of hitting the power stations in Kharkov so that there's I bet it's mostly the ethnic Ukrainians that are evacuating it seems to be a very good strategy. Though still, I still feel Ukrainians have some fighting spirit and, and Russia should not overextend it themselves. You've seen those armored spearheads. The one, the, was, it for it, was it like 30 tanks and 24 APVs that were struck? So Russia should not also overextend themselves because the Ukrainians sometimes punish Russia for making such bold, ambitious moves. I mean, that's the just Ukrainians are, are paying for their own mistakes and adventures. Um, understanding that they are in a very bad position to make all those attacks inside of Russia, uh, it might have not been the, the most intelligent way of um, trying to create an environment where they could, where they could find an agreement. And what they created was a situation where um, the Russians feel they, they have the reason for a revenge. It was all this destruction of uh, power plants, uh, energy structure, but also all types of uh, bombardments, uh, like in the center of Kiev, the building where the, SB, uh, the secret services are. But the, the Russians never tried to do that because it's a bit dangerous. You can hit a lot of civilians. But uh, what we see is that the Russians got much more, uh, can I say, adventurous in the way they do. They are really punishing the Ukrainians now more than ever. Well, they did that after the destruction, the first uh, destruction of the, Crim the Crimea Bridge or the Crash Bridge. Bridge. And you saw some vengeance on that on those bombardments that followed. But then they calmed down and now you are seeing a full bombardment of Ukraine almost every day, like what they're doing in uh, in Kharkiv. You see, Joe, imagine you have an idea that they are doing that in Kharkiv in order to later conquest the city. But imagine that they don't even care. They just did it for fun. It's pure punishment. I have the feeling it's pure punishment of the Ukrainians. Go on, Vaughn. Yeah, I was going to say, in, in relation to Kharkov, I mean, you've got to look at what the Russians are doing up there. I mean, you've got, you know, no one argues that there's a massive Russian force up there. The rumor is, the story is, the reports are that Ukraine has 30 brigades in the Kharkov region, you know, facing the Russians in case the Russians come across. Meanwhile, while these guys are stuck there, to the south, you have the Kupians city, that if they can break through there, even if they just capture the city, they've already created a wedge between, you know, 
the you know Kharkov in the south, like Lehman and all that, and they can you know push. I think it's to the Osco River fairly quickly, not too far, and then they've you know they're they might be thirty kilometers away from the outskirts of Kharkov, but now they're on the south side in a you know pincer movement, and then you've got you know a hundred and fifty thousand Russians just sitting on top, and the thing is, it's genius because everyone thinks that's where an offensive is going to be and maybe it is maybe it ain't but they can pin those guys there and every single day they can hit them which they have been doing with fabs and fpv drones and shape the battlefield for the eventual offensive or just make it look like they're going to move because they're prepping the battlefield like they did in this spot or that spot you know the ukrainians will be like oh this this must be where they're coming they hit these three you know points meanwhile those guys are stuck there facing a russian invasion that may or may not ever come and the only thing they can do is absorb hits maybe once in a while they can lash out at some russian drgs or something like that but they're basically stuck there and they just get pounded unless unless and the only time they'll get any kind of satisfaction is if the russians move and they really don't have to move anywhere on the north side of Kharkov. They could literally just sit there and let the guys in the south do all the work. And then eventually Kharkov could find itself, you know, in an even worse position. I mean, they've already talked about evacuating that area. And, you know, in the south, you have Zaporizhia. Now, I'm only going by that because that's what a lot of people say. Nobody really argues that there's a well, now you've got this rubber band stretch with the, probably the two biggest concentrations of forces on the farthest points of the map on the front. And then they're trying to cover all these gaps in the middle. I mean, I just think the table's set for a really big summer for the Russians in a lot of places. And the Ukrainians have really stuck their neck out and got themselves in some really bad spots by holding too long, fighting. You know, I hate to say it, fighting too hard, you know, instead of falling back and just giving up the terrain. Because you can see what happens when they stop and the Russians are close enough to target them. They just get pounded. And they, I mean, it's got to suck for those guys in the car. Let's just call it the Kharkov pocket. Because, I mean, literally, they cannot leave because they have to face the Russians that may come. But the Russians could just sit there and, you know, I mean, think about it. They don't even have to fly into the Ukrainian airspace to bomb them. They could probably literally take off. It probably takes longer to load up the bomb than it does to take off, launch the bomb, and fly back to base. I mean, they're that close. They don't have to come outside of their SAM defense. They don't have to be threatened by fighters or probably even Ukrainian air defense, really. I mean, it's a perfect situation for Russia. They can either push south or they can sit there and just grind those guys up. Hey, Naomi, we, we haven't heard from you. Give us a sit rep. Sorry. Okay. So, um, my not my stream yet. Uh, the, just, just to say one thing. The chat didn't about what phone just because said. he didn't appear. So, uh, I just want to show some of the super chats which I missed. It did totally, oh. totally didn't appear on my screen. Um. So so, uh, we have Logizen talking about like in the end nobody wins. Uh, Joe Party is viewed as a zero sum game. We are all lost. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we have Logizen again. I'm so sorry. You no, know, it didn't appear on my on my side and then uh what if ukraine is actually fooling everyone they have reserve ammo and reserve i'm quite sure they don't have it if they already sold it sold them all <laughs> yeah and, they've, and they've and never made a smart decision why would that one be done so so sorry i just want to you know interject this because uh yeah i, I totally missed it it didn't appear like by right it should like automatically you know they style it and then you know bookmarked it but like i didn't see it until just now i saw the uh fix the echo super chat I was like hey why it didn't appear so i refreshed my screen so sorry so sorry i think that for a second the attacks on bolgorod could have been trying to make a trap for the russians to make them rush into into kharkiv harkov yeah i was gonna um, i want to piggyback on you when you're done prada uh, and uh, the problem is that somewhere in time that opportunity was lost and now they are a bit scared uh, i think probably it was what uh, like Joe was saying the destruction of all electricity people running that might have spoiled the uh, the plans of uh, of the ukrainians 
but in the meantime, like the opportunity is a bit gone. They wasted most of what they had left to protect the the those broken lines in the Donbas. Uh, nevertheless, um, yes, uh, um, it it is told these last dates that Azov they send Azov a uh, militia a battalion to Kharkov. Go on, Von. Yeah, I was just saying uh, what Prada was saying. You know, like they might be trying to lure the Russians in, like they have some kind of surprise there. And I mean, earlier, like when we were speculating about where the M ones were. And I still think they're in this area. I, there's like a lot of woods in a big forestry on the south side of Kharkov. And I still think there's M1s hiding there. I mean, they obviously sent at least a company down towards Adivka because they've lost between four to six. So that's a platoon and a half. They had a battalion. So that's basically three companies. So you figure there's at least two companies still unaccounted for. And uh, if you go along with what Prada is saying, they, you know, there's limited approaches into Kharkov where the Russians could come down. So maybe they were trying to bait them in and maybe these other battalions, the M1s were sitting there on these approaches where they could have gotten a lot of kills on Russian vehicles moving into Ukraine or yeah, into Ukraine towards Kharkov. And, you know, because they didn't take the bait now, you know, maybe that time has passed. But I kind of agree with that because if we don't know where those other M1s are, and that would have been a pretty nasty surprise if they sent a bunch of columns down these roads and because the Ukrainians would be sitting on the high ground. They'd make sure they had places where they could take long shots with the M1 if it was possible. So if that's the case, that would have been. A, and think about it. They could hide that shit in the city easy. I mean, that stuff could have been there for months now and nobody would know it because, I mean, you could park an M1 in a decent sized two car garage. So, I mean. It's not like they got to drive around if they're not using them. They just park them and hide them, and when they need them, they pull them out. But, you know, obviously that didn't happen, or it hasn't happened. I don't think the Russians are going to take the bait. And also, real quick on the Belgrad thing, did you guys see the video of the, uh, I think it was a French soldier possibly, with a English, you know, ac speaking English with an accent or maybe speaking French, and then there was an English-speaking Merc, possibly American, in the Belgrad raid, and they were killed. And actually released it by his, uh, I guess, GoPro footage. The last shot is a round going off, and then he hits the ground. And I guess that little squad he was with got killed. Yeah, he sounded American. Yeah, he didn't. I mean, he spoke English, but he sounded American. He didn't sound like European English speaker or British or anything like that or Australian or anything. There was no accent like to me, to my ear as a foreign I, I don't think the Ukrainians made a mistake by attacking Belgorod because they are not in charge. Those who have decided that operation was NATO officers. It's NATO who are in charge who made a lot of mistakes, yeah. but they don't care because it's not their troops. Yeah. Well, also all Ukrainians are doing it, yeah, all, all Ukrainians are doing is to grab most people they can get and send them to front lines. That's all they do. Now, another thing too that might play into that is hiding the M1s up in Kharkov and trying to set up some kind of trap with them or saving them for some big blunt. You know, that's probably something more the Americans would be encouraging or you know doing than. Because the Ukrainians never do that anything smart. I mean, they don't ever use their assets properly. They don't, you know, protect them or, you know, I mean, just a quick aside with these M1s that keep getting hit. I mean, it's fucking bullshit. Like when I was trained, you know, obviously it was the Cold War era and post-Cold War era. So we didn't have drones everywhere. You know, maybe you had a Predator or, or a Global Hawk, but I'm not going to shoot at one of those with my loaders little 240 machine gun but one thing they trained us on is when we're driving down the road you know the command you know let's say we're not under fire like artillery or anybody's shooting at us well the commander would be up in his hatch looking forward or looking off to one side and usually you had your loader up in the loader hatch 
with the 240 machine gun rotated over the back and it's called air guard and you watch the sky because back then you had to worry about Russian attack helicopters and SU-25s. Well, now in Ukraine, you got to worry about that because the Russians have air superiority. And on top of that, you know they have shitloads of drones. And every time I see one of these M1s get hit by an FPV, these guys are driving down the road. They're, it doesn't appear they're scanning with the turret, even looking for anything. Like So they must be, feel like they're safe. You know, like that last one that was running down the road. I don't know if it was running away or going somewhere. But there's nobody up in the hatch. So this tank is driving down the road. And it gets tagged either in the back of the engine or maybe on the side. I'm sure it was disabled at some point. And it's like if you had a guy up in the hatch, I mean, we have smoke grenade launchers and we have a smoke generator. Now, granted, I could shoot at it with my machine gun and maybe get lucky. But the first thing I would do if I was the commander was yell to the driver to pop, you know, to drop smoke. And that instantly throws a huge smoke cloud up of diesel so that it would be harder to see from behind. Maybe the guy misses because all of a sudden there's a thing. Or you fire your smoke grenades off and drive through this cloud of white phosphorus that hides your image from the thermal imager. I mean, you might not get away from 20 drones coming after you, but you might be able to dodge the first two or three. And they don't do any of that. They don't use smoke. They don't pop smoke. They don't have air guards. And it's kind of just ridiculous. I mean, that's why if there was a little trap planned around Kharkov, it probably is NATO officers and stuff involved because the Ukrainians just don't seem to do any of the basic stuff. I mean, hell, if you were driving a fucking truck down the road, most trucks have a hatch where the guy can sit up there with a machine gun. The guy, the assistant driver would be sitting up in the hatch looking in the sky for an airplane or a helicopter or nowadays a fucking drone. But they, you never see them doing it. The only time you see people outside is when they're riding down the road on the top of a BTR right before they get blown off by the FPV drone. And they can't do nothing. I've seen guys dive off at the last minute. That must suck. You know, you're driving on top of a BTR doing 30 miles down the road and your only chance to survive is to dive off the side of it into the dirt head first. I guess it's better than getting blown up. But I mean, I'm just saying that on that particular note, I mean, you know, they're losing these vehicles because they're just not doing basic shit. I mean, any kind of vehicle that had a hatch, you would be up in the hatch looking for stuff. What happened to the Challenger tanks? Am I behind on the news? Because I only saw one disabled. What happened to the remainder that were sent? I've not seen them in the front lines being blown up. What happened to them? Are they being held in reserve? I, I couldn't hear you, Jay. Oh, you didn't hear? I was asking what happened to the Challenger tanks, the British Challenger tanks. Because I've think, seen the M1s, I mean, and we've seen the Leopard. Like you, you remember that giant ass explosion last year that looked like a nuke mm -hmm. went off, like down oh, in the Kaminsky south part of Ukraine. One. Yeah, Kaminsky a lot of something. people speculate that that might have been the ammo supply for the British for tanks, because after okay. that, you only saw yeah. those only two or three sandwich. that got right. destroyed down in Robotny area. And they've never been seen since. I mean, they could be keeping them in reserve. Maybe they finally got more ammo for them. But a lot of people speculate that their ammo supply got destroyed, so they had to pull them out. And plus, yeah. maybe they were embarrassed by the fact that I think they lost two. I mean, face it, they lost two challengers that they never even got to the battle line. They got taken out by shit well before the front. The M1 is the only tank that's made it to the front line and fought. The challenger never made it to the front line and fought. And the Leopard twos, they all died on the way too. I mean, let's be honest. The M1 is the one that saved the day at Berdici. Not no challenger, no damn leopard. And that only saved the day for what a week. Mm -hmm. But this was finally captured. The whole of it? I haven't watched the last seat seat trip. Well, can you hear me? Don't really need to to yes. You can let let you can let go. Get you can let go. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Because yeah, I can adjust your volume. All right, guys. I'm disappointed. How dare you make the Spanish people lazy? Come on. That title uh, belongs to the Montenegro. We ain't fucking talking about that. I know. I know. I'm all going off the subject for for one minute. If you let me, Montenegro have the title 
for the most lazy people. Let me read from the holy book of the Ten Commandments of the Montenegro people. The first one is, man is born tired and lives pressed. Okay, second one, love the bed as you love yourself. Rest during the day so you can sleep at night. Do not work, work kills. If you see someone resting, help them. Work as little as you can and give away as much work as you can to another. Uh, there is salvation in shade. Nobody died from resting. Work causes illness. Don't die young. If you feel the urge to work, sit down, wait, and it will pass. And the last one, number 10, <laughs> is if you see others eating and drinking, move closer. If you see them working, move away and do not disturb them. Okay? <laughs> Very good advice. I, I, I totally agree. No, no one dies when you rest, you know. No, nobody <laughs> rests to the point that they die. <laughs> and you know, going to war right. is bad for health. That's true. Uh, now let's get a little bit serious. I want to talk hey, about... Dan one. Daniel's here. Let's say hey to Daniel and his... I saw your wedding video. How to get married in Russia. No, man. I came on to look for John and he left. An asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still in Mexico or you are back in Russia? Yeah, I'm in Mexico, but I'm flying back in May and I couldn't be happier. Going back home, gonna... Hey, are, are you getting married in Mexico and then going back? Or are you getting married in Russia, if you don't mind me asking? I'll be getting married in Russia. Okay. It's going to be awesome. Oh, I Does it I count was... if you get married Everybody in Mexico to, to her? Yeah, well, uh, you, counts, you, if I get there here, it doesn't matter. But you probably needed a lot of documents. Everybody's to bring invited. With you. Damn, I wish yeah, I could yeah, come in my M1. I want to come in an M1 tank. You're not allowed. <laughs> look, brother, that, that's a, a very decision. weird looking. There's a very weird looking France flag behind you. I think is uh the orientation is wrong, and then the the arrangement of the colors are wrong. That's that French flag looks looks suspicious. <laughs> no, it's the right way. Uh, you're gonna have a. You should have a, like a cardboard cutout of Putin standing behind you. No, I'm not like that, Vaughn. I'm not trying to get arrested or be put on the list there's people on list on you're on one. Oh, I, i'm not trying to get you in trouble i thought it would be more of a like a nice thing i figure if, as long as you're nice to the putin cut out that's good you know like take picture with it <laughs> i didn't mean disrespect it's getting weird, man. Well, i mean i ain't trying to get you beaten <laughs> what was the conversations about today except for being lazy i really Oh. I don't know. They were bitching about cars and lazy cars. Spanish people and lazy French people and shitty cars or something. I don't know. I thought it was like the powertrain hour. Actually, yes. it was uh, Spanish lazy people. Yeah, they're oh, I just associated if, uh, a while ago over that conversation. Yeah, they're arguing if Germany made everybody poor or is everybody's just not not as hardworking as Germany, you know, then they I argue mean, for like they, one just blame hour the Germans. I mean they blame them for everything else, so why not? Just they just they move on. As long as they're not blaming the Jews. <gasps> oh, this is crazy. So do we uh, do we want to continue to talk about Ukraine? Or, or should I well, we, start we, a new topic? We, uh, we can no, we what about the uh, what about the strike on the uh, SU thirty four base? Does anyone have any more information on that? You mean uh, they, they, stroke, they stroke the paintings on the on the floor? Yeah, they, ISW have uh, have published their own report saying that there's no evidence that it happened. <laughs> ISW. They'll have to get those crews out there with their finger paints to repaint the planes again from the scorch marks. Well, like I said earlier, I would assume if they had an alert that there was an incoming strike, and once they figured out where it was, whatever bases were in that area would launch their planes and fly somewhere else just so they wouldn't be on the ground in case the drones made it or the missile or whatever. Well, so maybe that's really? why nothing got hit because they all left or they weren't even there to begin with. I mean, think about it. You know, they move that shit around because, you know, the Americans are like, hey, man, there's like five SU-34s and such and such. And then the Russians are probably like, yeah, these have been sitting here for five minutes. Let's go. I mean, really, they probably can't sit around at all. Right. right. You're, you got it wrong, Bob. 
the British intelligence, uh, brilliant like they always are, they discovered that the Russians have been playing, painting on the floor the airplanes. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And uh, the poor <clears throat> Ukrainians, they have been triggered. They have been, uh, they have been targeting paintings on the Oh no, it can't be true. Oh. I mean, I, I knew that I'd seen them do that and I knew they had been hit a few times, but I didn't think they were falling for it after like the first couple times, you know? Because <laughs> I mean, once they tell you, oh, here's a real one, here's the painted one, and you look at it, you can kind of tell and you figure they got the best satellites looking at it, and the Americans would be like, no, no, you're not shooting another storm shadow at the finger painting over there. <laughs> Shoot it at this one. This is a real one. But I don't know. I mean, they, <laughs> have they used any weapon systems smartly that they've ever gotten? I mean, yeah, once in a while they get nice hits on shit, but I mean, really. Well, all, the, those, all those storm shadows they could have been using to fuck up the Russian Russians in, uh, what's it? Tac, uh, what, what was that city south of Robotny? Tacom? But Tomas, the one that cannot save Tomas, destroyed the bridge with Tomas. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, I, why weren't they hitting the communications centers in Tomak and, you know, the artillery command centers in Tomak or the battalions of artillery shit? You know, they didn't do any. But it, let's let's be serious. The um, the use of IMRs on the bridge of uh, Herson was genius, and they were able yeah. to cut to, to cut the Russians, and that was mm. bad. And then mm. after that, they start making more like screenshots, mostly. It was very stupid the way they bombard that prison in Donetsk with the Heimers, killing their own uh, because they probably confused it. You see? So from that on, it was just stupidity, one after the other. Let I don't me ask, believe so these people are even in the fight. Let me ask this: I've been seeing, I've been seeing photos of like the Tu-95 bombers. On top of it, on top of these bombers, they have been putting tires. What is that all about? Is it to deflect radar? I saw some photos of some a while back. What was all that about? Tires on top of bombers. Did you see that? The, the first hey, thing man, I thought can you about. Turn up your volume, some or fix. A, I mean, you're real. You're like real light. Sorry. sorry. I mean, at least oh, to sorry. me. No. Okay. Yeah, I was asking. Some while back, we we'll see the wait, wait, wait. need to put. No, 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 no. Oh. That you, 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 you adjust back. Adjust back. Yo, you, you cannot do this. This. I'm too loud. Yes. Uh, yes, okay. yes. I, I adjust on my side. I adjust on my side. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. I was asking. Uh, uh. Sometime back, I, I used to see photos and videos of tires on top of bombers, like the Tu-95. Was that for deflecting radar? Or what was that all about? I guess people saw that. Can they were me? hoping the drones would bounce off. Bounce off? <laughs> yeah, did you all see the picture of the tank, this, uh, the T-72, with the coke cage? And then they put, uh, I think, two wooden pallets on top and then they mounted an entire electronic warfare suite on top and they had a diesel generator mounted to the back of the tur turret just to power the the ew and i mean it looks ridiculous but i'm thinking you know if you're driving down the road in a convoy of tanks or vehicles and that guy's got that thing rigged up and it's putting out let's say a little umbrella of protection over the convoy i mean i'd rather have that even if it looks ridiculous until they get something more figured out, which I'm sure they already are. It's just yeah, there's a bunch of stuff you do. I mean, and it's not like that guy's going to be driving across the field me to fight. Machines. He's probably just the guy that sits there and protects everybody with the EW. But I mean, I thought that was pretty funny because people would think it's ridiculous. To well, think, think of all the extra armor he has on top now too. He probably take like 12 hits from an FPV drone before he even get to the code cage. Then and then, then. Uh, oh, I was gonna say to the talking about the type of things so that we add on vehicles. Uh, my mom sent me on my on my second tour to Afghanistan. Sent me washing machines, Mexican washing machines, and we uh, 
made special carriers on the back of our Humvees and or not Humvees, Matt V's, so that we could carry the washing machines. Like we carried a bunch of shit. So I wouldn't be surprised if these tires were used by the troops for whatever reason, no matter what vehicle it's on. If it's mounted on a vehicle, uh, a soldier or an airman or a Marine or a sailor has an idea of what to use it for. Only they know exactly how to use it. We also had toilets hanging from the sides of the Matt V's. Uh, we had special compartments for uh, Spunkmeyer muffins, believe it or not. I had a stash for my tobacco. Uh, all these types of things we just add to our vehicles. And it's just basically a personalized uh, city. My, my first thought I when I saw I those through. photos, the yes, we hear you. The, the first thing I thought about is actually, you know, how how painful it is to carry all those tires up the up the up the plane. I, I'm not thinking about you no know, whether is it useful or not. You know how heavy is a tire, and then you have to carry like hundreds of them, you know, putting on the plane. It's it's like the most stupid thing to do because you, once you put it up, you still have to put carry it down. So yeah. it's like oh, yeah, what was that all about? What have to explain? You'll have to explain for the viewers who don't see what you guys were talking about in chat. About yeah. The oh, you guys what I was asking know. earlier. Is what I was asking uh, earlier. They were putting yeah. tires on top of bombers, like the T95. You see tires on the on the wings. Are and they the still doing it? They did it once. They're they're doing doing it. It. Yeah, they I mean, were doing I, it. I, I mean, I I haven't seen yeah. any new pictures of it, so I don't know. Mm. I mean, it might so, just be. Yeah, I think just wondering what what that what was that all about. Yeah. You know, with the deflection or what? <laughs> no sense. Maybe they're going to transport the tires with the plane. Maybe they just painted tires on there. You know, they weren't <laughs> even on there. I mean, it's a strategic bomber. It's not like it's got to be like camouflaged or anything. Make I mean, Western spies yeah. ask questions. Yeah, I mean, see, who cares if you paint the. That's a T1, T160. Yeah, I mean, if a T160 is pink, does it really matter? I mean, it's not like it's gonna fly over your house. Yeah, it is. It's a, one of those weird things. I mean, so, if I ever uh, see a one sixty where I live, I'll probably be like, "Damn, I better get the fuck out of town." Yeah. I mean, don't don't <laughs> underestimate the, the do, do it yourself by the Russians. Yeah, they came up with cope cage. Everybody was laughing at them, and now you see that. Uh, the Ukrainians yeah, are even is, cope cage. Even Israelis. The Israelis, even Israelis are putting cope yeah, cage on I mean, their tanks. The, yeah. I mean, it's okay, it's okay. the real stuff. I want to change topic. Because the horizontal uh, cope, yeah. cope cage is not new. They've been using cope cages hey, for I, I, I've got an idea. I mean, I'm just curious. Actually, it's a question. Is there, you know, how they have the cope cages welded on and mounted on there? Is there any way to electrify or power the cope cage to create, uh, like your make it your EW antenna, like a big giant, you know, like you know how it's got the big square on top and it's mesh? Could you have something hooked you to that have, that would turn it into you like have your an EW issue. antenna? You would have an issue with battery. truck battery. Like a bug oh, zapper. Yeah, have an issue. Like a bug zapper, right? Hey, that would be uh, even better. You know, the drone gets I mean, the thing on the side and pops. You will have an issue with electricity connectivity. Yeah. The cope That's cage will be electrified, but also the, the, the armor of the tank. And and you will just uh, kill the, the people who will just yeah, touch see, well, the yeah, tank. That's a horrible idea then, never mind. No, maybe exactly. you're thinking about like, the yeah, do that, do that. cage. You know the Fahrenheit cage, where the electricity is around you and doesn't kill you. So yeah, if you wake no, up, uh, Nikola Tesla, that you can make bring it him the back from part. dead. Well, let's bring Nikola Tesla back. He might invent something. Until then, we don't have nothing uh, efficient enough that can protect us from Tesla. RPGs and uh, from yeah, man. We'll just have uh, double well, well, shotguns and well, all. His, his grandfather, he's he moved to Croatia and Serbia over there. But yeah, he's Tesla from here. From Macedonia, but anyway, uh, bring him back and he might invent something. Otherwise, until then, we don't have nothing efficient uh, better than the cage uh, to protect from from what from drones and uh, RPGs. They don't work. So did you guys see that uh, tank? I think it was built by the some Siberian tankers that had like the camo netting over it. It had like a giant wedge over the top and. 
it didn't even, it looked more like a German mouse tank because they had taken these coke cages and built it all around it. They put camo netting on top of it. And it, it was ridiculous, but you know, I guess it worked because there was literally no way to get to the tank unless you like flew down the gun barrel. Cause it had even a, a thing in the front where I guess the commander could look out the front and the sights could see, but it was a real narrow slit in the cage. I mean, it was, it was completely unrealistic, but I guess they had a lot extra metal and a welder and some camo nets. So they went to town. So I, I, I feel like the Ukrainian topic is uh, running, running its course. I want to talk about a new topic. Uh, actually, it's one of the major news. It's actually Iran and Israel is going to war, or at least it seems like it. You know, there's a lot of uh, rumors. Right. I wouldn't say there are real reports. It's a lot of rumors of you know, the Uk uh, the Iranians deploying all their surface to air missile systems. They're talking about like thousands or hundreds of them. And then there's Israeli, you know, Israel talking about some you know, big shit. Also, it's, it's about fighting, hitting back at Iran if they go to war or what shit. What do you guys think? Are they going to go to war? Uh, Yvonne? I thought they uh, were in at war for a long time now. I, I don't I don't think Iran and them will go to war. I think Iran is justified to hit back if they want to, but at the same time, they probably don't want to bring any kind of extra heat on them or bring the United States in and take a chance of getting struck with you know some of our standoff stuff. Because I mean think about it. They don't need they don't want their nuclear shit fucked with they don't want their you know enrichment plants fucked with so i think they'll probably just use proxies against israel mm -hmm. around you know maybe around the world or at least locally because i mean it's easy enough for them to take shots at each other there i mean they killed some generals so you figure the iranians will probably try to kill a general or kill some soldiers or you know maybe they'll blow up an embassy some you know, nowhere country that no one thinks about. So it's easy, but I don't think they'll directly, I mean, cause if they were going to do something like that, then the time to have done it would have been October 7th when Hamas was at full strength and Hezbollah could have came in. Cause now you're, it's just going to be Iran against Israel and all its friends. And I, I just don't think, I mean, Israel might be a, get a lot of damage but i don't think it'll work out for iran so i think they'll just get even you know the old-fashioned way with proxies yes yeah at, if, i think iran is iran, already winning but if iran actually goes to war they actually gave united states the excuse to hit iran because the united states have been looking for an excuse to go to war with iran yeah. for a long time yeah. And yeah. if Iranian US war uh, happens, then Ukraine is doomed. <laughs> it's, Ukraine is gone. It's a gone. Hundred percent is gone. <laughs> because you know that is the real target. You know that is uh, something that US know that they can deal with. Russia is a bit too hard. You know this this game is a bit too difficult. You know they need to tune down the difficulty. You know to go to <laughs> well, play normal mode. You know, hard mode is a bit too hard. If you mm. think about it too, if Iran Iran's kicks out. Easy. The United States is going to have to use all those Air Force aircraft that they've been kind of shepherding for China. So China might actually be a beneficiary of it, too, because if we spend all our Air Force assets dealing with Iran, and obviously we would take losses and expend a bunch of inventory, and then you'd have the maintenance cycle and everything else. I mean, it might be years before the Air Force and Navy could recover what they may have they may lose over iran if they went in hard like that but i mean i i i i know the united states wants iran to do something stupid but at the same time i don't think iran and i'm sure russia and china are counseling them too like don't mm -hmm. take the bait you know there's other yeah, ways yeah, yeah. you can get even without getting caught i mean everyone's going to accuse i mean if a if an israeli steps off a curb tomorrow and gets run over they'll say it was iran so you might as well just lay low and wait and do something later instead of getting all you know instead of bringing the United States in on you. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I I agree. I, okay. No. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They'll do something small to probably use Hezbollah. But do you guys see what's going on in Syria right now? Like ISIS has really kicked up and they're taking over villages and trying to build a stronghold. And the what do they call them? these villagers who are not associating with any of the Islamist groups have surrounded, surrounded 
all of the um, the Kurds up in uh, Rojava. <laughs> so Hezbollah is going to have to withdraw a little bit from Israel to go handle all of that noise. They don't really have a choice. Nobody's been paying yes. attention to Syria lately. Uh, I, I, I don't for? see the link. I don't see the link between Hezbollah and Syria. And what happened in Syria? I mean, the Russians are there. You don't. You don't see a link between Hezbollah, Hezbollah and Syria. Killed the. I I I I don't see Hezbollah having to do something because Hezbollah something happened kick in ISIS Syria. Out of most of Syria. Exactly. Hezbollah uh, and I just heard the, Hezbollah I just and ISIS the report. Are and who does ISIS work for? It works for the Americans. But the I Americans. just heard a report that the Russian Air Force just bombed the ISIS uh, who went out of uh, Altan, uh, Altan Air uh, Base of the, uh, of the Americans. So the Russians are there. If Hezbollah, if Hezbollah is ISIS's enemy, who is ISIS's friend? United mm -hmm. States. Who do they work for? <laughs> oh. Oh, and Uncle Sam. They're Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, so I was like, no, they, are not, <laughs> they are not Muslim yeah. Brotherhood. ISIS is not Muslim Brotherhood. It's Al Qaeda. No. They're both Muslim yes. Brotherhood. Yeah, They're so it's like different branches. <laughs> no, it's not. ISIS are ISIS? killing Al Qaeda people because they mm. don't want any competition. While Hamas is Muslim Brotherhood, yes, they're all and, Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Uh, 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 no, they are not. ISIS is not Muslim Brotherhood. You are wrong on that. <sighs> ISIS is uh, because Muslim American. Brotherhood. They're both are Muslim controlled. Brotherhood. They just have different goals. One group is no, no, no. They are not Muslim Brotherhood. The other group M is, M Muslim is focused brotherhood. on uh, Western international uh, targets. That's that's what you think. But America's that's enemies. True. They, they hate America's enemies. Muslim Brotherhood are managed by Qatar and Turkey. It's very well known. Mm -hmm. They are the, the two bosses of uh, Muslim Brotherhood internationally. So it's, so it's ISIS. Exactly yes. like I, ISIS. I, 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 ISIS, uh, ISIS is not. ISIS was started by a Palestinian. ISIS was started by a Jordanian. Jordanian is officially no Jordanian are not as uh, uh, are not Palestinian they don't consider themselves as Palestinians Jordanians except the 80 percent of Palestinian refugees living in in Jordan yeah there are a lot of Palestinians in let's Jordan. call them but if, if, if you look at if but if you look at the former caliphate caliph of uh, Isis al-Baghdadi mm -hmm. he, he, he was in jail with all the former uh, Iraqi uh, high high command of Saddam Hussein in Abu Ghraib, and they were released by the Americans. Very interesting. Also, to see a picture of Al Baghdadi uh, uh, next let, to uh, John John McCain. We let yeah. we let Al Baghdadi go because he met the conditions for release and was reformed. And we give second chances. <laughs> so that's probably why. That's probably why we let him out. It wasn't like to go form a terrorist group yeah. for us, yeah. <laughs> anything like that. That's yeah, right. We believe in yeah. second chances. That's a cover story. <laughs> yeah, but Naomi is, is right. Uh, all of these are sort of brotherhoods. Even battalion Bata is a brata brother. Leon, it's a lion. So uh, brotherhood of lions. They're all sort of brotherhoods, and they, let's call them groups that they have a common goal or common purpose, and they work together in this uh, uh, achieving this uh, goal of theirs. Uh, I, I, is their goal I, I, I the thought... same? Yeah, so that's different. What makes them different groups? If their goal is the same, I, I, they're I, the same group. Did I hear wrong? Yeah, I hear I heard Prata and Pratahood. <laughs> Brata, Brata. <laughs> Muslim Brata <-hood. laughs> Wait, I want Naomi to clarify. What was that about the Kurds? There was something you said about the Kurds. The SDF, the Kurds they have them surrounded in Rojava right now. 
Who's they? The um, the tribal rebels, who actually, you know, the the SDF spokesperson, I think it was last year, said that it was nonsense that people kept calling them tribal John rebels Kirby. because they're they're I they're Al Qaeda rebranded pretty much, and they have okay. the they have the they SDF can't. surrounded right now. Is the are the Kurds like we know that Trump kind of abandoned them there, but they're also occupying like a third of Syria's oil field for mm. America. So, do the Kurds really have any good logistical support at this moment, or are they kind of orphaned? They're allied with Syria and Russia, so well, they've shifted sides. These Kurds they have shifted. Yeah. I would yeah. be surprised. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Well, they, their biggest ally is obviously Not yet. the Iraqi. We can't trust them shifty right. Kurds. Sure, but the they Kurds. had no choice. They really were an American ally for like 30 years, and then they were literally abandoned in the field. So they, they needed mm -hmm. somebody. That's but interesting. They were never though. they were they were never against Assad worst, though. Worst allies they, they were never against no, the Assad regime. They, they were for autonomy, not for knocking over correct. Assad. That's correct. They they were not part of mm. the organizations that were trying to overthrow um Assad there. The so Kurds biggest like biggest rival they is did attack Erdogan. Uh, Al Qaeda they and ISIS. Them. Yeah, they right. Right. Okay, no, that's that just the wanted Kurds, to get a list of the players, but why Kurds, do you think Hezbollah has a problem the with this? Kurds did attack government Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah government supports groups. the Syrian government. Yes, they do. And why does Syria, the Syrian government care about this whole situation? I'm oh, because the, the Kurds Syrian. are on their side. Yes, okay. the Kurds are on their side. They're helping to push back the Islamists, keep them contained in Idlib, but they're spreading out now. Okay? So the Kurds and the Syrian army have been trying to push them back and keep them contained. contained. But on one side, by Rojava, you've got the Al-Qaeda guys rebranded, and on the other side, you've got ISIS that have reemerged. There was so a that's theory. Hezbollah's made. That's Hezbollah's I mean, you, mean, you mean reactivated from? Yes, language. they've been they've been reactivated like now, big time, and Syria is having trouble keeping them back. So that's Hezbollah's going to have to Hezbollah is going to have to go in and and help them out. Because but here's Russia, an interesting question: Russia's which busy. Is, Russia's busy in Ukraine and Africa. Well, the, yeah, sure, but I mean, Russia can do a bunch of things at once, but. But my question about this is how it affects with respect to the whole Israel-Palestine struggle. <coughs> um, I have huh. thought for some time that the the weak point, the danger that makes this a larger war, is that Golan is legally part of Syria. Syria can move and take that back anytime it wants with any help it wants. The whole planet recognizes that. Even the United States has backed off from Trump's attempt to recognize it. So if Hezbollah and Syria and even the Russians and even the Iranians were all to move into Golan right now, um, the world really can't say anything about it. It's legally part of Syria and Israel would kind of be on its own and the U.S. would be really, really stuck and screwed. So what I'm wondering is, do these events you're talking about constitute a distraction to make a move on Golan less likely? Yes. And and um, to take the pressure, all those guys in Lebanon that are attacking northern Syria to move mm. them back into Syria, Syria and out of Lebanon. Because in Lebanon, they're a threat to obviously all those evacuated villages in northern Israel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So in other words, this is incredibly convenient for Israel that this is flaring up in Syria. And I think what the rest of the panel is trying to tell you is they believe that the United States and Israel run these groups. I have less of a strong opinion on it, but I think that's what Putin said, that ISIS never attacks anyone that's an enemy of America. And so this looks like proxy Putin groups. repeats my propaganda, man. Putin's always so repeating my a, propaganda, son of a bitch. Well, so I, is I, a possibility I, that because no, ISIS or Israel proxies. That, I believe they're United States proxies, but not Israeli proxies. Either one the way, though, that would be a very convenient thing, because we know right. the United States really fears an escalation, right. and it would the, reactivate the United States, proxies. Yeah, the United States may have done that. It's I, very I possible. Like it's very possible, especially I since, mean, you know, 
they've been taking um, the ISIS guys that were captured and held in those camps in Rojava. They've been escaping. And the rumor is that, that they've been retraining at Al Tanif with the U.S. forces. That makes a lot of ISIS sense. Guys. Because yeah, that was interesting to me that that with with the entire planet, you know, critical of Israel at the moment, it would have been a damn fine time for Putin to blame something on them. And he did not. He blamed the United States, which is a much harder mm -hmm. target. So it must be that they have intelligence saying exactly what you're saying, that ISIS is really run pretty much entirely as a U.S. agent now. And whether or not it started with Israel's help doesn't matter. The Americans have taken them over. And if they've lost the Kurds as their proxy to Syria and Russia, that creates a very dynamically weird situation. Now, I'm just suggesting this may not be in Israel's best interest to bring them out of Lebanon into Syria, because in effect, they are then closer to doing to Golan there. And that might actually put Golan at more risk. So it could be a distraction for now, but if it positions Hezbollah in Syria going, hey, Golan's right there, it's legally part of Syria, now's the time, and then it's super convenient for Iran, super convenient for Russia, that something yeah, I, big distraction like that happens. Yeah, I agree with you, but I don't think the United States has, has Israel's interests, um, best interests in mind. So, Have they ever well, had I, any I, allies' I, I, best interests in mind? I don't know if that's really fair to say because you have so many dual citizen Israeli politicians and, and, and lobbyists and stuff. So it may appear sometimes that we don't have their interests, but I would think their interests mirror, you know, yeah, because I mean, they've got to be willing to give up a little here and there, maybe what looks like a loss for Israel you know, for, for the big game, for the big players to stay in it and make, make their piece out of it. I mean, that influence is strong, Juan, but don't you read it as in, slipping? Two in a pod. They're, you know, if it wasn't for our money, they probably wouldn't exist or they'd be a lot worse off. Don't you read so, it you know, as slipping we though? They, we do what they want us it's, to do and yeah. they do what we want them to do. I mean, it's probably Israel, a very Israel actually relationship. Israel actually has more dual citizenships with Russia than they do the United States. That is true. Yeah. So the, yeah, and actually, yeah, it, given the tr level of trouble that is, in the Duma. how many of those guys given are the level of, in the Duma? Given the level of trouble that Israel is in, it may actually be time for it to strategically shift to a different security guarantor, just as the Amen. Kurds had to. Amen. Right. You see, like yep, this absolutely. is so scary. I see that for them. happening. I see that happening. I see that happening. And I say that before in previous yeah, open mic. People don't believe yeah. me. No, I, I did say no, Israel will swing twenty years ago any direction against a new to get a new big brother when the time is right. No, don't don't link Israel with United States too too tightly. It's always if you look at the history of Israel, they are always switching sides. And the they, Russia has even, always had excellent relations with all of the Arab countries and could calm things down much better than the United States could in some ways, just because yes. they historically have been totally on the Arab side, right? As the USSR. And also, they were also and, on Israel's side for a very long time until uh, until the Suez Canal crisis, you know, until Suez, they were up. initially thinking they would be allies. You're right. Until yeah. Suez. Yeah. Suez yeah. screws up everything. I don't think yep. the United States ever wanted to calm anything down. The United States never wanted to calm no. things down in the Middle East. That's the no. purpose of the relationship with Israel yeah. is to make sure nothing calms down. Exactly. So, exactly. So, to maintain so the other thing, the other the thing, region. yeah. So the other thing, you know, like before the Suez crisis happened, Israel had really good relations with the African nations. Okay. But then after the Suez crisis and they started, you know, Khrushchev threw Israel under the bus. Israel had no choice but to start allying with the West. Okay. They already um, and, they, and and they and they lost um they lost um trust with the African nations because oh now you're with the oppressors, etc., with the colonizers. But Israel well, has been working with a lot of the African nations lately, covertly, and it's starting to come out now in the, the African nations' fights against these Islamist insurgencies. So we've got a lot of Israeli weapons that are showing up in Sudan. Yeah, for example. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And a lot of people yes. forgotten that Israel was actually abandoned by the Europeans right at the beginning, you know, during yeah, the Arab-Israeli yeah. war. Mm-hmm. They yeah, had to fight quite alone. The British do not want to give them weapons. The Americans do not want to give them weapons. Yeah. They have to search for, you no know, uh, to buy but weapons. France. And then finally, they got Slovakia to sell, sell to them. And I also... No, that's, uh, that's not true. It is uh, true. Whatever but it is. France, so last, France gave them and Mirage, France. which allows, which allows the, the Israeli to, to make... A, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, 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 Czechoslovakia total, total gave them more than the French did. On, on, on Soviet mix of the Arabs. But, but you see, Don't France forget to in mention the early that. days. That was, that was way early days, earlier. Yeah. France in the early days have backbone. Uh, not like the France today. So it's a different. No France that time, like, we don't want, we don't, we don't want to join NATO, you know. The French, France, France was a powerful nation, you know, during those days. Uh, nowadays, not so much. And I also covered like the, the the Syrian situation. I think last year, so I kind of had some some understanding. Like ISIS only operates in the southern part of Syria, which is where the Americans have the influence. They have the military base around there. So so that's why you know I always relate uh, strongly between ISIS and United States because it makes no sense that they are operating very close to the United States. Because if you are so near to the United States, they should have wiped them wiped you out. But it's not the case. So wherever the ISIS attack is always in the south of Syria. Hezbollah is, uh, which is somewhat maybe backed by Iran, is trying to help Syria to deal with all these insurgencies. There are also a lot of random militant groups all around, and 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 also I also did cover that um, the Kurds or the SDF or the the, the SDF side of things, you no, know, the other side of the the Syrian rebellion, the they actually is working very closely with Syria. They are trying to negotiate a peace deal. Uh, the the north north. Eastern part of Syria actually is uh, available for the Syrian army to to, to protect because uh, they are worried about the Turkish. So that's why the Syrian army actually protects the northern border along with SDF in the, the northeastern side. The Americans are also there. So it's a very weird situation. The Americans are also trying to prevent Turkey from going in. Turkey have taken the northern entire northern strip of Syria and they are and Turkey is the one that is uh, supporting all the extremists and militant groups that is currently in the northwestern part of Syria. So, and some of these groups are also those re- the re- the rebellion that is you know back you know you have the white helmets and all these things which is was previously uh, maybe some kind of American thing that is now you know all in that area in the northeastern part. It's super random and crazy. It, you Russia is there trying to help to protect and keep the border there. The front line there, and then, but I believe that the ISIS, ISIS resurgence has something to do with the Ukraine war, because uh the they are trying to stretch Russia furthermore. So, and like 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 Naomi and um uh, Craig said talked about like if let's say the alliance or uh, this this SDF alliance is uh starting to drift away from the Americans, mm. then it makes sense to create the ISIS problem to stir up the problems in the south southern Syria, and uh. Yeah, and definitely trying to stretch Russia. You know, because if Syria, the Syria project fail for Russia, then it's going to look very bad for Russia. Because that means Russia, a, a real alliance between between Russia, you no, know, with Russia, is not usable. It's not. But useful. wait, uh, for a long time, Russia was balancing the influence of Iran in Syria. So for the Americans, that was like giving the Syrians even more power if they kick out or make russia looks bad in syria so actually it's like it's not a, a zero it's actually a bad game if they do go on that it's better to would, have yeah i would say that for e- if you look from e- a syrian wait, wait i'll give you rl after i finish i think serious perspective is that they don't want another enemy that's that's the whole point of them tol- tolerating the hezbollah actions or operations within syria I think that's purely because if they start another front line with Lebanon, there's no way they can actually ever get back their country. So they, they're dealing with the SDF first and the rebellion. And then they sort out the SDF already because they are now in peace talks and everything. I'm not sure when it gone. I haven't followed it quite some time. But they have a Turkey incursion that they are more worried about. They're not worried about Israel. Israel is actually super predictable because Israel only won Golan Heights. And Syria already lost the war for Golan Heights. They are not going to get it back. They know it. They are not going to try. Because if they try, it will be a bigger war, a bigger problem than Hezbollah. No. And and we have to remember the last war that they fought with Israel. Israel actually almost reached the uh, Damascus. 
they almost lost the entire country. So they are not going to try again, for sure. They know that they can't win a war against Israel. So it's, it's just a matter of now they're tolerating <clears throat> the Iranian presence and they are hoping that Russia's presence will make a difference and eventually they will eject everyone. Uh, with exception for Russia, because Russia will be the big brother to protect them. But for now, they can't even get rid of Turkey. So they are now in a very weird situation. That's how I look at it. Uh, who's next? Oh, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll. Yeah, about the distraction thingy, which will make Hezbollah send troops there. I don't buy that. Yeah, Russia is stretched, but uh, they are more involved in Syria than in Africa. Because in Africa, the Russian prisons are mainly PMCs, mercenaries, if you prefer. Yeah, while they, in because Syria, they didn't have the officer. Yeah, and while in Syria, it's, it's the Russian army with PMCs, but it's the Russian army which is there and which has two bases, official bases, no problem. Mostly Air Force. Yes, one Russian airport Air, and one Iranian one, one uh, uh, seaport in Tartus. So no, that's bullshit. Hezbollah will not be involved, and especially where ISIS is, which is uh, close to the American base, very far from where is Lebanon. No, Hezbollah will be in, in directly involved in Syria if Damascus is in danger. Different Hezbollah. There's more than one Hezbollah, really. The Lebanese Hezbollah. Oh, I, I, I'm the... talking about I'm talking about Lebanese Hezbollah because that's <clears throat> the one which is directly involved against Israel. Of course, you have the Kataib Hezbollah from Iraq, but uh, I, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the Lebanese Hezbollah, and I think that's what Naomi was talking about, also. I doubt the Lebanese are going to Syria, but the other Hezbollah groups might, right? Um, From Iran, essentially. Why? Funded by Iran, organized by Iran. Yeah, I was going to say in relation to the whole distraction in Syria or, or try, thinking you're going to stretch out Russia. I mean, there's a story about how the Russians have like 150 SU-34s in reserve that haven't even been used in the SMO and they've only used about 50, you know, maybe that doesn't include the losses they have, whatever number that is. But I mean, realistically, the idea that you think you're going to stretch Russia and Syria is ridiculous because, you know, you can send a brigade of Russian mechanized infantry down there. You could pull a few battalions of Wagners out from wherever volunteer units from wherever that aren't even being used in Ukraine. You could pull vehicles from wherever. I mean, they could send down, you know, four SU-34s, four Heinz. They don't really need any fighters because, you know, there's no air threat like that unless they want some fighters down there to keep the uh, Israelis and Americans honest. So, you know, four SU-35, you know, SU-27s, four SU-34s, four Heinz, a battalion of Russian forces and a couple of battalions of Wagners. And, right, well, you know. That's not so good. They can stretch them a little Russia. bit in Syria, a Man little power. bit, a little bit in Kazakhstan, a little bit in Tajikistan, a little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, the Syria Russians the already have place. a manpower advantage in the hundreds of thousands, re realistically, because they've been building up. I mean, by the, I think by the end of 2024, the word they use to describe the Russian land forces is monolithic as far as the numbers that they're bringing to bear on the field. I think by the end of 2025, at the current rate of training and production, this is just projections, the Russians can put one complete combat division on the field per month if they continue on this current pace. So the idea that, you know, I mean, they're already well ahead. I mean, they have literally... 25 to 35,000 volunteers a month, plus their conscripts, plus their contracts. I mean, they already have a massive manpower advantage, so I don't think you could really stretch them, even if you got a few places fired up, because, you know, they'll back up the local forces, and they're, they're Russians. It's not like they're going to sit there and worry about human rights and Geneva Conventions if they're putting down insurgencies. Oh, yeah. But that's I mean, they have to look what they did to those guys that attacked uh, yeah. the, the music hall. They I think consider them uncivilized and not not 
and they're treated outside the normal, you know, court of law, so to speak. So but they could fight the war the same way in these little the places. The political dimension of the war crimes of Israel are is going to fall into Israel sooner or later. And this is, a, this is something that uh, neither the U.S. nor Israel are really counting how how problematic that can be. So there will be there is an, on the ninth, so ne next week, on Monday, there will be the first hearings of Nicaragua accusing uh, Germany to be complicit on genocide. And you see the problem. It it will be of course a bit of a circus, but there are more countries going to the uh, International Court of Churches to accuse some other countries of being complicit with genocide. <laughs> I mean, okay, we, we see the, the actors, and they are very important, they're very strong, but the rest of the world also participates directly or indirectly, and that's where I think this component will fall over Israel as well. So it's not if the game if the game of the United States sounds clear is going to get very unclear if things developed in terms of international coalitions against Israel, like a whole uh, uh, um, a complete embargo or things like that, or even punishing punishing countries that are supporting Israel on this uh, conflict. Uh, sorry, it's just going through Vaughn saying about war crimes. I know I was talking about Israel, not Russian ones. Uh, Naomi, sorry, you can go back. Naomi, I mean, I don't think, any, I don't think anything will come of it, just like the last time, you know? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's not going to be a war between Israel and Iran, especially because of what's going on in Syria. Iran is going to need to focus on that, so... That's all I was saying. And I don't think Iran wants a war with anybody. That's the other thing. There's not going to be a war yeah. because Iran doesn't want it. Israel needs to try to start one because it needs to do something. It needs to get the United States to come and bomb the Middle East to smithereens so that people forget about Israel for a while. But we'll see if that works. But and why else is Israel blowing up embassies of all things? It's an amazing thing to do. No, is, have we mentioned the embassy thing? Amazing thing to do to blow up a consulate like that. Just absolutely amazing. So they it want something. I mean, that wasn't just for fun. They, it, they're trying to make it, something. It wasn't a consulate. It was a building next to Whatever the it was. It wasn't a consulate. Uh, okay. Oh, then it's okay. okay. No, no. Oh, that's, okay. that's the then Israeli no explanation. But it's well, it's, face saving. It, it, it's, it, it's the real, real thing simple. is, was, was the, the building consulate. was the building on the embassy property proper? If it was on I embassy property, a lot property, of Israelis then believe that. That. That, that, that that would be uh, it'd be like you know the United States. If we had a, a shed on our proper on our embassy and it got blown up, we would consider that as you know an attack. It would. So I mean, if it was on embassy property, you know. Yeah. It, they did something wrong uh, you know they did something uh, amazing thing to do. Uh, uh, and the I mean, proof that they hit a Pol Pot the didn't do that. of iran Pol Pot never did and the that. proof of it hitler didn't do that it is that uh, israeli israeli no are, are, are never did expecting that. please please the proof that it was uh, the uh, the consulate of iran proper is that no, the Israelis are expecting to receive some missiles on their yes. head yeah. from yeah, Iran. Exactly, that's what Marwin said. They are all shitting in their pants. They did something extraordinary. They are shitting, they are no, shitting in their pants. Who? They are shitting, shitting in their, in their pants right Who? now. Who? The Israel. 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 It's interesting. It's interesting. It's it's interesting. interesting. Crazy thing to do. They How ideological so you guys get over this country. You guys are supposed to be realists. What's my ideology? Which ideology am I getting? Who's saying that? <laughs> I can't tell who's talking. Marlon Rando has no particular ideology. What Marlin said is that the Israelis did some for, something formidable. 
they bombed that building in south, inside of a, a, a consulate, in embassy compound. They wanted something really big. And when RL says they are shitting, no, they knew what they were doing. They mm. knew the consequences of what they were doing. This is in terms of international common uh, international dealing something unacceptable unacceptable whatsoever it's it's not just the, it's it's the it's they they attack two countries at the same time they attack uh, iran because it was their embassy and at the same time they attack syria and they did something huge something that most countries would get really crazy if you guys remember when the um, the iranians attacked the saudi arabia embassy in tehran uh, protesters. The whole world was behind Saudi Arabia. How could Iran let the protesters do something like this? This is something unacceptable whatsoever. Go on, Mike Naobi. You don't agree? Naobi, you don't agree? Upgrade, upgrade. Upgrade, Israel upgrade. Has, yeah, that's something. I'm going to say this real quick and then I'm going to pass the mic to upgrade. Israel, since its birth, has had their 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 self defense policy can be summed up as fuck around and fuck find out. Okay, so Jewish reprisals so are Hitler, right? Hitler this had the is same their policy. this is their deterrence. This is their this is their method of deterrence because they are a small country and they need to walk around with big balls. So that's why they did it. And technically, they're gonna find out. The other, the other thing that the other thing is, they don't, they don't deal with this proxy nonsense. Okay, so when, when you had um, militants attacking Israel from Jordanian soil, they attacked Jordan. Okay, that started the Six Day War. So you have Iran arming um, militants that are attacking Israel. So that's why they attacked. That's why they they attacked that general. That general was coordinating weapons shipments to Hezbollah who were attacking Israel from Lebanon. That's why they did it. And technically, it wasn't the embassy. It was a building next to it. You've got one building, which is the Iranian the Iranian embassy. I know another I know building, why and Jeffrey then the Dahmer Canadian embassy. People, right? And they rented that mil building in the middle was a private building that rented its bottom floors to the Iranian embassy. So. That's why, yeah. Uh, that doesn't, you know, Anyways, I know why Nicole, Jeffrey Dahmer ahead, killed and ate those people. Like, knowing why isn't everything. I mean, That's my thing is it just sets a dangerous precedent because everybody's pretty much always respected with the exception of certain events, diplomatic, you know, immunity and sovereign territory and the, the, the place of the embassy. So, you know, it's not just you know, whatever their excuse is, it's like you, you put everyone else's in, diplomats in danger because now you've created a situation where, well, was some, someone else? Well, and what if the Armenians or the Azerbaijani? Oh, well, you hey. know, they killed their diplomat. We can kill theirs. I, you know, I'm just I saying that it. I, it, it's something that's not normally done. It's not acceptable to 99% of the world. But, but actually, it's not acceptable it was done. It's just but actually, really right. But actually, that is Israel's policy all the time. It has always been like this. Israel has always struck into other countries as long as it's a threat. So, and and this is what Israel is trying to tell the world and tell the regional, the neighbors, that as long as you de develop a threat that threatens the national security and interest of Israel, Israel will attack you regardless of whatever you think. Yeah, well, what so happens when Israel, they Israel or Iran adopts the same policy? But that's terrorism. Yeah, you, they can. That's but just they can. terrorism. I mean, and it can only do it because the United States it. stands guard. It's pure terrorism. But mm. that is, but United States did as, do, does exactly the same thing. So no, the, it's the same policy. Mm. It's <clears> just that Israel, United States is a, is a superpower. You, Israel adopts the same thing. It's called a preemptive strike. You can call it illegal or legal, depends on what you think. You no, know, to the Israeli, this is legitimate. Like they strike the nuclear facility in Syria when you no know, Syria was still whole and they are develop developing the nuclear program. Israel see it, see it as a threat, they wipe it out. So and then that basically you no know, destroy the entire nuclear ambition of Syria. They always been doing that all the time. They have never changed. That's this why, is actually just an extension of what they have always been doing. So to say that suddenly Israel is not 
No, I'm that's not, why I'm we're not, seeing the rise of the multipolar in world. In regards to embassies, this is a little bit different. I mean, generally, no one hits embassies. NATO, NATO, yeah, NATO, NATO hit the embassy as well. So <laughs> that, that's why we are seeing that rise of the multipolar world. The rest of the world are fed up with that supremacist ideology. Which is what and I always say, right? Multipolar world. And that double standard of the West and of the Zionist. The yeah, rest so of the world Zion are fed up with that supremacist stand and that, how to say, higher moral ground because we are, I don't know, the chosen one. Yeah, so, so like I always say, multipolar <laughs> world will create more wars because... Um, Everybody have their own agency. Upgrade. Yeah. Uh, I have to disagree a little bit with uh, you, Wyatt, and Naomi, because we always had this uh, feeling that embassies are not to be touched because there is diplomacy is created there, and we actually talk to each other through these uh, channels. So I could understand the feeling and the uh, the logic behind the israelis like yeah they they activate their proxy and that's why we can hit but that's not an excuse you you, you don't hit diplomatic places just and even if it's next to the building i mean each country if they would be striked on embassy they will react harshly to it because they have the right it's a, it's, it's soil from each country and if you attack they have a legitimate point to counterattack. And Israel can then say, okay, we, we, we have big balls, like you say, Naomi, but that's not, that's not an excuse. You just shoot to a diplomatic I place don't where actually is diplomatic uh, uh, things going on. And even if they are not on your side, it doesn't mean you need to strike there, strike other places, but not embassy. I've, I mean, where are we going? We, we stop to talk to each other, and that's why this war starts, because of this bullshit. That's not that's I not legitimate. Just... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I I I, I agree with you with some points. It was reckless on purpose. This. Yeah, and they do it on purpose because they know that they will get a reaction or they want a reaction. And that's very, very dangerous. If we play this field, like Vaughn said, then everybody can strike everybody's embassy because they're not uh, uh they're not agreeing with the other part. Then Russia can uh, uh, shoot the French embassy because uh, they, they they said something that they will put troops in Ukraine. I mean, where are we going here? It's it's really dangerous. What's what's going on here? Just, I, I, I don't I don't disagree with you about about embassies. I disagree that it should be considered part of the embassy. That's the part where where we are in, we are in disagreement. Oh. That's, no, that's I mean, Israeli that, that, damage control so propaganda. Would be terrible, Nothing else. Uh, you know, that's as as Israeli terrible, damage control bullshit. propaganda. Bullshit. Nothing as else. As far as, as, far as we know, just that happen. argument was just used by Israel, and that was it. Nobody, no other country dared to put that in question. There were many countries that actually condemned officially the bombardment. And obviously, the amount of countries were not very, not many, because uh, the United States decided to create a kind of uh, limbo, not knowing exactly who bombarded in the first days the, the embassy, in order to give time so that not all Western countries had to react to it. But there are enough countries that reacted to it, and that's the point. But nevertheless, okay, Naomi, it's it's the uh, we knew. It's near the embassy. The Iranians say that this is the embassy, and that's enough. And also, the the uh, the office of the ambassador was also destroyed actually in the process. So they could have killed the ambassador. Well, that's embassy near enough for me. But another stuff about Israel is that Israel's economic economical system is on is destroyed almost. The country has not have had ships shipped to the country uh, since the, the Houthis started the, the Red Sea. Uh, they are paying huge amounts of um, ships to go to Israel, have to pay huge amounts of insurance. 
Um, they also, one of the biggest business the Israelis do besides weapons is actually the diamonds, the diamonds business. And the diamonds business is getting out of Israel. First of all, um, whatever the European Union had in mind with their stupidity of, of uh, embargo, the Russian diamonds, which is one of the biggest industries, is that Antwerp is losing the business of diamonds. And that is mostly controlled by Jews and Israelis. The, the building of the diamond building in Dubai is the biggest building in the world. The Arabs are stealing the business of diamonds. We know that diamonds are mostly uh, treated in India, and even India is trying to get the business of diamonds for themselves. So it's like Israel is in a really bad position for their future in a sense that, one, they are paying huge amounts just to get, because they are an island, they need everything carried to them. Okay, they produce a lot of food, it's true, but their agro-business is going to suffer a lot because there are several European countries. They are asking for the end of the European-Israeli uh, trade deal to be finished. So this is a point. The second is they are losing the diamonds. And third, yeah, and third, well, Israel is going to die economically. Wait, wait, wait. The, uh, well, before I go to that, uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. The, what what does Israel import that is not coming in? Because they don't import much from the rest of Asia, actually. They import mostly from Europe. Yeah. And then, so the Red Sea blockade, whatever, you know, it doesn't affect Israel that much. It affects Egypt a lot. So oh, they're paying huge amounts to get to, to get, by. they need everything shipped or by airplane, but the airplane is very expensive. And ships now are the ships are still landing. I just checked the radar traffic. You no, know, the the ship traffic ship radar. No, ships are still landing in Israel. Yes, they, they are. No one is eating ships across uh, at near Israel. Well, the ships are all at far away. The, the long way. The, the Hailat airport is empty. They have had almost no dockings of ships. That's in the south, in the uh, near the Red Sea, and on the, the uh, Mediterranean. They have ships coming, but paying huge amounts of uh, insurance to get there. Well, that would be surprised, but no, they they will still pay for it. I don't think that will collapse the economy. No, but I, 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 actually, I wanted to. I raised my finger because I want to talk. I still haven't finished on the, oh, the embassy thing. The is the from the perspective of Israel, right? They have no diplomatic relationship with Iran. So they don't recognize the embassy of Iran, technically speaking, in a way. So, so you have to understand from the perspective. No, no, of that's not really, valid. What you say, it's not I know, valid. I know it's not valid. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the moral ethics. I'm talking about Israeli perspective. It's not. It's not know. about morality. It's no. about the the Iran is recognized by United Nations as Israel. Yeah. If you don't have diplomatic relationship me, with the country, it doesn't mean that, that, that you don't recognize the property of an embassy. When, uh, Trump killed no, wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. no, the thing is, they they are technically in a proxy war with Iran all the time. So when mm. Iran's top general appears in Syria within striking distance, they will within striking distance and they can verify Excellent. and confirm that's the guy they'll hit it no and and they will have less regard about the, the purpose because... was not to kill the general they're not killing the general they're trying to start a war between the united states and iran it has nothing to do really with the general yeah yeah they killed the general. the united states killed the, the previous the general as well right the same mm -hmm. rank Soleimani was yeah. killed that's the, what the americans seen. under trump well not in an embassy yeah all these my... all these proxy it's Proxy not about units. the in this case it's not about the general israel is is a little bit desperate and trying to cause some kind of larger situation they need to draw the united states into a war in the middle east they think they do they have, i think they since do. the beginning of the conflict they have been trying to bombard their they have been trying to bombard their neighbors they have been uh, they have been shooting at everybody even the even against the egyptian bodyguard uh border guards they did it once so it's, it's like they are trying to provoke a conflict. Yes, Naomi is correct. They are showing everybody, be careful, we can, we can touch you. But this time they went a bit too far. This is not, they already have been bombing um, uh, um, Iranian proxies in, in Syria from the beginning, all the time. They have been bombing them. 
this is a, another yeah. dimension. This is a, it's another step that goes all over the top. Of course, we know, we have talked about this before. Iran is in a geopolitical situation at the moment that is not interested in starting a war. Go on. No, so, so why I wanted to say uh, all these things? Because you have, if people don't understand what is Israel's mindset, then you will always keep getting surprised by Israel. Israel has not done anything special. It's, they are just operating as they always has been. They even sunk a United States Navy ship, you no, know, just because the US Navy ship is trying to stop them from doing whatever they want to do. You, Israel has always been like this, and sinking a US Navy ship is much bigger thing than striking this embassy. Israel has always been like this. They are always that porcupine that you no, know, when the porcupine is attacked, they, the porcupine will actually move towards the, the, the aggressor with the backside where, where all the spice is. That's what Israel is. They will hurt you. Even though they are small, you know, that's what they're trying to do. That's that's how it is really that, that, that's small. because they have they Uncle Sam backing small. them. They do it they do it because they're small, they do it because they have a lot of enemies, they do it because they know that they're you know, United the United States, States is there. They, can't they know trust they have a bodyguard, them. the biggest bodyguard no. in the world. No, they don't yeah. trust the United States. They know they that they have the a real United ally. States. They control they the United, can't trust States. United States, but oh they have God. to trust the United States. <laughs> so, but I, I, I just said this. propaganda like now, United United RL? Still. When the when the during oh, those the, days, just just go tell that to to the APEC and the CPEC, please. Thank you. What matters is is they're doing what they need to do to survive, and they don't care if the rest of the world will hate them for it, because in their yeah, minds, the rest of the world will hate them no matter what. So they'll that do what they true. need to survive. That, that is true. Who knows why? But now all me. What what they did? Don't why? they need the payback? Who knows why? What? what is, <laughs> no, me. Do you think they're, they're terrible equal? neighbors? They're the worst Let's neighbors in the world. Okay. They are colonizers. But not 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 back to the Spanish lazy. But now all me. Don't you think they are not expecting a payback? Because, I mean. They, yes, I understand. I understood what you said. They are going to do anything to survive. It makes sense. It makes completely sense. And if somehow we should even give some respect for the Israelis to have managed a lot, but uh, and and had to accept a lot, although nothing appears out of the sky. So it's like nobody is a victim. Nobody is a perpetrator. Everybody has a negotiate his role in whatever conflict, but they need to understand they are going to have to pay back. The Iranians are going to do something. It's it's not going to be nice. I don't know. Okay, I understand that the Iranians are in a, the best geopolitical situation they have ever been since the Islamic Revolution. The Russians and the Chinese took them out of the isolation. They are building a, an integrated regional network of trade. And the, yes, their, their economical potential now is as big as never if they are smart and be careful. So that's why we said from the beginning it, it was a bit difficult to believe that Iran was on the, the first attacks. But nevertheless, Iran has to answer. And that's the problem. They created the kind of a situation that I think it's too. Um, it, it implies that there will be revenge, and there will be. So I, I wonder, Naomi, how do you see in their way of thinking, in their big balls, like you were saying, are they never afraid in the, those big balls, or is there a space for understanding reasonable, uh, reasonable acting? Do you think that the people who want Israel gone are reasonable? Upgrade, 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 continue. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I think um, the, the countries around them, obviously Israel is around countries who don't like them but, and vice versa. But it's not... Uh, it's not a reason to to hit embassies. There's no there's no goal for that. I, I 
I can understand the the feelings and why they do it, but you you're gonna have to live with the consequences. You cannot just hit somebody and then just be like, oh, he will not, he cannot hit me back. No, if somebody punches me, I'm gonna punch him back. And if I can harder, you know, and they will not be. Have we pleased. mentioned so, uh, that's that's normal? That's have we mentioned two million people are being starved to death? Yeah, that's another topic, but I'm talking about just this embassy strike right now. This is for me. You don't do that. You don't do that. If you always pretend that you're the good country in the in this war and you do it for the just and and everything, you don't hit embassies. They are diplomats. They have also families. Okay, great. We, under we understand that. We agree probably in principle with that, but also when you hit aid workers, when you destroy 36 yeah, of or 36 hospitals, a there's story. a long list of these issues, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, but so, that's what I mean. When you say all the time that you're the good guy and you're doing all these things, it piles up, right? And then yeah, we all know that. We've all acknowledged, acknowledged that. Yeah. People stop We've believing it. That People that stop believing it. I've stopped mm -hmm. believing it a long time ago. It's hard to believe. Yeah, like Everyone I've spent says. the last six months paying very close attention to what goes on in these certainly uh, these circles in TikTok, for instance, it's really amazing to watch some of the dialogue there, which is very focused on debate and controversy. I mean, I don't disagree at all with Naomi's uh, assessment that, you know, it's this Chihuahua style, like put up the big bark because you are small and you are vulnerable. But, you know, face it, Israel has been very lucky. I mean, it has had some real strokes of luck in its existence as a state since 48. For instance, wiping out an entire the Egypt's entire air force on the ground in one war, and you know, and an, uh, basically getting an intervention from the U.S. at exactly the right time, and getting a weird offer from the U.K. and France to please invade Egypt for us so we can seize the Suez. Like these are pretty interesting deals that you will only get if you have great international connections. The problem is that the international connections have become much worse over time. The spy agencies have become less competent over time, and the the relations are and and certainly the blackmail network has now been disbanded with the epstein maxwell uh, gang gone so there's a limited amount of time for this and i'm gonna you know push back on this notion that there's anything prejudicial or paranoid about saying that the united states controls israel at present or the other way around, that Israel controls the United States, because Netanyahu openly brags about that, has repeatedly and often said that he can get anything he wants from the United States and never to worry about the United States' reaction. So that is not even controversial when he's in charge. I think things were a little more normalized when Bennett was in charge, um, but like it seemed a little more like normal push and pull relations. But with Netanyahu, he seems to really expect, rightly or wrongly, that he will be backed no matter what he does. And I think that really angers the Biden administration, which realizes that Netanyahu's actions are a giant boat anchor on them. They've even had conversations with Benny Gantz about, could you form a government? Typical American behavior, getting in and trying to select a government. But Gantz told them he wouldn't do anything different, which I think really shocked them. So it's, for whatever reason, you know, total propaganda immersion, um, paranoia and panic, whatever, the majority of Israelis still believe that what's going on in Gaza is the right strategy. This is very, very damning from an international perspective, but most of them still believe in nonsense, like the 40 beheaded babies and things like that. Like the average Israeli still kind of believes that, you know, even though it's been utterly debunked. Many of them don't even know the IDF destroyed the Nova Festival, like what the IDF has admitted it. So there's a propaganda complex here in play that's increasing the Israeli domestic support for these actions when most of the world has actually realized that that this is a pile of crap and that it's a, a long list of lies and false flags and not just friendly fire incidents, but false flags passed off as friendly fire incidents. And the world is deeply sick of it. I mean, we don't want World War III to emerge in that part of the world. And, you know, we don't want any population to be wiped out. Populations have rights. But it is coming to look like 2 million people starving to death there, and then immediately a fanatic cabinet turning to the West Bank to do it to 3 million more people, possibly. It's them or 750,000 settlers in, in the West Bank who, you know, could just go somewhere else. And th this has been very neatly put as a stone, paper, scissors kind of problem, or a best two out of three, where Israel wants to be a Jewish state, wants to be a democracy, and it wants to be at peace. 
well, if it wants to be a Jewish state and a democracy, then it's kind of stuck in, in a war scenario by the fact they have to exclude this 5.3 million people living in this territory that they refuse to give up. They'd have to give them citizenship, and then they wouldn't be a Jewish state anymore. Or they can stay at continual war with these people by occupying them and not giving them a vote. Or they could abandon democracy and just become, you know, a, a benevolent dictator to these people, but not worry about who's in the majority. What I find rather ironic and hilarious is that Israelis constantly point to the two, two million or so Israeli Arabs, the Bedouin Arabs, who do not identify as Palestinians, but as Bedouin, and um, and say, oh, well, look, we treat them as equals. Well, they don't. There's a list of reasons why that's a false claim. But they seem terrified of giving those people the balance of power. You'd have about 5 million Israeli Jews. You'd have about 5 million Palestinians if you incorporated the West Bank and Gaza. And then those 2 million Bedouin would be the, 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 the actual deciding vote, right? So if you have treated them really well for 80 years and other groups like the Druze who are there, then you shouldn't be all that afraid of them holding the balance of power. But it does actually defeat the concept of the Jewish state. So the, the state was already in crisis, already fighting over its constitution, the powers of the Supreme Court. I don't think it's that much of a reach to imagine a federated republic, a binational state constitution could be negotiated right now. But the average Israeli has to believe something very different about his state than he believes right now. He believes that it's benevolent. He believes it's blessed. He believes it's, you know, guaranteed to win, whatever they believe about it, they're going to have to abandon those beliefs and realize they have to negotiate. Exactly what we've been saying about Ukraine. Anyone that thinks that Ukraine has some kind of holy right to be there with the 1991 border is wrong, and that's over, period. And I think with respect to Israel, the status quo is over. They can't continue this occupation under these terms at all. They abandon the Jewish state identity for a new constitution. They abandon democracy and become a dictatorship like half of their neighbors, or all their neighbors, really, or they uh, basically in, in just the rest of the world. There's no way that, that 2 million or 5 million people are going to be starved to death. They're being told that even by their allies. Trump is a pretty good ally, and he said, you know, to stop this. Like, he it's would happening. tolerate, I think, more. It's happening. He would tolerate genocidal it's strikes, happening. but he would not tolerate watching people starve to death, right? He clearly won't tolerate that. So there is nobody on their side if this continues. So. I think that's just by way of understanding the problem, right? I don't have to advocate any particular action to lay that set of ugly facts out. Ukraine and Israel, as RL kind of suggests, are perceived right now as part of a racial supremacy pattern that the United States habitually supports, usually with religious racial extremists. They did it with the Iran-Contras. They did it with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. They did it with Catholics in South Vietnam. They commonly get behind a conservative religious group that is willing to commit atrocities against minorities. This is an American pattern. They pick that proxy carefully to be somebody who is isolated, fanatical, and amoral in many ways. Or easy like the defend. Islamists. Like, like the they, Islamists. I mean, they, they built them up. Like they the Islamists. Them. them too. The Mujahideen exactly, were created them too. by the They're Israelis. all the same. Hamas, they're part of the Islamist group. Israel, the they're Islamists. Islamists. All these maniacs are American. What production. differentiates? The crazy what differentiates the Hamas? Crazy Ukrainian, Look, sorry, sorry the you crazy have to stop. I hear these are all American tools. You legally have to Israel stop at this tool. point because Hamas is legally different than those groups. Hamas represents a stateless people who have no citizenship. That makes them categorically not terrorists, no matter what they do. You can't even call them that legally. To call them that legally is actually to commit genocide and be complicit to genocide. Stateless peoples have a right of defense that no other people have. People who went to join ISIS in Syria, they had citizenship. Some of them in Britain or America or other places where they were perfectly safe. So when they showed up there, you know, you can call them a T group all you want, but Hamas is a stateless resistance group and everybody knows in international law that such groups cannot be held responsible under international law because they're not a nation you've got to recognize them as a state and then hold them accountable that's international and law uh, and there are no exceptions at all what a lot of hamas was created by israel that's the law 
also doesn't the, matter. Oh, doesn't matter. They are presently a the, the resistance group of a stateless group. They're also one of yeah. several several different fighting oh, groups, especially. including okay. secular groups, Christians, I hope, and can we interrupt Craig now? Why were they attacking <laughs> Israel in the fifties? Who is they? Hamas. Hamas didn't exist in the fifties. Didn't exist yeah, in the fifties. The PLO we... did. The PLO did. The PLO didn't Hamas. exist in the fifties. Actually, the PLO, PLO didn't exist in the fifties. The PLO, PLO began was... to appear at the end of the sixties and in the seventies with Yasser Arafat. There were so why, why were they? Wait, no, 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 no. no. Were there were, there were Why attacks. were they? Who's why, they? Okay, why? Why Name were the Hamas the PLO? Name the group. Name the group that was attacked in the fifties. I, I don't remember. It, there was some I don't random, think they were the Fedahin. They were called the Fedahin. The Fedahin, yes, that's correct. Yep. They were attacking Israel in the 50s. And then when the PLO came about, they were attacking them. Uh, Hamas came about, they were attacking them. All mm -hmm. when they were part of the state of Jordan. They were not stateless at the time. Then you can totally reasonably call them at Why that were, time. Toby wanted to talk. They were not you want. Toby wanted to speak. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing that when they had state passports, you can call irrelevant. them irrelevant. Yeah, it's very so, relevant today. Yeah, because Craig's point or CH point or crypto, I don't know if I want to call him what. So the the point is that Hamas, if you look use it in a very ancient way, you know, like one thousand, two thousand years ago kind of idea, Ham, Hamas Gaza Strip is actually a kingdom. It's a Hamas led kingdom, and they are supposedly part of a bigger country or kingdom or state, which is Palestine. Which is now they split into two, like you know, two different states. Like you know, the Roman Empire split into two, although they're still part of the Roman Empire. Be the Eastern Rome or Western Rome is still part of the same Rome, by right, by right. But they actually run totally differently and totally. I'm different not talking about historical rights. I'm talking about present case. They yeah, don't have about, right. state passports. Right. Yeah, I'm talking they about don't. like you no. Know, they it's like a kingdom. Just that you no, know, this kingdom don't have passports in the past. You know, they they're just a kingdom. So when. So when Hamas attack Israel, Israel retaliate. The the but but in modern so they are legitimate in the sense that Hamas is not a terrorist group if you view them as a kingdom, as one state. It's just that they still struggling to get recognition from the rest of the world as as an independent people to get back their rights, to get back their borders. As an indigenous in the, people is the technical yeah, and, uh, and they are, as their own people, oh, as their own oh, country. Oh, oh, oh. But they are, they are an also, indigenous yeah. people. Genetically, culturally, and recognized as such by the ICJ. That's over that discussion. That I, Palestinians that are I a protected know. class, <laughs> so they exist as a people. You can't even argue even, that legally anymore. It's a ruling. Toby, Toby yeah. has been trying to answer. I know Naomi has a lot to answer to the CS. Yeah. This is very complicated and it's very difficult. It really to isn't. And when does we start discussing? Because we can always go behind. And we know that, the, in, unfortunately, the creation of Israel is problematic from the beginning. The Legally British is, yeah. just wanted to get rid of the problem, and they created an even bigger problem. Uh, yeah. Toby, sorry. Yeah, yeah if, if Craig's finished. But look, uh, I'm not even going to touch on, on what is international law, but the thing is, everybody <laughs> is, is going to talk about what's happening in Israel in the Middle East. No one here lives there, and nobody's being particularly objective about the history of the Middle East for the last 100 years. It's not like Israel's the only actor in that region to ever do anything aggressive or hostile or desperate. You know, Israel didn't start the Iran-Iraq war, which went on for a very long time. There's been all kinds of conflict in that region for, for well since the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate, you know it's it's been in turmoil since 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 that major geopolitical event. People criticize Israel with a vitriol, which betrays the idea that they're objective. I mean, like if if you look at myself, if 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 you look at myself, I genuinely don't care, and and I feel bad about that, right? But I'm on the other side of the world. Um, I'm I'm Christian. I find that whole region particularly unchristian. Um, 
And I don't particularly care about the folks there because I don't really know many people there. Like I, we've got some Iranian friends and so on, which we really like. But I find that whenever I know anybody from anywhere, I like them because they're people and people are likable, whereas regions and countries aren't. But if, if we're objective about the Middle East, that whole place is a seething mess. And I, I hesitate to get involved in the in the grandiose word slinging about you know what a what a great evil Israel is because I'm not sure how any other state would go if it was plonked down there in that region um, with those neighbours and and that's not to criticise you know any particular neighbour either. It's just it, that that's an extremely difficult situation. I also take issue with the idea that like. Jews are magical creatures who mind control Americans, and that um, that the Israeli lobby in America isn't supported predominantly by evangelical Christians. It is. It's just a fact. It absolutely is. You, yeah. you, you know, and and the, the reality is, you know, you, you have to go back to the 1300s before you can make the argument that the Jews were wicked because they were involved in banking and finance. Um, but even back then, they worked for Christian kings in Europe. So I don't know. I, I find that the anti-Israeli sentiment to be, um, it's almost like a form of entertainment or mobbing. It's like, yeah, they've got a country in a really nasty part of the world where everybody hates everybody and they're being attacked by folks who've got basically nothing to lose and they're responding to it in with violence and, and, and becoming even more unpopular. But I don't think that we can... I don't think that we should fall into the problem of thinking that Palestinians are good or that Jordanians are good or that anyone around there is good because Israel is bad. You know, this, this kind of reaction to it is, this is treating it like Who sport. are you saying this to? You know, I, 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 I don't know. know. Yeah, who, the, there are people who've done that in this in this panel. And, you know, frankly, to be well, blunt, well, you, I Craig, deny Craig, being one of Craig, them. the way... Craig, the way that you carry on, it's like Israel invented war. It's like it's like it's like Israel invented the idea of treachery in international politics, and those poor little Palestinians who never heard a fly. Starving two million right? people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, two and million it's, people. It's horrible. I respectfully you know, submit you may not Nobody's... know the history of the region that well. Rare, yeah, well, you can rare, respect terrible thing to do. Whatever you want, you carry on about law as though like you actually. I read think some. he's making but a point. What he's actually at. written some. He's making. Oh, wait, yeah, wait, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. He's making a very good point. Let's just listen to the end, and then we can go through the different parts of it if you feel like. Well, but no, we'll that, 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 that'll that'll do for me. That's that's my only point. Like I I I don't think that it uh, it's flattering or useful or even particularly insightful to talk about that conflict as though, firstly, as though you care, and secondly, as though it's like it has any grand lessons for the world. But you know. Anyway, if that's what you guys want to do, you all can talk about that if you want. I actually I, agree I, with I'm, you, Toby, in principle. Agreement. I agree with you in principle that because of, for instance, historical Christian anti-Semitism, blaming Jews for not accepting Jesus and all that, that there is this sort of target on the back. And that effectively, when the state of Israel is founded, there is a belief, even among scientists and historians, that this is an indigenous people legitimately returning to a land it is indigenous from. All of that has fallen apart with modern genetics and archaeology, but it is unfair to the people living there who moved there under those beliefs that to say that they're now stranded in a place where they're considered aliens and told to move back to Europe when the Europeans told them you aren't European and you should leave. That unfairness is imposed by, as you say, a kind of Christian Zionism which is largely motivated by kicking people out of Christian countries. I understand, agree, and believe in all that. I don't think I do target. Not actually what I said, but. Well, that's my interpretation to, that's my, as far yeah. as I can agree with you, right, historically. Right, yeah. As far as the question of targeting is concerned, um, <laughs> I've been involved in campaigns to stop what was going on in Yemen, to stop what was going on in Syria. I am, I have repeatedly, gone into the history of how uh, Jews were racialized, singled out, and exterminated, and why and how in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. I am extraordinarily anti-Nazi and outspoken about that. So I think that of all people here, I, I might have more license to 
come to a negative opinion about what the Israeli government is presently doing, because I'm not, for instance, pro-Nazi and anti-Israel, as many, many people in North America are willing to arm, you know, genocidal racists who do, uh, in every opportunity they get, racialize and attack Jews. I mean, I'm against those people categorically, and that's partly because of my own family history that I've explained. Yeah, but you dress it up as though it's a big intellectual exercise, but it's really just sports. I mean, all the, are all the people that are all the people that are anti-Israel. Well, okay, you can believe it's false if you like. There's an entire ICJ case laid out here. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that you have never people. mentioned. You but, have never but, mentioned Al Husseini. I mean, Al Husseini. It's just sport. Why man. is he even it's relevant like, to a it's, modern it's, ICJ it's, case? It's like I'm edgy uh, and I'm and I'm you know yeah. important, so I'm going to throw around some big words and criticize Israel. It's not real. It's not. It's not like these people are actually. It's have very real. My about. country oh, stopped please. shipping arms to Israel, and they had offered unconditional support, and we've defeated that unconditional support. It is mm. gone. That is a political achievement that many people in Canada have achieved. Right, it yeah, went from the foreign minister saying we are unconditionally support Israel to banning supplies of arms to Israel. That is a policy change. You all sit around and sing "Kumbaya" due to your mm -hmm. massive achievements on the global stage. Do you resent the fact that we actually sometimes get things done in my country? Are you failing to achieve something, Toby, in Australia? Yeah, that's what it is, Craig. You no one should right be interested on in geopolitics. No one should be interested. Citizens in have obligations to. Yeah, no. There's a difference between there's a difference between being that. interested in geopolitics in and believing in in you know caricatures and supporting issues as though it's a sporting event. You're an actual like, Christian. You believe in the biggest caricature of all, the fictional character called Jesus, completely constructed by yeah, Romans after like, the Barnabas uh, revolt yeah, in order to to popular. recruit people. Like that's ridiculous assertion from a Christian. Ridiculous. Well, we're ridiculous people compared like to your kind. Or what is my kind exactly, Toby? We talk a lot, but that's not Aren't your you worst those feature. Reptilian mind okay, control let, let's let's not take it personally because that doesn't bring us anywhere. Religion well, well, it, it gets is away damaging. from talking about Israel, well, which is like well, you know, we have to understand. Well, we I think you some, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Religion well, we is damaging, and yet you support one of the worst. Wait, no, no. You you are supporting Islamists. One of the worst. No, no, no. No, he did not that. I supported a resistance today, and a nationalist movement it is that Islamist happens to include religion. Islamists. What does Hamas stand it's for? Let's not Islamic become Islamic resistance. Yeah. You are What's supporting what? Islamists, and you're standing here. I don't no, support them. Try to tell people I don't that support they're Hamas, but I will not criticize Israel's enemies. When, when people, you're supporting under, you know, one of the worst. Until there's a free I, I support the okay. PFLP, actually, not okay, so, so much I, the other groups. I think, I think we shouldn't get personal. We are exchanging points of views and discussions depends on different perspectives, and that's how we can go further. I think Israel, I think, no, it is a reality. It has become a part of history and it is exists how it exists. Like Toby said, in a very complicated complex, a context that we often forget. And that was a very good introduction to it. And everybody actually said very good things. But we are here mostly not, in a way, Toby remembered us. We are here mostly watching this conflict at the light of a global bigger conflict that has been uh, uh, engineering from a while now. We are not looking mostly uh, mostly at the, this conflict by the conflict itself. And Naomi, okay, you, I am a, I'm a, uh, uh, amazed by the knowledge you have, and it's very, very interesting. But let's not get personal, because we, we have been watching it mostly through the global uh, conflicts that have been happening in the world in this context, also in the Ukraine. And we have also to understand that in the world changing, because that's this geopolitics, Israel plays a big role. And we are not, uh, at, at least the beginning, when we are talking about the embassy, we are mostly observing it from the sense that all these assemble of norms and rules that have been constructed, the old world we had, are being changed and they are changing all the time and this is very complex 
And how do we make any understanding of this? The fact that they bombed an embassy has weight. We understand what you said, and it was amazing, Naomi, that you actually let, brought that to us. Israel is doing what Swiss it is because it needs to do it. Opinion. Let the Swiss neutral opinion come in. Oh, no. Yeah. He's not neutral at all. He thinks that, <laughs> um, he thinks that well, the I'm Spanish not neutral. All you know, I didn't speak, man. <laughs> all you know. Prata, come on, man. Come on, you know me. Well, it's, you it's, know it's, me. It's, I just, I just, I just said to Naomi before that for me it's unacceptable to bomb embassy. So for me that that has, I just said it before, but I have to agree a little bit with Naomi here. You, okay, people start uh, say about uh, uh, kids or uh, women and so on get starving and so on. That's true, but they don't say also that the IDF is trying to get food trucks to these people and then Hamas stealing all this food. You know, nobody's talking about this because the bad Israelis, right? It's, that's that's oh, for me. The, oh, I upgrade! You have you have to I'm tell me where you get your news. Man, RL, please, no, 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 upgrade! I have to stop you there. No, you don't please, have to please, stop me. please, don't please, have to please, stop upgrade! Give, 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 the, give your news. Give you information you because idea. because I, I I heard exact the exact opposite. Oh God, you 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 have to disclose your 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 information, please. Are you a little kid, Mario? Upgrade, you're kind of living down to the stereotype no, Toby's talking down. about there, I'm where you want to talk about this embassy over and over again, and we've agreed listen. to That's disagree we that we don't have the facts on it exactly. Okay, oh. you have all the facts, you're That's right. Not you know what everything. I said. You, what facts you're are never, missing? You know everything. You're the best. It's okay. It's I just part of what you said, Toby, that people would rail on without, you know, basis. About Israel. Okay, so, then just listen for a while. And we were listening your monologue for 20 minutes now. You can have hey, two hey, minutes hey, for hey. us. Do you have any point fine. other than the embassy? It's issue. fine, it's fine. Keep calm. I'm just trying to tell you something and you don't listen. You just react to something like a crazy guy. I'm just telling you when you say terrorists cannot be uh, uh, legally pursued because they don't have a state or something like that. If you do terrorism, you do terrorism. There is no, for me, there is no point. If you kill somebody and you and you say, oh no, but they didn't have a passport, that's why we cannot judge them. I'm sorry. That's no that's way. not what the UN yeah. says. The UN is very clear about yeah. this, and so is the ICJ. You listen. You listen what I just said to you. If you, I cannot, heard what you said. You, you can exactly break international law if you want, but there are consequences to that. I just told you what you said before, right? You said to us before that if they don't have a state, if they don't have Support, they cannot be legally charged for terrorism, even if they do so. But I yes. tell you, if you do terrorism, it doesn't matter which country you're from, or even if you don't have a country, you should be charged for terrorism. If you tell me the international law, which nobody but it's follows, not, by it's not terror, it's nobody not murder. Follows that. It's, it's not, not murder if you kill occupiers. Uh, it's not murder if you kill people. If you kill an occupying uh, force, it's not murder, right? Okay, so it's not a crime, it's a, okay. it's self-defense. Okay. okay, I will give, I will give to somebody else. Yeah, so, 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 the, the thing is, civilians. it doesn't matter terrorism or murder or whatever. The, the power the, the murder of 850 civilians. See, this is how the Holocaust happened. No, this it is isn't. How the Holocaust Most of them no, were killed by it IDF. You're by it the is not the murder of 35,000 mm. civilians. No, no, so, 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 even worse, right? That's just, just, uh, so it's worse. That's uh, even worse. Just, uh, I, I want to jump in. Uh, upgrade, you say that IDF is doing, uh, everything so, uh, That's food trucks dry, can reach dry. the Palestinians. Yeah. The report mm -hmm. I heard is that IDF is doing everything so food trucks can't reach the Palestinians. And okay. even, and even the United States government are complaining about his, uh, to the Israeli officials to let so, the food trucks so reach the So why does Abraham have to give his source, but you don't have to give your source, RL? How come you're allowed to have an opinion? Oh, oh but it's not? mainstream. It's mainstream. Google it, Toby. Google, Google it, please. Well, You'll okay, find so, it so very, you tell me to Google it, but you ask him Go for a Google source. Google it. If you're going to interrupt exactly, other because, people because, demanding their sources, because every mainstream like media that, we're talking about that is so, that of the State Department. Yeah, and there are plenty of reports. There are plenty of reports so you see, Toby, you have a stake in that story. You have a stake in that topic. 
you were talking about history. Let's talk about history of Israel. Everything began You're with the Balfour Declaration. Let's talk about your Everything sources. began with the Balfour Declaration. And then you got Second World War and the Doesn't Europeans the killed the Jews. And the Europeans killed the Jews, especially the Germans. And what the white people, especially the Anglo-Saxon, decided? Let's create a state of Israel in Palestine. And the people there, living there, who were under the Ottoman rules and then under the British rules, had no say. Israel no is a colonial yeah. project. Yeah. Well, okay, in the sense, in the sense Israel, Israel, is Israel is a colonial project. In the sense, Israel is correct because the world we left, the Second World War, is still a colonial, colonial world. And that needs to be understood. So that's one yes. of the problems of the creation of Israel. is because it's creating within a world that is still colonial. It will die right after it. But as I said before, let's also not place all the blames into the, into the what was the future Israelis. Because the British actually are the ones to blame. They because found themselves into a situation that they couldn't control. And they just wanted to get rid of it, making an even bigger problem because nothing was coordinated more international like it was because we were still in a colonial world. Yeah. And we, because we, we were in a colonial that. world. Hmm? Yeah, I agree. But uh, I just want to add on. It, it, we have to understand that the geopolitics of those times is entirely different. After World War One, Ottoman Empire did collapse. Everything is free game for everyone. So that's why the the the... the the allied powers split up the Ottomans among themselves and they can do whatever they want. And you also have to understand during those days, Middle East is just tribal. There is no real kingdoms around. You know, they are all very tribal. Every place is rather sparse. You know, there's very few big cities. So they just chop up one land. Israeli always wanted to go back to their homeland. Okay, let's give them back then. That kind of thing. No, during the, the British era. And then and then they re they rebuilt under the British, uh, the Palestinian mandate, and then they they have all the all the workers come and build build up Palestine, and then then war breaked out because they don't like it. So and then why the war breaked out because all the all the new kingdoms, they they also want a piece of Palestine. They also they don't want the Jewish state to be there because maybe the Quran don't teach them teach them no they don't like them so all these things is the past and those days are so different from today so do we cannot. Although we understand the history, but you no, know, two days is two days geopolitics. If we just go back to history, then everybody have their own version of history. Then we're gonna have a, we're gonna go into this black hole of like, you no, know, whose history is correct? Like we can't even, we can't even decide which present is correct. You know, we have different realities. Like, you know, is Israel actually trying to help in terms of food truck, or did they not wanting to help with the food truck? We can't even decide the the reality of you no know, things happening in the past month. We talk about history about one hundred years ago. You know that. It's too complicated. For me, I prefer to look at the motivations. You know, the like I know Israel committed a lot of weird shit, you know, and a lot of bad things. Even my government, which is a strong, strong friend of Israel, also start to condemn. So, same thing as Craig have mentioned, United States has started to condemn Israel as well. But I'm not saying that Israel is not doing wrong uh, doing wrong or something, or everything is perfect, like you know, this 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 super chat is saying. This, the first statement, the, 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 the statement about giving them a break is wrong. I'm just saying that <coughs> Israel don't expect, respect any norm. That is just how they are. And that's why, that's how they operate because that's their doctrine. So you, you, you just like the same argument where I always say, the pro-Palestinian the pro people keep saying that Israel is a demonic or you know, very evil people. But then when they do evil stuff, you got surprised. So like, Whoa, why they do evil stuff? It's like, come on, you already know that they are evil. Then why are you surprised that they do evil stuff and then why are you expecting them not to be evil so if you already know that they are evil why do you hit evil. them and hit them and use to hit you back the same Quiet. thing you know, it, 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 uh, it, yeah. be careful though you don't fall into this trap again which trap that, well the the trap of 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 like to to claim that there could never be 
a prime minister of Israel who could, say, evacuate the murderous settlers in the West Bank or who couldn't stick to a border try, right? deal to one set of borders because there's something inherently wrong of the country that everyone who runs it turns into an evil person. I don't think that's no, no, true no, 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 of really no, no, any that's, country that's, on earth. No, no, I'm not saying well, that. God Israel is actually never, their hearts. never no, tried to have this plan, right? And then it, eventually the, the prime minister got assassinated for even you know, having this idea of giving Palestine their state. So, by one extremist, not by, you know, that wasn't a yeah, popular yeah, I, know, I, never, I never say that the whole country is evil. I'm just saying that. I'm just saying that that is how that country operates. Just like, you know, everybody thinks that America is evil. Mm -hmm. Like, those, all oh. those uh, non non American friends, you know, they always say, you know, is uh, Americans are you no know, this evil, you no know, superpower that you no know, bombs everyone and mess with everyone's politics, which is also true. But the, the fact that we have so many American friends here, you no, know, America no, lost like five good. presidents to assassinations or assassination attempts or assassinations yeah, yeah. when they were so, running for so, office, like. Correct. Look at so country, if you if you take a microscope on any country that's at war, you're going to see something pretty ugly. Yeah, like yeah. States, yeah. states are not <laughs> cute, cuddly creatures that love you and treat you as a member Israel's of their family. Israel's not at war. States yeah. are an enterprise that have at a war. monopoly on violence force. It, it, exactly. So, so which is why my not at war. Is, this is not a war. It's not a war. That doesn't matter. It's man. Not a war. It, when 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 the, when the UN went to get you, well, maybe the ICJ should ask you, and then killing. you can tell them what's a war. You know, like, I agree with you, Marlon, but they say they war. are. No, the, the, the key point is well. the reality don't change. You see, what if the, the government said he was at war. <laughs> yeah, they, if they say they are at war, they are at war. No, so the 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 fact is, as long as the the reality don't change, every country have their own politics that drive. A general no strategy and then mm -hmm. and then there's geopolitics that cannot be ignored it always mm -hmm. happened the same shit will happen everywhere putin is assassinating his oppositions so is in the united is states he? they are you no know, suppressing there are you no know, those promising presidential that. candidates or oh, is all the same same thing happening in israel israel the entire national uh, strategy is so it's like this or why netanyahu always come back it's because the politics are messed up. You know, they have too many parties. They are in this weird alliance that you know. In the, eventually, Netanyahu will always come back. You know, this is like, it's like this superhero or super villain that never dies. You know, they always keep coming back. So, so I'm, I, for me, it's just that you no, know, I prefer to see things as more neutral or more objective because we we, we have to stop getting surprised by what Israel is doing mm. because they 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 have a, their own way of doing things and they have their own reality. Mm. And, and but, if we don't acknowledge or understand their reality, then we'll we'll always be arguing against them in a way that will cause more people to die. Mm. This is why I'll keep saying that we have to first decide what is Hamas, for example, for Gaza Stream. Are they the rulers or are they not the rulers? You you cannot decide that they are the government. It's yet they are saying that they are a resistance. It's not a are country. A Gaza a is not a country. It's not a country. It's doesn't a matter. Camp. It's a prison camp. So, it's not a so, country. So, it, does it doesn't matter who the so, rulers are. No, 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 rulers no, no, they're not a government. It's, like, it's not like may, And there can't be a government of Gaza. Going back. There wait, 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 wait. Don't go the other too. person. I, I only need to respond to Marlene. The, state, Marlene, if Marlene's they, point is they are not a government, a then... State? No, if Marlene's mm, There is really no such thing in international as a de facto state. state. If Marlene question, says that no. they are no, not a government, then how is question. their ministry of health being recognized? Do they have a ministry of health? If they have a ministry of health, then they are a government. You have to decide whether... Black Panthers had a ministry of health or something like that. Yeah. No, the Black because Panthers all the, the numbers of the Ministry of Health. Wait, wait, wait. All the Palestinians death, it come. Gaza yeah, then, is, there is part government, of right? you have Gaza is part of Palestine, Palestine, and Palestine has a government. <laughs> it's called the Palestinian Authority. They are a de Israel doesn't state. recognize it as a state. There's no as Palestine. They are a de facto no state. There's a, wait, 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 there's wait, wait, no right. Palestine. Palestine. You can't part of Israel. Israel is that land. If you look okay, at wait, 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 wait. Why is everybody so confused? It's under wait, occupation by Israel. Palestine state have a government. Have a government. It's called the Palestinian authorities. But the Palestinian authorities yeah, have yeah. no authority in the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip and is they do have passports. controlled by Hamas. They do, so, and they do have passports. No, from yeah. an unrecognized so entity. The, the ICJ ruled Hamas. on this That's one. the whole problem. They are That's counted Hamas is a bad guy here. Mm -hmm. They are the Hamas is the bad people. guy. No, no, no let me finish my point. 
So Hamas the, the point guy. is, we're supposed to yeah, whatever Hamas, you know, Hamas is not a good or bad guy. To me, it's just the point is, you, people cannot decide what are they. First, if we cannot agree on the same facts, they're unimportant. Then we will always they be arguing against them. Marlon, Marlon, shut up and let Wyatt finish, please. Unless you're Don't a lawyer, Marlon. No, Marlon, I understand because you, you, if you talk like this, the problem is in real life, if this will work, it's still all right. But in, in recording, people can't hear because the, the audio doesn't, you know, people only He's hear one audio. Press, okay. So the, the thing is, you have to first decide what is Hamas. Are they a government of the Gaza Strip or not? Because if they are not the government of Gaza Strip, then their health ministry number cannot be trusted because they are not a government. They're just putting numbers randomly. But if you believe that they are government and their numbers are correct, then yes, then Hamas is a government of the Gaza Strip. It doesn't matter if they are their country or not. They govern and they rule Hamas. They rule Gaza Strip. That's Bizarre. the reality. Do they rule? Do they govern uh, Hamas, Gaza Strip? Do they control? Bizarre observation. No, okay, no. So do they? No, if uh, if yeah, they, they do, do control Gaza Strip, then when they attack from Gaza Strip into Israel, that is an act of war. If they they are resistance group, then they are no. not a government. Then they, are, they no. don't have a health. It's military. an act of resistance. It's yeah. an act what, of I, resistance. I, I mean, again, you got you. You want again, to sit here and have this this long again, drawn because out they argument? Because they are not recognized by United Nations you know, as a country, but what, they are recognized what, as a people. You yes. understand? You don't. You don't understand what you 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 are saying. You are still no, confusing. No, 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 no. Under the Palestinian Authority, yes. Under Hamas, no. No, the uh, Palestinian, Palestinian Authority is not representative of a country recognized by United Nations. Then who? Yes, they are. Then who? This is totally right. hypocrisy right. by is, by the United Nations and by the entire world. State. No, 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 no. Palestine, the the recognized government of Palestine is the Palestinian authority. Palestinian authority. Palestinian authority yeah. is the one that sent the ambassador to the United Nations. It's not Hamas. Hamas, but then the Palestinian authority have zero control over the Gaza Strip. It's entirely because they're in a civil war. Control. Hamas. Because they're and in a civil war, which Hamas is something else Hamas that people keep a ignoring. Palestine Hamas has been in a civil war since 2007. I mean, can he finish his point? And, and then I'd and like Ham to go. I had my finger up. Hamas and the, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas is divorced. They are not the same side. They are entirely different side. It's basically two different countries right now, even though they're being caught the same thing. So you, you cannot say that they are recognized. They are not. Hamas, Gaza Strip is its own thing now. Entirely its own thing, which is why Israel can declare war on Hamas and attack Gaza Strip and totally no West Bank is a different thing. Entirely no. They, they doesn't really invade because they have full control. They are they, West Bank is a full real real occupation of Israel. Gaza Strip is not. Is, Israel is not inside Gaza Strip until the invasion. So, which is why it's very confusing because you have to decide what they are there, but they are in the blockade. You can say to say that they are under occupation, they are not. But they, are, but what Gaza Strip is, they are they before the war, they were under a blockade, a effective blockade by Israel. So the then I can say that yes, they are going to war with Israel because they are getting blockade, but then it's a war. So it, 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 there's a confusion between the identity of Hamas. That you no know, causing all these argument on every side. No, nobody can agree with everyone. So first, we have to decide what is what. Von, Von is very angry. You know, Von, Von is praying to Jesus already. <laughs> I, I'm uh, no, I'm just saying. I mean, I agree with everybody's points here and there, but I mean, in reality, we can simplify it. Hamas, the Palestinians, Hezbollah, they're whatever they need to be to fit the narrative. Whoever's in charge of the situation that's going on at the current time. If they need to be the good guy, they're the good guy. If they need to be the people or the authority or the terrorists, whatever they need to be is what they are. They're they're in the gray area. They're in limbo, you know, so they can be called whatever they need to be called when the United States needs to call them something or Israel needs to call them something or European Union needs to call them something or the Arab nations need to call them something. It, it, that's Amen. that's what they are. I mean, you, you don't have to get into this long-winded fight about – what Hamas is or is it? I mean, they're all useful tools, you know, that are manipulated in that region. So, if I may, 
if I may, I would like to add something. So Israel, because of its creation, it has something exotic within the concert of nations. Nevertheless, most nations have something exotic in themselves. But there is the process that Israel is creating is also an anti-process of what this humanity has been developing. So with the with the resolution for antico, uh, for uh, for the discolonization, we have a problem with Israel that is still not clear what it is. Is it a colonized territory or is not? It's not a problem. It is a state. It, it exists as it exists. But the, the 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 formation, the configuration of it, especially now, like we have nowadays, after whatever happened, is that we are even near something called apartheid. Well, Naomi, you are from South Africa, and many countries actually recognize that South Africa system, the way they uh, manage the um, manage the Palestinians, it resembles a lot of the apartheid system. And there are conv conventions and international rules and norms to exactly forbid this to have uh, happen again, a system of apartheid. So we have an uh, international problem with Israel. We have all these configurations of situations that the world has been trying to solve and they still have it. And so Israel lives also in the kind of a limbo, like Vaughn was saying, in not just the Palestinians. Everybody is more or less, which is a very good point of Vaughn, comfortable with this limbo situation. As you probably know, Naomi, many countries accept parts of Israel and other parts they don't accept. For instance, technically, the European Union doesn't recognize the um, the occupied parts of Palestinian, uh, especially the West Bank, by um, colonnades. These are considered illegal. These people shouldn't even be able to get inside of the European Union. Of course, they, they make blind eyes to that. But this is also a fact. So Israel is a kind of many things together, and it's very difficult to point inside and look at, which is also creates a lot of confusion because we are all due to these particularities, we are all very um, engaged emotionally about it. It's the apartheid, it's the rules of um, freedom fighters and all these, uh, these romanticized idea of, of, of the Palestinians, like somehow Vaughn was trying to very well explain these, these romanticized ideas of the Palestinians fighting for their, for in, their independence. But Wade once made a really good pres uh, presentation of what that the Palestinians themselves also never really had an engagement to have a, a real independent country or a real serious uh, um, resolution of the problem. So we, we are these two actors that present themselves in the best way they can to outside. And on the other side, we seeing these presentations feel very emotional. The whole world looks at Israel at this moment in a very emotional way. But geopolitics is realism and all countries do really horrible things. Nevertheless, it is interesting in terms of this context, international context of today, when Russia invaded Ukraine and the whole Western world went riding to the to the older international forums saying we need a, inter, a, um, um, interne a rule based order. Uh, Russia is um, breaking all the rules that we knew before of the international order that we knew. They are disrespecting the chart of the United Nations. And then we see all these countries making a blind eye to everything they say it's sacred to them. So this creates a, a, a dystopic situation of the international order. And when we see Israel even bombing uh, an embassy uh, it makes sense what Naomi said us, but when we look at the, the picture of the whole world around, it was amazing what Naomi said to us because it made sense to understand the perspective of the, of the Israelis. But on the other side, to look at the, 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 the complexity of the, of the situation we find ourselves, the, the, the fragility that all the whole world 
the old world that we had, that we constructed, we know it was never respected. There are more embassies around the world that were bombed. And there were also many uh, genocidal actions of many countries uh, in many places uh, in this last year. So it's not something new. But it's interesting to see how everything is falling apart in very few months. In six months, a lot of things are falling apart. And this is the, the, the scary thing. Uh, I, I meant, sorry if I took too much time. Oh, you're Wrong. good. Wrong. No, I was going to say this might this might be anecdotal to what I was saying earlier, but I mean, one example I could think of of just how schizophrenic and the whole situation is, it's like, you know, you could be watching Fox News and there'll be an ad about, you know, please send money to the Israelis to help feed Israelis or buy meals for the Israelis or something along that line, you know, some kind of supplies. And then, you know, you know, there'll be a segment or two of news. And then the next ad will be a Palestinian family sitting in a dirt road in the middle of a bombed out rubble, basically saying, hey, send money to help feed the families and support. You know, it's like whatever they need to be for this five minutes of narrative is what the Jews will be or the Palestinians will be. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous because I mean, some and the thing is, is Fox's news is making money off the ads they sell for the war coverage. Then they're making monies off the ads they sell to the Israelis to ask for money to feed people. And then they make monies off the Palestinians to, then, to ask for money to feed people. So it's like, it's like a triple play the, for Fox News or any of these channels to run this garbage. I tell you, that's not even the best part. When you donate the money to the Palestinian uh, person, right? They're sitting by the roadside, right? The money will go to Ukraine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, it's like that's the that's just I mean, and Fox News probably loves it because it's like they get three ad revenue streams off of one conflict. I don't even yeah. dare to talk about the Israel stuff, you know, like not my reports. I haven't report on Israel for so long, you know. Every time I put up a video, I lose subscribers. So irritating. <laughs> it's it's a very emotional we, it's a very emotional conflict. I mean, I, I I think we do a pretty fair job of trying to talk about it. I mean I don't think it, it gets too crazy. I mean, people have their opinions, but I mean, I think everybody tries to come of it, come at it from different points of view because that's how people feel about it. And then people try to talk about, hey, you know, what about this or what about that? Well, the Israelis did this. Well, the Palestinians did that. And it's like, you know, it kind of, you know, I don't think anyone's here like cheerleading on this whole clusterfuck. I mean, it's been horrible for that whole region for what? 50 some years since 47 basically if you wanted to start from when israel came into being i mean that whole region's been fucked up ever since yep. well, lawrence of arabia had said it's been probably that, bad but... since like 1917. yeah well yeah that's what i'm saying i mean i know but, there's but anyway, earlier stuff going on but i mean yeah just, i believe you know, the they, they were fighting in the old testament listen if we can if we if i can just quickly like zoom out and have a look at the region because I, I want to do a thought experiment at the end of this right so let's look at the region. Let's look at Israel's happy, cheerful neighbours, all them, all them cheerful, peaceful Muslims. On the one side, you have Egypt, which is engaged in hostilities, domestic terrorism, and the outbreak of war with its southern neighbour, Sudan. Um, so you've got Egypt, right? Nice, peaceful country. To the south, you have Saudi Arabia engaged in a massive, long-standing war with Yemen, two Muslim neighbours going at it perpetually, on the other side, you have ISIS. To the north, you have Turkey invading a Muslim neighbor, Syria, a NATO country disrespecting international borders. Who would have thought it? But there it is. And then to the east, you have Iran and Iraq. Iraq, awash with ISIS, was involved in wars against its Muslim neighbors, first Iran for 15, 20 years, and then to its southern neighbors. So all around Israel, all of its neighbors are either at perpetual war with all their other Muslim neighbours, right, or uh, on the verge of it, right? So here's, here's, here's a hypothetical question. Let's just say you were Israeli and you woke up one morning and decided that you'd found Christ and that you were no longer interested in the Israeli project and you were going to go and immigrate back to your grandma's house in Switzerland in the upgrade or, or, or over to Vaughan's place in Kentucky and you were just going to leave the region. And you were going to go, you know what? I don't care about this place anymore. Let the Muslims have it. And let's just say everybody in Israel had that epiphany that they were going to, like, you know, quote, go home. I know I'm going to, like, offend a lot of people with that. But let's just say that happened. 
What do you think the future of that region is? Do you think the Palestinians have a happy, rosy future? Or do you think they're in, in, embroiled in interseen tribal warfare for the foreseeable future, just like they have been for the last 100 years and just like everybody around them is for the last 100 years? Like, is it going to, if Israel just gives up and leaves and gives them, you know, be free from the wherever to the sea, if, if that happens, is it going to bring peace and happiness or is it going to be much the same? And if it's going to be much the same, do we really care? And are we really going to, like, lay the blame for every bit of violence in the Middle East on Israel? Yeah, because the other reality that. is that if everybody in the Middle East agreed that they would just not go anywhere near the border of Israel and completely isolate it, right, then there would be peace as well. So it's unlikely that Israel would fall into interseen tribal warfare amongst itself. Well, the problem is that it doesn't have a defined border quite, but Vaughn was on. Uh, well, I was just saying, I mean, if, if that was to happen, I think if the Arab nations were smart, they would try to form some kind of confederation, but uh, obviously that wouldn't work because of the tribal stuff and the smaller countries want more say or not liking it. But I would think realistically you would at least have Saudi Arabia, maybe Egypt and Syria assert their dominance over that region. But, you know, and maybe Jordan, maybe Turkey would get involved in that because it would be, you know, if they could create this Arab bloc from Iran to Turkey, even if they didn't all get along, maybe they agree on some basic things. So it's a loose confederation. But the thing is, is can they get past their little tribal crap and other stuff to to make that kind of a deal? Because, I mean, think about it. It'd be like a... A, a, a new OPEC in a way because you've got the gas and stuff off the coast but you know are they smart enough to take advantage of that situation and make 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 a good call or would they waste 20 years fighting with each other and basically go nowhere and miss an opportunity and uh, what what happened to all the moderate governments and secular governments and uh, nationalist governments that ever formed in the Middle East you know where Maybe there wouldn't have been so much fighting in the last 70 years if it hadn't been for that. And it's been a real campaign to keep that happen. place in, in turmoil. Yeah. Oh, I mean, to be America just left. To be just I know it goes back I to the Old to... Testament, but... I think you guys... He's a, have... he's a coward. He I mean, ran. He's a chicken. Toby, you coward. Hey, hey, hey. He asked a good question. Oh, wait, wait. I think we should finish answering the question, yeah, whether we yeah, should or yeah. not. Yeah, uh, I wanted to reply. I wanted to use my uh, Uno Rivers card. What happened if Israel take all Gaza Strip? What happened if Israel take all the West Bank? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happened? They, they don't. Will it be no, peace? I, we... Will it be peace? What happened if Israel decided to take? half of Lebanon, the south mm -hmm. part, till the Litany River. What happened? Peace? That's also the Jimmy was. But let, let give it, Naomi yeah. had an answer Uno, to that Uno question. Uno Rivers right. card. Keep doing yeah, we, we talked about this last time. They don't intend to do that. They released the plan for the day after Hamas. Is my mic Okay, so you okay? think that plan is real then? Yes. Yes, okay. I do think it's real. My answer to that is a bit different. My answer to that is that after the, the, the successes in 67 and 73, um, a kind of a fervor and the beginning of the real settler movement and the idea of, you know, putting people everywhere, including in the places that were occupied by, you know, longstanding Palestinian populations begins. And I think if there was a success at turning it all into a legally recognized state of Israel, um, that the uh, settler parties that are the ex real extremists in Israel who claim from the Nile River to the Euphrates River and have consistently claimed that the entire time since 1948, uh, people like Daniela Weiss, uh, Ben Gavir, uh, Smotrich, those latter two are in the cabinet. I mean, if they succeeded to the degree of getting a hold of Gaza, there's no question in my mind that they would proceed to ethnically cleanse and control the West Bank more completely. And then they would proceed to try to consolidate beyond Golan to push towards the Euphrates. And the expansionism would definitely continue because they would have won. They think they've won. And, you know, I think Toby asked a very good question that I think has a bit of prejudicial premise in it. 
it depends on what you think the cause of the conflict is in the Middle East. If you think the cause of the conflict is an ongoing colonial project that Ben-Gurion characterized as a colonial project that would require basically genocidal actions when it was founded, if you think that's the problem, then, you know, let's remove the problem and see what happens. And that would be fair to everybody. But I have an opinion that takes this very away from the Middle East and out of Ukraine and out of American politics, but criticizes them all on this common grounds. I have a real problem with the so-called absolutist free speech countries where it is considered normal to engage in racialized and religiously bigoted rhetoric that clearly targets populations, even minority religious and ethnic populations, even during elections, even by politicians. And the three countries I perceive as the most guilty of this are the United States, Ukraine, and Israel. And Israel by far the worst. There are multiple parties that engage in openly genocidal rhetoric during election cycles. And now we've got a couple of them in the, the in the in the cabinet. This is the real cause. It's not some mystical thing that's tied to Jews or Judaism. It's not some ancient problem that exists innately in Ukraine. And it, it isn't anything about the violent colonial necessarily history of America. Canada has that history. Mexico has a colonial history. They don't have politicians going out making openly genocidal statements during elections to get elected. India also has this problem that it, it is overly tolerant of politicians making, you know, for instance, extremely bigoted anti-Muslim statements in the BJP and uh, the RSS. So I think when you look for the root cause, you must look at that, the kind of rhetoric that people are using to get elected the kind of people that are getting elected and the gen the genocidal projects that they carry out. And in my mind, Israel, Ukraine, the United States uh, can all be, and India can all be very heavily criticized on that grounds. Now you might have all kinds of opinions about hate speech law, but there's a pretty big line there when a politician gets elected on some kind of a target promise. Now I, interrupted Naomi to say that that's not how the Holocaust happened about something 10 minutes ago. I'm going to say that this is how the Holocaust happens when you allow people to engage in this openly genocidal rhetoric during election cycles. And that those four countries that I flatly dislike, I don't dislike them for emotional reasons. I dislike them for that reason. And I think they have to be crushed in some ways geopolitically because their governments are behaving this way. Even I'm starting to think that India may be starting to push up close to that line with what it's doing in Kashmir and in other um, forums. Yeah, so, so we should all be like Canada and restrict free speech. Exactly. That's what I want I to say. Support Jesus Canadian, Christ. I don't support Thank the current Canadian I don't support the current Canadian bill. You did, but I'm just saying that look man, just do what you want in your Thank own you. country. Just exactly. back the fuck off the United own. States with your fucking telling us what we can and cannot say. Okay. The United back States is off. very isolated at the moment and that's the very good reason. We like it that way. Yeah. All right. But it's not because it's pull out of the world. If you want to see genocide, free speech isn't you the see problem. genocide, try to take the speech from Americans. I tell you. I tell you, try you Canadians, try coming down here to take away free speech. We wouldn't come alone. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you wouldn't die alone either. You wouldn't die alone. You know, a lot of fucking maybe they'll come with the Chinese. They'll come, come with the, the Chinese. Actually, actually, it's very interesting. There was a Canadian-Mexican border in once. The East, to look at what's happening anymore. in the Middle East. If, if, we, if we understand that after the the Second World War, the first countries to get independent were actually most of the Arab countries with exclusion of um, Ar Ar Argelia that had to fight a, a bit longer. So many of these countries were got their independence, if not a little bit before, already uh, after that. And their sense of modernization was very pro-West. So they wanted to have a development that was resembled the Western societies mostly the European societies, but also the American dream somehow. And if you see pictures of Baghdad, Damascus, uh, even Cairo, at that time in the 50s, you see people, girls with, uh, 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 without, with, with, with no cover on their hair, with very short skins, uh, playing with boys, running uh, fast cars, well, having pretty much the lifestyle of the West, and even their their construction of the nation state was pretty much—it's a bit post-colonial, 
construction of nation state, but it's still a, a, the construction of a modern ba a nation state more or less coping the European style, which is with the nation, that creation of a, of a, of a narrative of of um, of, of indiv uh, individual nation state and not really a, a pan Arabic uh, thing. Then we had this attempt of Iraq, Syria, and Egypt to create a, a pan Arabic country, and then suddenly the disillusion. The realization that they are never going to achieve that development that the modernity promise. And that disillusion created not just dictatorships, but also the, in, the, uh, the opening the path to Islamism, to finding the, 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 this religious idea that all Arab countries are a single country based on Islam. And this is very interesting. We saw the same in Iran, and now we see the same in Russia. Of course, Russia is not going to, to become, to, I hope, it's not going to become a religious state. <laughs> but nevertheless, we see the same dissolution on Russia that realize the West is never going to accept them in, in, in equal terms with the same, with the same opportunities. Yeah, and, and, and this is also some a, 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 a history lesson that we should realize. And this is another opportunity. Like we spoke today, uh, one of the biggest uh, geopolitical failures that the West may have done. One of them was actually the inability to accept the Arab countries as peers, equal partners, and, and they were willing to. They were actually willing to. And it's a big failure. Yeah. Even Turkey is becoming a strange country. The treatment Sorry. of Libya set a pretty bad pattern. I mean, it was the most developed country in Africa, and look what they did to it. I mean, it demonstrates. And that was, a. I would say that Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, to some degree, were kind of the last holdouts of pan-Arabism, as it were people who were not particularly religiously founded or whatever. But exactly as you say, Prada, it just seems the Pan-Arabist project didn't have the capacity to create a unified front against colonialism to the degree that the Islamist movements did succeed at doing. I mean, the Iranian revolution stuck, for instance. And I think it's just a consequence of that is the basis for unity that keeps the West at bay the best. It's not necessarily that the populations prefer that, but that they view these people as having some kind of ethical code that they can put up with who can keep the CIA mm -hmm. the hell out of their business as they have largely And the West doesn't bother Iran. overthrowing the Islamists for some reason. Why doesn't the West it, overthrow them? Well, maybe they also see it as stabilizing. Remember that the way it comes about with the Mujahideen is or Reagan is openly praising religiously founded government and thinks he, they're predictable and he can deal with them. You know, that's why well, the Mujahideen, Mujahideen is trained by CIA, that. beats yeah. Pakistan. Yeah. So to some degree, they're collaborative the, uh... and a known quantity. At least they're not communists, right? That's the big thing. They're not communists. Well, yeah. So yeah. we can we can who deal with the them. So on some level, they who... fit in a slot. They're not too threatening to the West, but they're also, they can hold up their security against the West. I think that if the colonial projects truly ceased and the abusive trade relations truly ceased in both Africa and the Middle East, that you would see a moderation of these extremist elements because there wouldn't be a need for them anymore. They're there to exclude Westerners and to create a defensive system. That's what they're there but for, they're there. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You'll they're there with the consent of the Westerners and sometimes with the direct funding of the Westerners. They're there yeah. to replace the Pan-Arabists that were destroyed by the Westerners. So if the West stopped creating extremism and it and and then it backed out in these more interfering you'd get, ways, you'd get moderate. Would it all moderate governments and yeah, you get then you might have a different problem situation. though. The the different problem you could have if you formed a secular perfect government with a let's say it's as peaceful as Belgium or Canada as a binational state right there in Israel Palestine. Amen. Let's say it succeeded, right? Who does it threaten? It threatens those Sunni kings Prophets. in Jordan and well, in Saudi yeah, Arabia, yeah, they're, and they're, they're absolute doomed. power. Yeah, yeah. 
So then yeah. they're going to view that the, they don't want to support the creation of a genuine democratic or pluralistic or state, including people just mm -hmm. like their own citizens. So I'm going to drop with, with this last point here, and this will be basically my closing point. I talked in some previous slides about the crisis in Christianity created by the Ukraine war, like nominally Christian Orthodox fashion, factions against each other, the usual suspect Catholics and, you know, with their anti-Russian and anti-Asianism. And all of that was taking the most Christian sort of part of the world and putting it at odds with each other, including and involving religion, right? And I said that the Israel-Palestine conflict attacks on Bethlehem and whatever, oldest Orthodox church in Gaza, that was all part of it. I'm going to say there's a parallel crisis in Islam, and the crisis that I see is this. The Shia groups, including Iran and the Iranian-backed ones, including you know, which includes Hezbollah and Hamas, and the Houthis, who are also really religious um, Shias, um, these people are doing something about the Palestine crisis. They are taking militant stances, they are attacking and blockading Israel, they are militarily doing something. Whereas the Sunni world is not. And so if it turns out that the Shia are perceived as the groups that actually organize, actually care about other Muslims and actually intervene at risk to themselves militarily, they will become, and Iran the key to them, they will become the leading faction within Islam. Even though they're a smaller faction overall, they're the more militant and the more disciplined, right? And maybe the more principled if they're doing things like blockading Israel to stop a genocide, while well, they can still sign a deal with Russia and China to let their ships through. I mean, you can deal with people like that. But this, then in the sunny world, we have a chaos of many different opinions. And we have fundamentalists who claim that Israel maybe even should be there because it says something about it in the Quran with whatever borders and whatever status. And it's really easy to use it in Sunni Islam uh, phrases like that in order to kind of excuse doing nothing, which the Sunni kings want to do, nothing. And and so I see a crisis developing there in in one group of people that's willing to back other Muslims, even at great risk to themselves, like the Houthis. And they seem to be, generally speaking, the Shia doing this, whereas the people who are standing off, behaving like petty nation states and not intervening on behalf are the Sunni states. So maybe that constitutes a crisis in Islam similar to the one uh, in Christianity that's being created by the European war. But just an observation that Abrahamic religions are all kind of in crisis. Judaism certainly is, with a larger number of anti-Zionist Jews coming out and saying they're anti-Zionist. And many of the sources quoted by activists are, in fact, Jews, American and Israelis. I met Miko Paled's sister the other day. And 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 like this is this is becoming a crisis in all three branches of the Abrahamic religions. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are all in crisis with respect to how do you deal with conflicts? How do you support or not support your fellow co-religionists? Are these, in fact, spiritual positions at all, or are they the political ones? And that's uh, that's a big problem. <clears throat> that's my close. Cool. It, it, it just is a real bombshell. It will be a real bombshell if the Palestinians decided to convert to Shia Muslim. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I, I I I disagree Dumb. a bit <laughs> with the idea that that Iran could actually it's the only one play, playing playing the role of anti-colonialism or anti-Westernism alone because we see the Sunnis presenting them, especially the monarchies, presenting themselves somehow also in the side of the alternative by trying to uh, join the BRICS. Well, South, Af South, uh, Saudi Arabia haven't yet really decided, but we see, for instance, uh, the Emirates playing a big role on it, creating new in uh, financial institutions, uh, Trying to get the catch on the on the diamonds uh, industry in order actually to be a kind of present itself as an alternative. But these monarchies, they present themselves completely like the future of Arab of Muslims. They present themselves as rich, developed. Yeah, okay. You, one would argue, well, they have they just have all that because they can buy because they have so much. Uh, money from the oils, but I think that the whole Muslim world is positioned itself 
against against the West, and that was not always the case. So, um, in terms of, but, but you are right, uh, um, uh, Ch. Uh, the thing is that Iran is playing uh, like trying to be the champion, not just of the Shias, but also the champion of anti-domination, uh, the champion of um, of uh, rebellion against uh, this Western domination that they also try to perceive Israel as being an example of. It's not so true that Israel is the example of. The problem is the Western world that is unable to disconnect itself from Israel because it, especially some countries, either by the fact they have a huge uh, Jewish uh, community that is able to, to, to make those manipulations or because they feel like in the case of Germany, they have a kind of historical uh, debt towards Israel and needs to support it blindly. But the problem is that in, the, in doing that, the West, again, is destroying all possibilities of being a comprehensive actor to whom you can talk with in the sense that they are destroying their own rules and that they wanted to impose to everybody. So this is domination when the rules have double standards when they apply differently to different actors, when some actors have more right to be uh, than others. And talking too much, yes. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to say that in this... Don't domain, worry, you still have chance. I'm going to do closing, so you have the chance to talk again. Okay, then Go uh, <laughs> let's start closing. Uh, it's pretty, it was just pretty much saying that I don't see I Iran playing that much. Also, because as we said before, I see Iran getting away from that perspective of um, that they used to have of being the champions of the Shia movement, as they finally, because of the Ukrainian war, were these isolated by Russia and China, and they started integrated in a bigger regional com uh, complexity. And I Iran has so much potential now as a country, and not just like a rebel. And I think they will abandon the, the rebel side. Well, not completely because that's power, but they are not so interested in being the, the rebel champion 100%. So that's one of the reasons we were saying it's difficult to realize that Iran is going to go into the trap and do something really as bad as Marlin was saying, trying to make the US bomb Iran, that would be too much, and I think also too dangerous. I see it something, and I think more dangerous even is the fact that Israel, like Naomi was saying, she's not with us anymore, okay. Um, they said Israel needs to have the balls and show it to everybody, like the, the Chihuahua, like Marl and Sand, it was a good, a good um, expression, like the Baltics also do. The problem is that they have nuclear weapons. And if they really feel threats, so that's the that they can use them, and they will, they would use them. No, no doubt. And Israel is really a small country; is very fragile. The distance from once from from the east to the to the Mediterranean Sea is so small. It's it's is extremely fragile country, and uh, the Israelis have a really hard time to keep it safe. I would argue there are better ways of solving problems, but like also Toby said, it's a very complica complicated region. And in understanding that, it's there is little space of maneuver, but nothing excludes from the point of view of we Western countries or better citizens of the world we live in not ex uh, excuse the fact that Israel, it's an example of everything we are against of. Colon this colonization process, uh, um, anti-apartheid. So Israel somehow presents that to us. So that's, it. that's also one of the reasons why everybody's so emotional about it whenever they talk about it. It's very personal. It's our beliefs. And Israel presents it. But let's not forget, nobody is a victim and nobody is 100% perpetrator. Everybody manages and negotiates their roles 
in different positions and so do the and so do the Palestinians they are not just com they are presented as victims and they are not they know very well how to present themselves and they do it very well and we should actually recognize that they're really good in doing it everybody's feeling really pity for the reason of course we should <laughs> but <laughs> everybody is feeling a real pity for the Palestinians for them but yes <laughs> So that was my closing. I won't talking anymore. So <laughs> good safe. Nice but uh, that's a good safe. You, you almost become a racist, you know. <laughs> no, no, then, let's go. Nothing. Let's go. Great. You, uh, CH, do you want to do another closing? Or you're already closed? <laughs> I'm done. I bore him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Average. CH. I'm sorry. <laughs> Average uh, closing. So uh, we are doing closing yeah, okay. statements, by the opening. way. Yeah, you open it up, open mics in the early morning. I just wait after breakfast. Okay, anyway. Don't worry. You'll always be the case. <laughs> yeah. Just my sleeping hours. Okay. Yeah. Um, due to that, the Middle East is getting uh, heat up um, the tensions over there. So um, I talk about my you know, China perspective over here. Uh, recently, is the CEOs, group of CEOs from the United States have visited China's, and so as the finance secretaries, uh, Janet Yellen, have visited China's. So um, I think the uh, Taiwan issues over there has uh, been some kind of, they're trying to um, set aside first and let the business flowing for the United States and between China. I don't think the uh, United States willing to decoupling in a way for economically with China on that because lots of CEOs coming into the China and talk with the uh, president Xi Jinping over there and have a good, very good conversations. I think they, uh, those CEOs from uh, American corporations need more markets for their business over there. So pricing up attentions over there does not benefit the economies of the United States so as the corporations in the United States Corporation as well. And recently, the former presidents of um, uh, Taiwan, uh, my NGOs, have second time, second trips to visit to China. The non governments um, right now is the former governments, which is the former presidents over here, they try to de escalate the tensions between Taiwan's and China's over there. And created more dialogues between them. They're going to make this initiate. Uh, DPP is um, put into a very embarrassing and precarious situation right now. So they don't know what to do next because after the incidents of uh, two fishermen being uh, co collided by their, uh, the way it is, the Coast Guards and causing two deaths on that. So there's no clear mm, closures settlements between the uh, those who are passed away from the uh, mainland China's fishermen and the passengers. So in China perspective, they rather let them have a, a fun, having a fun time in the Middle East, keep United States, Israel busy for a while, while China focusing on the uh, economy developments over here. So I can see that um, they have a more positive way from a uh, cooperation in terms of economy of a China um, in terms in terms of uh, non-governmental cooperations between them so we'll see on that that's all okay thank you average mm. upgrade closing yeah uh was a nice open mic like usual um, different points of view today was a little bit heated at the end but it's good we should agree on everything that's why the open mic is here so we can discuss our different opinions and different point of views um i always find it funny countries who restrict speech try to restrict speech in other countries and tell other countries what to do uh it's typical uh I, I don't want to go further away from this, but um, we should be able to uh, denounce both sides 
especially in the Middle Eastern part, especially in this horrible war. People are dying, it's horrible, both sides. And we should call out terrorism and we should call out uh, military who shoot civilians. I think we can agree on that. And uh, that most people want peace, peace and love, peace and love. And um, just move on with our lives, getting better. And uh, just improve, improve, try to get better, try to not think too much about horrible things which happen. And try to be positive in life. And that was my closing. Vaughn. Yeah, I want to say uh, this is a really good open mic. It flowed really good. I liked it. I mean, it dragged a little bit there, but then it was saved by the car argument and the lazy Spanish French argument. I mean, it kind of was dragging there and then it came, you know, it kind of pulled it out and got everyone hot. So people probably got back into it because everyone was yelling and shit. But, uh, you know, as far as my closing goes, I mean, I would keep watching around Turney and Southeast of Seversk and that Kremenai area, see what happens around there. You know, obviously they're going to keep pounding around Kharkov. You know, maybe something will happen around one of these little breakthrough areas, but you need to watch why it's DPA sit reps and frontline changes so you can keep up to date because there's been a lot of changes in the last couple of days, even if they're just small, a lot of little pickups, little gains. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, subscribe, and share. And if you like what Wyatt's doing, support him on Patreon and other places. And uh, y'all have a good week. Take care. Thank you, Vaughn. I'll. Well, well, well. Yeah. It was challenging a bit, but, but still a nice open mic. I didn't see, I didn't saw new faces, but. And as uh, uh, the average straight male stated, I mean, it, it, it was like he, he, he stole my, my closing statement. Just to say that you see that mess with Ukraine, you see that mess in the Middle East and China is growing and China is continuing to make money and China is continuing to expand its influence. China is the real winner of all that mess. More and more United States is dragged onto proxy conflict on those commitment he has to make with some allied countries. China is building their way. I've learned that you now China is able to, to manufacture, mass produce seven nanometer ships. Yeah. The, May, the Huawei uh, Mate 60 Pro Kirin 9000 S, it's a seven nanometers, but they will, they will come up with the five nanometers very soon. So Taiwan with TSMC will be less and less relevant also for United States. So it seems that for China, it's a very bright future. They got cheap oil, cheap gas, cheap natural resources from Russia, and plenty of it, no problem. And they are not making wars. They are not manufacturing shells or cannons or missiles to send to someone. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see how, how long that mess in Ukraine will last. How, how long that mess in the Middle East will last. Because there everybody is expecting an Iranian 
action of any kind. The momentum is clearly on the side of China. Yeah, yeah. United States. Voila. Thank you, RL. Uh, Marlin, closing. All right. Uh, just say thank you, Wyatt, for hosting the conversation and everybody for chipping in. The participation was fun. And I'm just glad to be here to set everybody straight. That's truly really all I have to say. <laughs> thank you, Marlin. And uh, Shabo's goal, JS. Yes. Um, I just wanted to comment on uh, the idea of, well, I think it was Craig who was talking about, you know, wanting to limit free speech and somehow that he believes that would be somehow beneficial to the world. I'd like to echo the sentiments of, um, was it Upgrade, uh, who said that uh, it's always the uh, people that don't have free speech that want to impose it on the others. And anybody that thinks that's a good idea hasn't uh, spent much time in America or doesn't really understand Americans because if you want to talk about a genocide, try taking away our free speech and then you'll see some real killing. Um, that'll make what's going on in Ukraine, Russia and Gaza seem like a walk in the park on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Um, as for, and also about the, uh, crisis of the Abrahamic religions. Um, that's a crock too. I mean, Christianity, the entire history of it has been a bloody one. I mean, my God, in a 30 years war, one third of the entire German population was annihilated. And that's just one country. Um, so that's pretty much nonsense. If anything, things are much more peaceful in the Christian world than they've ever been. Um, and as and as far as it just being unique to the Abrahamic religions, that's ridiculous. Look at the the Hindus and the Sikhs and the you know with the their conflict with Muslims. And so any anybody saying that this is unique to Abrahamic religions doesn't know anything about the history of religion. As far as the um, Russo-Ukraine conflict, I believe it's just a matter of time. Uh, the Russians will just slowly wear them down. I don't think you'll see any really big changes until probably uh, midsummer when uh, the weather is most favorable. Um, and the Russians will probably, I don't, I don't, I'm not of the opinion where the Russians can continue this inevitable war of attrition. I do believe that uh, eventually they will be kind of forced to wrap things up. Um, all countries, no matter who they are, eventually do tire of war. So, um, the Russians will have to put an end to this probably, um, uh, or at least show extreme progress by the end of this year. And I expect they will do that. Um, as far as the, uh, Israeli Gaza conflict. I don't really see why that should concern the United States government. Um, I believe that is an issue between for, for the Middle East countries to uh, sort out. It's not our business and we shouldn't be picking sides. Um, Israel is, uh, you could say it's small in size, but it's the only uh, country in the direct region that has, you know, nuclear weapons. Uh, um, they have more tech than anybody else. Um, they have a highly trained military. And they certainly have the money to fund their soldiers. Um, other than that, I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Wyatt, for hosting. For those of you who haven't clicked the uh, thumbs up button, please do so. And um, yeah, sh and also yeah, share this if you guys, anybody watching has a Twitter account, post a link to this, man. It doesn't cost you anything. Helps Wyatt out. Um, other than that, you know, peace and love, everybody. Hey, I just wanted thank to say you. one thing real quick. You know. We strive to get all kinds of new people on here. So if you're anywhere in the world and there's things going on, come on the open mic and let us know. I mean, really, we want as many perspectives from around the world as possible. And thank you, Wyatt, for providing this platform. Thank you, Vaughn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Bye, guys. So it's my turn to do closing. Hmm. So. Um, thank you everyone for watching uh, the open mic 73 so uh, looks like you no know, NATO flirting with World War 3 wasn't really you know nobody really believed it no we didn't really talk much about it uh, we 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 also didn't really talk that much about Israel and Iran on the verge of war it's more like people are more fixated about um, alleged international crimes and uh, like hitting the, the the embassy and whatnot so anyway uh, 
is is a very you no know, explosive you no know, open mind. You can see I'm turning evil. I'm turning safe. You no know, turning a safe. You no, know, everything is red now. I'm turning into the dark side. You no, know, anyway, the it's just my curtain is red. So anyway, the the the, the what else I want to say? I forgot. So uh, I forgot what I want to say. Actually, I, I was thinking about it just now. Yeah, detracted myself. So uh, thank you for the all the super chats. Uh, I, I can go through a, a bit of them. Uh, by NGS, Acting Sane, Clarence, uh, and then uh, John, Sto John Scott, and then Toronto, G NGS, then Utis, then uh, the Silver, the Silver, SK, Tamit, SK, SK, Clarence, Heinz, Logizen. Uh, sorry to Logizen again. I've, I missed his super chats when I was like, I was in the middle of something just now. Uh, Tami, Utis, uh, SK. Did I miss this super chat? I think I might have missed this super chat. Uh, sorry, SK. Uh, I didn't see this. And uh, Utis. So uh, this is, I have to argue a bit again about this. Uh, it's not about giving them a break. It's they are just always been like this. So the geopolitics have no, you know, uh, if you really don't be a bit more realistic uh, about, you no, know, like realist, right? I'm, I'm like, I'm into real politics. So, you no, know, I don't buy into morals and ethics. Like everybody will just do whatever they think will achieve their goals. And um, Iranian Putin, uh, and then uh, you, thank you for the five memberships, you no know, free memberships to people again. And uh, with this, so, as for no tribal violence in the Levant in the 1900s, I'm not so sure. They there is always violence in the Levant. Uh, so I'm, and uh, the only thing is like during the Ottoman Empire, uh, there's peace because they are all under one empire. So that's why I say uh, you can blame Ottoman for failing because if they have kept the caliphate, if they they stayed strong, they didn't collapse. They you know they didn't pick the wrong side in World War One, or in fact they maybe they don't join World War One. Then maybe. They we wouldn't have all this tragedy right now. The Ottoman Empire maybe will still be around, and then we would not have all this nonsense. So and then uh, maybe Israel will be formed in Madagascar. You no, know? <laughs> so like you know, do you, we we can always go to, go back to history to blame everyone you want to <laughs> to, to, to to you want to blame. Uh, that's why you know I don't really like to use history to justify things. I I use history just to you know show like certain patterns maybe you know certain reasoning why certain side have certain way of thinking but no history doesn't mean that you know it, things will always repeat in the way how you how the history have happened uh it may have a certain variations maybe the good side become the bad side the bad side become the good side uh, so yeah whatever happening right now the world is getting more and more messy as i said multipolarism will result in more conflicts and we are now seeing it happen in real time things are going crazy there are still stuff that i didn't manage to have time to cover armenia azerbaijan they are now on the verge of war again i'm not so sure i had need to i saw you no know, a lot of things about it uh like tweets and uh some reports but i didn't really read deep into it yet so there's something that i need to go and read up and search research and cover uh ecuador have just stormed mexico's embassy uh to arrest the pre i think the previous president or prime minister so and then uh that triggered the mexicans a lot so because um embassy is sovereign ground so basically they e effectively invaded into mexico so that is a big problem so that i'm not sure how, what, what will happen tr from that and of course uh brazil brazil is having some problem with twitter because brazil is the, trying to uh, restrict more speeches they're trying to force twitter to give up identities of certain people they are now like claiming down becoming more and more authoritarian so that is also happening so and then there's another place i think uh, there's a few conflicts happening in africa and then you have iran israel which i haven't covered yet as well so a lot of shit is happening all around the world so so uh so generally i just want to share i will be focusing a lot more on the news and geopolitics if i can uh of course partly to plan for the future uh post ukraine war life you no know, ukraine war can end 
anytime because Ukraine is basically on its final leg unless something changed from the look of it the unless you know nato enters or they will suddenly have a a lot more stuff to give to ukraine ukraine is looking like they are pretty spent so that's why the front line is moving a lot nowadays uh, people may think that it's not a lot uh not big changes maybe you think it's a few meters it's not it's a few kilometers or uh, even a few hundred meters that's actually still a lot given uh, how heavily defended the front lines are so any movement is big so when i say huge movement huge progress is huge to me is huge because you know you try to have that kind of move the kind of front line change in world war one those are huge victories so uh, things are happening uh, very drastically so i think the, the the pivot towards um covering more geopolitics would make a lot of sense of course china and taiwan also um uh, taiwan just have a massive earthquake earthquake right at the same time uh, china actually flew a lot of planes all around it but of course they've always been flying flying planes all around it all the time so and uh japan is also you know going into philippines uh i think they're going to sign some deals or something then uh the, the new uh indonesian president visited china and also visit going to visit uh japan uh so you know a lot of geopolitical changes is happening all around so uh, it's important to keep track because uh if not then we will have to, we we may we may not be prepared for what's to come so i'm not sure you know the dps community is big enough i don't think we are big enough at all to 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 enact or influence any change in politics in any of our countries but at least you know you will be you know <laughs> given a heads up you know to buy a plane ticket and fly to somewhere safer you know <laughs> i think that's the best thing i can put i can say you know dpa can do um like yeah don't stay in somewhere that's going to start the war uh, so run away now uh, stay safe i think uh that is the no that's the smart thing to do a wise thing to do that's why you know like people always sometimes criticize that De dennis davidoff no i think he did the right thing he saved his own life stay away that's good and he earned a lot of money so that's good so you no know, why why die you no know? so you no know, traitor or not it doesn't matter so just stay safe stay alive and uh if you can affect your politics towards the more sensible decisions um and elect you no know, try to vote for you no know, good leaders that don't choose war because and also which is why you probably you guys if you have been watching open mind for some time you'll realize i'm always very against very uh emotional uh arguments especially you know to when you come to condemnation of certain sides because it will be rather bad you know if if you encourage someone to fight back because someone will die because especially you ask the weaker side to fight a stronger side then the weaker side is going to die like more people will die so yeah just import just it's important it's important to 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 take note of that i mean righteousness is one thing you know but the righteous don't always win the wars just have to re remember if the righteous or the good or the you no know, the peaceful will win the war like you know in the movies then the, there is no such thing as a mongolian empire you know the mongols will not have succeeded and conquered so much land so you no know, yep so anyway uh fight the fight that you can you think you can win or at least you can stalemate that's fine because i saw i saw i saw this it's not surrender I, I i you fight the fight that you know that you can deal with if you know you can't deal with it then you have to consider negotiation for a peace deal or something if taiwan if let's say you know china have a massive invasion force that is you no know, hundred times bigger than what they have today i think it makes perfect sense that you know taiwan should should you no know, give up <laughs> but you no know, at, at this moment the the power balance in terms of military it might look like very big but china don't have the military to conquer taiwan right now not even what they have right now so just just to put things in perspective and yeah hopefully uh th there will be more things to come and uh there will, i will try to continue to improve the content and uh, i also want to introduce you to this new thing as i close and uh so great for you guys that are still around how many of you guys 140 you guys gonna witness something new 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 um yeah, for the, and I'll see you guys in the next update.
español, habla inglés. Algo que touch runs, ni un New York has something to say. Come on. Se hace otra vez, So I discovered AI music. So, <laughs> so I gotta see, you know, if I have time, I'll try to do more. I think, I think very cool. Then I, I can do a lot of uh, music uh, that is relating to what is currently happening and it's gonna be cool. And I, I really love that song. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm addicted to it. So and, um, anyway, I will, I will maybe, uh, maybe I'll create another channel called, you no. Know, DPA music. Ah, stop creating new channels. And anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next update. Mm -hmm.